Okay, good morning everyone and welcome, welcome to Local, local History Day, Day which, which is coming to you live from Broadway Hall. My name, My name is Megan Keller and I'm a social, social media fellow this year for the British Association for Local History. history. Today, Today we're, we're going to be joined by some wonderful, wonderful speakers, speakers as well as, well as making sure, sure that we've that got, got a programme program ahead, ahead for you. For you. I can, I can see that we've got, got coming from across the country, um, so I've seen people talking about being from Leicestershire um, and Norfolk and all of those sorts of areas. Um, please bear with us for a moment while we're setting up the sound as well. I can see that we've got some people coming through. Um, and just to thank at this point some of our online members of um, our outreach team who are going to be helping us throughout the day. So thank you to Katie Bridger and Chris Denley for monitoring the chat. They are from our outreach team and they will have B-A-L-H in their name. Um, so they will be able to see some of the questions that you will be providing us with today. In about 10 minutes time, we're gonna hand over to the hall for our first talk and our introduction by our president, Professor Caroline Barron. I also need to thank Pam Smith, who's also joining us virtually today, who will be live tweeting the two talks that we have. Among our guests in Conway Hall, we have Charlotte Young, who provided a local history hour for us in March of 2021, and she talked about the Civil War. We also have Sheila Sweetenborough, who did a local history hour in February of 2021 on medieval Kent. And then in a more recent local history hour, we had Stephanie Brown, who's in our audience. And in April 2022, she gave us a talk about medieval court roles. Also in our in-person audience, we have Steve Coe, Martin Green, Bob Chown and Roger Packham. I will explain a bit more why they are important to the proceedings of today, um, which you will find out slightly later on. In addition, both of our speakers are going to be arriving very shortly. So we have Dr. Mark Forrest up first at 11 o'clock. And then this afternoon, we've got Dr. Yanina Ramirez joining us. If you are on social media, make sure to follow along with our Twitter, which is at B-A-L-H News, and use the hashtag Local History Day to keep up to date. In order to make sure that we are able to ask your questions to our two uh, speakers today, please make sure to use the Q&A chat in the Zoom webinar. If you are having trouble finding this, please let us know via the chat um, and we will be on hand to help you. This way it means that it separates from those conversations and we can really make sure that we answer as many questions as possible today. We are also making sure that we have a host of um, events themselves, so we have the annual general meeting and we also have the photography competition awards winners as well as the local history awards being announced today. Now, Conway Hall, as I've mentioned, is an absolutely beautiful venue and we will be sharing some videos about its history very shortly. Of course, Conway Hall is very much connected to the, uh, the humanist movement and again, we can find out more through their website. Um, with regards to the annual general meeting, just a reminder at this point that members were given an opportunity to vote and comment online so unfortunately we won't be having the opportunity to vote and comment today in the same way please make sure to um, grab yourselves cups of tea and have breaks as and when you would like um, and make sure to keep up to date like i say through social media we will also be having some interviews with both of our speakers as well as some of the BALH's members and some of our various committees including our acting chair and people like that um, so sit back, relax, and in about 10 minutes time, we're going to be going to Conway Hall's main stage, and that's where Professor Caroline Barron, our president, will be introducing our first speaker, Dr. Mark Forrest. I don't know if you've seen some of these speakers before, and please do feel free to put in the chat whether you have, um, but we have Dr. M Mark Forrest coming in today, and he's going to be talking about using post-medieval manorial documents for local history research. He's recently written um, a guidebook for us, which is available to purchase in our shop, and it will be exploring rural and urban records, the different types of records, the purposes of courts and how they can be used. And then we have Dr. Yanina Ramirez joining us this afternoon, and she'll be talking about her new book, Femina, which is a new history of the Middle Ages by the women written out of it. So lots of fascinating talks today. And 
Again, if you want to keep up to date with our work, follow us on social media and make sure to go to our website as well. So make sure you have lots of cups of tea. Um, and we can already hear in the hall as well that there are lots of people joining us. So I am in the green room just backstage um, and I cannot quite see the hall just yet, but when I walked out there just before um, we went live, it was full of wonderful local historians that many of you may follow on social media or have seen their work. Um, and of course, online, we've got so many names that I recognize from local history hours, our webinars, and through interacting with our social media. So do make sure to say hello. I can see that we've got various different things coming through on the chat. So I am just looking down because that's where I can see that. Um, we have got video recording coming up, um, and so we will be making sure that you can uh, have access to this. And we have lots of interesting content coming from my wonderful colleague, Catherine War, uh, who has been producing lots of interesting videos to share throughout the day and to keep the webinar going. Um, so if you haven't met Catherine before, she runs the hugely successful YouTube channel, Yorkshire's Hidden History. Um, so definitely give that a follow if you are a local historian, particularly in the Yorkshire area. Um, and she has been creating lots of different videos for us to utilise today. In addition, if you are wanting to get in touch and work with us, we have lots of different ways for you to do that. So firstly, our 10 minute talks are a wonderful way to get your research across in a very shortened format. So what you will do is you will create a series of slides and you will present uh, through a recording, send that through to us, we then publish that on our YouTube channel and we will share that across our social media. So there's lots of different local history 10-minute um, talks so far. We have one most recently about the Irish language in the West Midlands. Um, and in addition to that, if you're looking to do something slightly longer, you might want to join our local history hour where we usually have two speakers talking about a similar topic and they will be interacting with each other's research and sharing how their local history research can interest you. One of my personal favourites, and I should say at this point that my own research looks at the commemoration and care of the First World War dead, was the local history hour talk, which was about the funerary movements um, across the, 17th, uh, the 18th and the 19th centuries. If video recordings and online webinars aren't necessarily something that you would like to participate in, but you would still like to share your research, we also have a blog, which is the B-A-L-H blog. And for a, you write about a thousand words on a topic of your choice. And again, that goes onto our website. Um, we make sure that it is as accessible for everyone as possible. And most recently, we created a blog to talk about how to get started in local history research. So for those of you who are just starting out, or individuals who have been doing this for decades and want to add to this, please do feel free to get in touch. Furthermore, we have our podcast, which has just come out into its second series, and I'm so excited for you to see all of that. So in this series, we've gone back to basics um, and talked all about how to get started in local history research. So that will be from talking about how to get involved in schools and youth groups, your local communities, and then how to share your research through things like social media and digital content. We do have some teething troubles, so bear with us. It is our first hybrid event ever. Um, and so thank you for letting us know if things are not coming through, um, but we will be ironing those out throughout the day. And our online hosts will also be on hand to make sure that we are getting those messages through. So we are using some very high tech equipment today. We have lots of chats going on behind the scenes as well. Um, and so I will be making sure that we talk th through things like that. Also, if I am looking away from the camera, please bear with me. I'm trying to keep up with uh, messages that are coming through as well as the messages from the chat, just to give you a behind the scenes idea of this. Um, and we also have two people behind the camera um, who are currently waving at me, which is very kind of them. So we have our digital manager, Paul Carter, here. And then we also have uh, Dan, Dean, Dan, sorry, <laughs> Dan from Conway Hall. Sorry, again, I'm looking behind the camera, um, who is also making sure that the tech is working. 
In addition, I should also point out I'm very excited because the boom mic that we're using was used by the BBC, so I'm feeling very important today um, and making sure that the media and things like that is very high tech. Um, I have posted on Twitter some pictures of the behind the scenes setup here, so do have a little look at those and I will try and pop them in the chat as well, um, but I cannot do that just now. Um, so we've got about four minutes until we go live to the hall and we have our first speaker. I should also note that we do have some splits throughout the day in our hybrid event. Um, so particularly around the annual general meeting, we will be co concurrently running uh, Q&A sessions uh, with our speakers and things like that. Um, we will also make sure to let you know the links to this as they go throughout the day so you can pick whichever one you want to look at or you can have two screens going at once and seeing all of the events. So that's entirely up to you. Um, I can still hear lots of chatter going on, so I imagine that some local history is being made today as everyone talks about things. Um, and I should also say that this local area, as with anywhere in the world, uh, has lots of local history. So this morning when I was walking from uh, where I was staying last night to um, Conway Hall, I was blown away by the amount of blue plaques that are around here and lots of names that I recognised. Um, I'm sure some of you have seen similar um, plaques in your area, so feel free to pop in the chat what's famous about your local history here. Um, I love learning about the different topics, so like I say, I am a modern historian by background and I look at the First World War. I'm currently doing my PhD in that at the University of Kent, um, but I am so fascinated by all different areas of local history, so do make sure to let me know what interests you and I can give you some shout outs throughout the day. In addition, make sure to like and comment on our posts on Twitter that are going on throughout the day. And thank you once again to Pam Smith for live tweeting those key sessions with Dr. Mark Forrest and Dr. Yanine Ramirez. I can see that Katie and Chris have been very busy in the chat as well. So thank you to both of those from our outreach team for the online support. And in our hall, we have a lot of our BALH outreach committee members as well as our acting chair on hand in the hall. Also throughout the day we have Catherine being a roving reporter interviewing lots of different people which will be really exciting and we also have someone who is doing market experience with us and his name is Marek and he's down at Canterbury Christchurch University and he's also doing some production behind the scenes so those videos will be coming very very soon. I think we've got a couple more minutes until Conway Hall is going to go live and we're going to be introducing our first speaker, Dr. Mark Forrest, um, who is talking about post-medieval manorial documents for local history research. I'm sure plenty of you have looked at those as well, which is wonderful. And make sure to have a look at his latest guidebook, BALH, using our shop. Um, and we are also going to be looking at both rural and urban records there, the types of records that you have, the purpose of the courts, and how they can be used in local history research. Um, to give you a bit of an introduction about Mark, um, Mark will um, also be introduced by Professor Caroline Barron. Um, Mark has researched for both Cambridge and London universities, and he spent more than a decade as um, an archivist at Dorset History Centre. He's now a freelance archival consultant and collections manager, and he works for Wiltshire Victoria County history as well. Now we have a really long standing friendship with uh, the VCH and their wonderful red books, which are fundamental to local history research. We are about two minutes out from the start of this, um, so make sure to get yourself a cup of tea now before we go into the hall. Um, and yes, really looking forward to seeing what's going on today. Um, please also make sure to let me know what you're most excited to see today. Is it the who wins the local history photographer of the year? Um, so we're just playing the intro in the hall, which you would have just seen now. Um, apologies if there wasn't sound for you. Um, we are working on that. Like I say, this is our first hybrid event. So there are going to be some teething problems. So please do bear with us, but also let us know if things aren't coming through. Um, and we will do our best to work with them. So Dan and Paul are going to be frantically looking at the chat and making sure that I'm pinned to the screen, for example, and that sort of thing. 
Um, so we can hear that the silence has come in as everyone's looking at the screen that you've just seen. Lots of dramatic music going on in the background um, and it feels like the start of a trailer to a film, um, which is also very exciting. Um, and like I say, we're going to go to the hall very shortly and we're going to have Professor Caroline Barron, our president, introducing. So we're now going to go live to the hall and we're going to be cutting to the end of the video that you saw about 15 to 20 minutes ago. And then we're going to be able to see Caroline Barron introducing our first speaker, Dr. Mark Forrest. I'm going to be here throughout the day. So let's go live to the hall. Right. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm still glad to welcome you to the, uh, this meeting of the British Association of Local History. It's our first in-person meeting for three years. It's really great to be actually with real people again, and I'm very glad to welcome you all, and I look forward very much to all the things that we're going to do today, some of which will be in person, and of course there are also people on screen, and we're very glad to welcome them as well. And I think it, it's easy for me to say this because how, how successful the BALH has been during lockdown, I'm, since I've had nothing to do with it except admire it, it's absolutely fantastic what they've managed to do online. All these uh, webinars, these lectures, these 10 minute talks, it's been really dynamic. And I think all those who are involved deserve our thanks for the really successful lockdown period. We've learned a lot and we've managed to enjoy each other's company on screen. It's been really great. Thank you to all those, and they know who they are, who've made this possible. <laughs> and now I'm going to uh, introduce Dr. Mark Forrest, who's sitting quietly there. I'm particularly glad to introduce Mark because many years ago he was my postgraduate student. And as you know, you learn, if you're a supervisor, you learn a lot from your postgraduate students. Now, I'm a historian of London, so I'm an urban historian, but for, Mark was a student at Royal Holloway, and he wanted to do manorial history. And for some reason, I'm not quite sure why, he ended up being my postgraduate student. So, of course, I learned a lot from Mark because he took me into the countryside. He made, it, he made me look at manorial records. It really was Mark who first introduced me to manorial records, and that has been many, really Mark's career since. He's a real expert on manorial records, and he started his work with the manorial records of Chertsey Abbey and in Middlesex and Surrey. He then worked for the Manorial Documents Register, which many of you, I'm sure, have used and know about, but that was being revised. And this year is, sees the completion of that revision of the Manorial Documents Register, which Mark was really in at the beginning, weren't you? I mean, so in a sense, he, he's partly responsible for this tremendous revision. So if you're interested in local areas, do look at the Manorial Documents Register online in the National Archives to see whether your <clears throat> particular area has some manorial records surviving because they turn up in unexpected places, not just your local record office. Anyway, Mark has became and is an expert on manorial records. He uh, was the archivist at the Dorset Record Office. He's now a freelance archivist, but he's also just written a book for the BALH about uh, records, manorial records in the later period, 1500 to 1700. But I've, I've read that book and actually it tells you a great deal about manorial records right through the period, not just in that particular segment of time. So I'm really glad that Mark is willing to talk to us this morning. I look forward very much to hearing what he has to say. Thank you, Mark, for coming. Well, thanks, Caroline. Um, I hope I'll get a, a few urban manners in here uh, to interest you too. Okay. <clears throat> in 1791, Reverend John Collinson, writing his history of Somerset, found a curious custom on the manor of Taunton. He found that when a man died holding land from the lord of the manor, his wife would hold it during her widowhood. 
And if he only had one son, then that son would be next in line to inherit. But if he had more than one son, then it was the manorial custom that determined it was the youngest son who would inherit as his heir. When Reverend Collinson, he was quite familiar with manners, and he spends much of his three-volume history of Somerset describing them, and nevertheless he encountered dozens of customs that he found curious. Some aspects of Somerset manners and their customs were strange and unusual and worthy of comment, because he couldn't explain their origins. Although Reverend Collinson lived in an age when the manor was still part of current estate administration, traces of their medieval origins remained. And when local historians look at post-medieval manorial documents, they too are seeing a system of estate management and local government that was already centuries old, that had grown organically and developed locally. These maps have been subject to some standardisation through the introduction of steward's manuals, but it's still common to find some aspect of life on the manor that would differ from that of its neighbours. Consequently, it's easiest to explain manorial customs, courts and documents through the development of general themes commonly applied on most manors rather than an absolute rule that all manners follow, because there's always going to be an exception. So this talks in three parts. First, I'll discuss a small, well, I'll, I'll discuss a small fraction of what interests me about manorial documents. First, offering a general introduction to rural manners, exploring key themes, the customs of the manor, the court baron, that is the court that was held on every manor which managed common assets and administered copyhold tenancies. Then I'll look at manners with some urban element. And second court, the court leet, which was held on some manners and was particularly important in towns. Finally, I'll demonstrate through two case studies how manorial documents may be used by local historians in broader research, and particularly their use in charting environmental change. So I hope there will be something of interest to those who've already used manorial documents and in, in their research, and, and also to those who are coming at them as a new resource. First, let's look at Chalbury. It's a Dorset manor on the Earl of Shaftesbury's estate. Chalbury had been held by several different gentry families during the Middle Ages and acquired by the first Earl of Shaftesbury in the mid-16th century. Here it's shown on William Palmer's map of 1658. Chalbury displays many of the features found on rural manors. On the extreme left, that's your left, not mine, uh, you find that's a common depicted in green with trees. Moving towards the centre, there are areas of wood pasture and enclosed pasture in turquoise. In the centre, there are woods also shown in green with trees. And on the right are strips of arable in large open fields, marked in yellow, orange and blue. And on the far right is the manor's meadow in a separate box. Chalbury looks like many... Yeah, it's better down. <laughs> Chalbury looks like many Dorset manors, and almost all the land contained within the boundary as a single block. Only the meadow is detached about two miles away. The arable is still managed in open fields in, in the 17th century and wouldn't be enclosed for another 100 years. There might be other assets on the map. There might be moors, mills, markets and dovecots, fishing rights or fenland. But here we see the key components, all of which are found on different proportion, in different proportions on the great majority of manors. Much of the land was managed in common. Flocks of sheep belonging to the different tenants were folded together on commons or downs and brought into the fields after harvest. The owners of pigs released them together in the woods in the autumn. Open or common fields were sown with crops in an agreed rotation and the meadows were only divi divided once they were ready to be mown. As long as these resources were worked in common, it's not, it was necessary to follow a range of customs, which might include things like the date at which the sheep could be released into the fields after gleaning, 
who could take firewood from the woods and hedgerows, who allocated trees to be felled for repairs, how disputes relating to encroachment in the open, open fields between the neighbouring strips were resolved, who was obliged to act as a Hayward at harvest time, or a reeve who administered the, the Lord's um, kind of general rents and, and collected in those dues from the tenants. These are jobs which were often rotated around specific groups of holdings. The customs that determined this developed over centuries and they continued to develop gradually as long as there were common resources to manage and as long as, some, as the fiction was maintained that they were set in stone and had been adhered to time out of mind. So the customs of the manor were interpreted through the manor court, known as a court baron, and it's this court that defined the manor. The court baron was the Lord's court, and it was by the right to hold this court that the manor came to be defined. Here on the left is a typical court roll from Monkton up Wimborne, just a few miles north of Chalbury from 1658. The heading gives the date of the court and the name of the steward. This is followed by the names of the tenants, the homage, the tenants in attendance, and notes of those who are absent, and the tenants who are selected to serve as jurors within the court. Then come the presentments, stating some of the customary responsibilities of the tenants, that the common is properly hedged, that ducks and geese should be kept out of the Lord's orchards, that pigs should have their noses ringed when they're released in the woods. Other presentments relate to the tenants' customary entitlements, that they were allowed windfalls from trees as firewood. Some further presentments state events that had occurred, that Richard Jervis had built a house on the common and John Esseridge had built a stable and both of them paid retrospective fines to the Lord for the right to do so. Finally, we have presentments that note the responsibilities of the Lord of the manor. In this court, it states that he should provide a pound for stray animals. The two longest presentments relate to the administration of copyhold land, managing tenants and admit tenancies and admitting new tenants. This role is in English. It was written in the 1650s during the Commonwealth. Otherwise, official records of the courts were recorded in Latin until 1733. Commonwealth documents, like this one, are a good way for researchers new to manorial records to get an understanding of the nature of documents before tackling anything in Latin. And they also give a whole decade where you can look at the manor court as it functions with all the records in English. And it's also worth noting that in the southwest, and I think probably elsewhere as well, from about 1600, once the court clerk had recorded the heading, official appointments and property transfers in, England, in Latin, then English was used to record many of the customs, presentments and proclamations that were brought before the court. So the bulk of the business is met in many courts is accessible in English and to those without a knowledge of that. Many courts, but not all. Other documents are much more likely to be in English from an earlier date. Surveys, rentals, stewards' papers and perambulations were often recorded in English from the mid-16th century and almost always from the mid-17th century. So from the Reformation onwards, there's an increasing range of documents in English in every county and from around 1600, the majority of documents are in English. So if you think back to that court at Monkton up Wimborne, the two longest presentments related to the admission of new tenants to copyhold tenancies. And copyhold tenancy was a form of landholding peculiar to the manor. It was abolished, abolished exactly 100 years ago in 1922, and it developed out of the ancient, servile, customary tenures that had been the norm in the early medieval period. 
The first known copy was granted in Dorset in the manner of Newland in 1307. And as a form of tenancy, it had become recognisable nationally by around 1500. Until its abolition by Act of Parliament in 1922, a large amount of land was held by copyhold tenants, and its gradual replacement by leasehold and freehold was one of the most important changes to life in many rural areas. So how did copyhold tenure work? A tenant came to court, swore fealty or allegiance to the lord of the manor, and paid a fine. Then he received from the hands of the lord, through the steward, his holding by copy of court roll and by the customs of the manor. The details of the tenancy were recorded in the court roll and the tenants received a copy like this one from Sturmage to Newton. In Dorset and elsewhere, tenants often held their copyholds for terms of lives, usually three lives, rather than for a term of years. They had the right to pay a fine to add a new life when the incumbent, ten incumbent tenant died or the property passed on. So they could always top up the number of lives on the copyhold to maintain it at three. So it was a relatively secure form of tenure. And it couldn't usually be terminated unless the tenant allowed it to lapse. Now, this all sounds fairly straightforward, but the devil's in the detail. Because copyhold was a customary tenure, it was governed by the customs of the manor. Adjacent manors might have different customs, perhaps relating to the rights of widows, or as we saw in Somerset, who could inherit. And when death duties or heriots were payable, these were set out in the customs of the manor, and the copyhold agreements bound the tenants and the lord alike to adhere to them. Overall, copyhold tenants often had more security, lower rents, and greater, greater access to communal assets than did leaseholders, and more obligations and more restrictions than freeholders. A lord might sell copyholds to his tenants as a freehold to raise capital, and this was usually quite advantageous to the tenant. Or he could exchange them for leaseholds to reduce his own administration. And this was usually not so advantageous to the tenants. But once converted, they could never be changed back again. And almost no new copyhold was created since the, after the early uh, 16th century. So there's a diminishing pool. For local historians, as well as social and economic historians, the transition from copyhold to leasehold and freehold and the effect that this had on the land market, on tenant security, customary rights, local office holding and agricultural production cast light on the development of the whole rural economy and the community at large. Now, not all manors were like these little Dorset manors at Chalbury and Monkton up Wimble. Elsewhere, and particularly in the north of England and in Wales, manors could be very large indeed, and they could encompass several settlements. Here's Wakefield Manor in Yorkshire, for which many of the court rolls have been published in the Wakefield Court Rolls series by the Yorkshire Archaeological and Historical Society. Wakefield was a massive manor. It covered 150 square miles of the West Riding. And in addition to Wakefield, and included several large towns, such as Brighouse and Halifax. It was split into two main blocks of land, separated by other manors, and it had several detached parts, and the whole manor was so large that it had to be divided into smaller administrative areas called graveships. These large manors were considerably more complex to administer than their Dorset counterparts, but they shared key components, common lands, customary rights, copyhold tenancies, and a manor court, that's a court baron, which resolved disputes, appointed officers, and issued new tenancies. So local historians, looking at these manors, and using the records of the court baron, and the maps, surveys, rentals, and other papers created by the steward for his day-to-day -day administration, local historians can ask questions like, who were the manorial officers and jurors? 
Were they the same people who were the overseers of the poor and the church wardens? We might ask when the, lo- the open fields were enclosed, and did that enclosure coincide with copyhold being converted to leasehold or freehold? Was that before or after enclosure? Or perhaps we could ask how frequently the, law, the, the court sat, how many people attended each session, what presentments did the stewards and the tenant bring before the court, and did that change over time? Did the courts become less frequent as time progressed? And did the nature of the presentments that people brought to the courts change from one century to the next? It's from answers to these questions that we get an insight into the development of rural communities across the country. But rural manners were not the only manners. The court baron was also held in urban areas. And copyhold tenure might be for shops or townhouses, as well as for agricultural land. A manorial administration might be just as important in a town as in the countryside. In towns, a second court, called a court leet, often played a more significant role than a court baron. The court leet was held on many rural manors, but it's in urban areas that it had its most important role in town government. Court leet was a royal court. It was franchised to some larger manors, and the court appointed constables, administered fines for minor personal offences such as brawls and verbal abuse, and it dealt with regulatory issues such as weights and measures, street cleaning, or chimney maintenance. While many historians have worked on rural manners, recently more attention has been paid to urban manners and how the manor interacted with other institutions in urban development. The most common way for an urban manor to develop was when a lord was granted the right to hold a market. The market grew, permanent retail shops and craftsmen's workshops were established, and the manor then had to regulate an urban as well as a rural environment. The most extreme example is the manor of Manchester, where as the market grew, the manorial administration became ever more complicated. New officers were appointed, and the manor court regulated the town's growing commercial centre. The court records and accounts of Manchester Manor, like those for Wakefield, have been published and make a good starting point for local historians to see a wide range, a really wide range, of responsibilities undertaken by an urban manorial administration. Uh, This page, on my left, your right, uh, from the court held in 1735, shows the manor's court leet, held by a steward on behalf of the lord of the manor in front of a jury. It appoints a reeve, a constable, or several constables, Rent collectors, rent assessors, overseers of the sale of corn, fish and meat in different parts of the town, and assessors of the quality of leather, regulators of beer and ale, scavengers to clear the streets, as well as dog muzzlers and officers to uphold local bylaws. In 1735, Manchester Courtly appointed 126 officers to serve for the coming year. The manor issued licences to storeholders and charged tolls. Like many other urban manors, Manchester retained medieval rights of monopoly for grinding corn and drying malt. And the manor had leased the right to grind corn and the mill to Manchester Grammar School. So in the 18th century, Manchester Grammar School holds the right to grind all the corn within Manchester. And its strict enforcement of this monopoly led to serious riots in 1757. The following year, a local act of parliament had to be passed to remove the monopoly, and the school was compensated with an exemption from all local rates and taxes. So Manchester's manorial infrastructure grew organically over several centuries. The court leap created a new regulatory office whenever need arose and struggled to manage the growing town. Gradually, the inhabitants grew unhappy with the creaking administration of the court leap, and in 1846, only seven years before Manchester achieved city status, the manor was sold by the Mosley family to the borough for £200,000. It's £200,000 in 1846. 
And this enormous sum recognised the manor's economic importance and the profits that could be made from the rents, tolls and market regulations that it retained. As part of the role of the Manchester Court Rate, in addition to regulating markets and administering bylaws, was the prosecution of minor acts of criminal behaviour. Top right. Here in 1651, we see Manchester Court imposing fines of two shillings on the participants of a fight in which blood was drawn, and three inhabitants each fined five shillings for public drunkenness. These were not necessarily particularly serious offences, and they represent the court leech's role in resolving disputes that might escalate, as well as dealing with the preservation of public morality. Similar presentments were made at the court leech's in much smaller towns and villages. In the Dorset town of Gilliam in 1652, Anne Jeans describes a common scold and disturber of her neighbours, was sentenced to be washed in the tumbrel, a device which, like the town's stocks and pillory, was maintained as part of the manorial infrastructure specifically for the public humiliation of offenders. Also at Gillingham, in 1635, we find Andrew Hoskins reported for organising a spectacle of bull and bear baiting, activities that had been prescribed in the Book of Sports two years previously. This charge was too serious to be dealt with by the court leads, and it was referred upwards to the justice of the peace. But it demonstrates the concerns of the constable, who, who was part of that process of moving people up through the court lead and the ladder of royal courts. The prosecution of these types of cases at the court lead varied over time. In Dorset, we find those relating to violent conflict seem to have been fairly constant through the 16th century and the 17th century and tailed off in the 18th century, while those relating to public morality appear to have peaked in the mid-17th century. Now, Manchester was exceptional in size and Gilliam quite small. The tension that existed between the growing commercial sector and the manorial administration was found in many towns. Chippenham, which is more or less in between, uh, well, it's not as small as Gillingham and it's a, a lot smaller than Manchester. In Wiltshire, the relationship between the manor and borough of Chippenham and the surrounding manors highlights some of the areas in which manorial administrations might become involved in a growing town even when the borough held its own courts. The Lord of Chippenham Manor was granted a market charter in 1205 and its status was confirmed in 1554 when a new charter was issued and market rights passed to the borough together with most of the urban properties. But this wasn't a clean break. Marking the boundaries of the borough as they were set out in 1554 and remained until 1833 on this ordnance survey map showed just how much of the developing town lay outside the borough and within the adjacent manors. Chippenham Manor also continued to hold several shops and houses within the borough's borders. It was responsible for the maintenance of half the town bridge on parts of the roads and verges and on occupied land within the borough that were technically part of the manorial commons and wastes. So Chippenham Manor's rights to unenclosed pieces of land, verges and even pavements caused constant irritation. The steward charged easements for every conceivable encroachment. He charged five shillings per year for each grill in pavement over a basement window. And the Anglo-Swiss company, which produced condensed milk in a large factory, had to pay 10 shillings a year for the tunnel that passed under the street linking the factory with the storehouses, because the street was part of the manor. More serious was a protracted dispute with the general post office, overcharging rents for telegraph poles erected on verges, which were technically part of the manorial waste. And this was eventually taken to the Court of Chancery and not resolved for, uh, until after two or three decades of wrangling between the two sides, resolved in favour of the post office. So Chippenham Manor 
provided areas for expansion to the northwest of the borough and sought to exploit the town financially. But Moncton Manor provided the land for expansion to the southeast. As the town developed during the 19th century, more and more houses were built extending into what had once been Moncton's open fields. The residents of these new houses paid their rents to the Lord of the Manor and attended his court leet rather than the borough court. The court leet appointed a constable and a tithing man who were responsible for public order. A breadwire as some retail transactions took place within the suburban development. And a haywood because the manor still had large areas of arable and meadow to be be looked after. Court was clearly important to the tenants. When the Lord tried to hold it less frequently in the 1840s, they objected, stating in 1851 that, and I quote, since this court has been discontinued to be held annually, great and serious nuisances and encroachments have been committed and continued within this manner to the serious annoyance of the inhabitants. And an annual court appears to us to be expedient and necessary. So why was an annual court necessary in 1851? Well, Manor had been quite active in the preceding decades. For instance, it had built a new set of stocks uh, opposite the Methodist church in 1836, and a new pump in 1851. At the court in 1887, after acknowledging the new lord of the manor, the tenants presented that there was a lack of common pound, which was the responsibility of the Lord to provide, the old one having become dilapidated and useless. They presented that some trees should be planted to the north side of the river opposite the bathing house to add privacy and shelter to the bathing place. They presented a footpath and a road requires repairs and the highway board should be informed. They presented that for the protection of the public, a chain should be placed across the dipping place. I think that's an area where people did laundry. Uh, at the common slip, and the sanitary board should be informed. Then they thanked the Lord of the Manor for providing them with a good dinner. So even at this late date, in the 19th century, 12 or more property holders got together, they had a semi-social occasion, and these were men who liked the church more than she'd can sit a part of the respectable town elite. They had personal access to the steward, the sort of soft power that greased the wheels of local decision making. They could use their influence, put direct pressure on the local highway board and on the sanitary authority. And they had common oversight over local assets from the stocks and the pump to the bathing space, place. So certainly the tenants benefited from access to the court and they used it to enhance their role in town government. But in the 18th and 19th centuries, the lords of urban and partially urban manors possessed properties that paid new higher rents and greatly increased in value. Manorial lords like the Mosleys at Manchester and the Goldneys at Chippenham realised the economic worth of their manorial rights and exploited them for as long as they could retain that role of Lord of the Manor. Now, I've spent a little bit longer talking about urban manners than rural manners, because while the court leap was present in both areas, it had the opportunity to develop its functions much further in towns. But manorial documents are not just about the records of the courts. For many studies, the subordinate documents created by the steward and his officers can be just as revealing. Here we return to the parliamentary survey of Chertsey that we saw on the first slide. And it includes a description of the manor house, beginning, and I quote, all that capital messuage manor and manor house with the sites there commonly called and known by the name of Chertsey, Vermont, lying and being within the parish of Chertsey in the county of Surrey being an old house, part brick and part wood, covered with tiles, consisting of a hall, a parlour, a kitchen, a buttery, 
a brew house, a milk house, and a larder, all below stairs, and seven rooms above stairs. Now, this description continues to recount the various outbuildings in similar detail and their uses before setting out the terms and conditions of the lease to a Mr. Hayes. But this is just the start. These detailed rentals and surveys give a snapshot of the whole manor all at once. And where they're produced at intervals of one or two generations, we're able to track those changes and what occurred between them. The second document here is a detailed rental of Lord Shaftesbury's manor of Wimborne St Giles. It gives the acreage and annual rents for leasing his arable, pasture, meadow, coppices, mill, and warren. It gives the size of the tenants' holdings and the rents that they paid. Because this is part of a series of rentals, we can examine the others to see when the warren ceased to be profitable and when the tenant numbers declined as the holdings gradually merged together. On other manors in Dorset and Wiltshire, we can see corn mills being converted into fulling mills and then returned to corn or abandoned as the cloth market changed. So we can see short and long term economic trends playing out in individual manners over a period of decades or even centuries. Now, using some of these stewards' papers, surveys, and maps, I want to look at two examples of how manorial documents have been used to examine areas of rural life and changes in the landscape. Instead of looking at the development of a community, these studies use manorial documents to contribute manorial to environmental research. First, look at Natural England and the Dorset Environmental Records Centre's study of ancient woodland. Natural England has project officers working with local groups to survey ancient woodland across the country. The task is to survey woodland that existed before 1600. And this classification is important for grant applications and for demonstrating the longevity of vulnerable habitats that require protection. An initial assessment for Dorset was published in 1988 and relied upon key sources, such as maps and place name evidence. Sometimes the earliest available maps were manorial maps, like this one of Bryanston, dated 1659, showing the extent of woodland well before the earliest ordnance survey or tithe maps. The Bryanston map, which happens to be one of the earliest examples of a map produced by a woman cartographer, shows not only 925 acres of Bradley Wood, but also several smaller pockets of woodland on the steep hills together with their acreages, and, so, and in some cases, the number of trees. And you can see this map at the moment in the British Library in their exhibition space. The ancient woodland project officers were principally concerned with assessing and confirming the known evidence, the evidence from their 1988 survey, already on file, extracted from maps like this one, and recording it onto a GIS system. However, there were lots of pieces of ancient woodland for which no evidence had been collected. They're not on areas that were covered by earlier maps, and project staff don't have the capacity to check against written records. And this is where local historians, working as volunteers, have the skills to confirm the existence of pieces of woodland that might not otherwise meet the threshold for classification as ancient woodland. This allows local historians to use their skills and add to the capacity of the project. By examining manorial court rolls, surveys, extents, presentments, accounts, stewards' papers and rentals, they can locate references to ancient woodland that would otherwise go unnoticed. This is an also, also an opportunity for work experience students, often studying natural sciences, to engage with a range of records that they wouldn't previously have used. Records like these, relating to the wooded areas of the manors of Durwiston, Lichet Minster, and Oakford Fitzpain. These are papers 
containing court roll extracts, surveys and accounts produced by the steward of the Lord of the Manor, Sir Thomas Kitson. Now, Kitson was an absentee lord, really. He was a prominent courtier in the late Tudor court. And his family seat was in Suffolk, which is where these papers have ended up as part of the family collection deposited in the Suffolk County Archives. But his steward was quite keen to maximise the profit from the manors and kept meticulous notes in English so he could quickly access information without ploughing through the Latin court rolls. So these are summaries of transactions, transactions that were recorded in the court rolls but the steward has extracted to keep in his papers as a quick reference. There's a lease of a 28 of coppice wood called Sutcombe in Durwiston. There's a coppice wood called Beerwood in Lichit Minster. And there's a sale of standing timber in two areas of Oakford Fitzpain. Now, most of these entries, and certainly the ones for Durwiston and Lichit Minster, on their own, without any other supporting evidence, provide enough information for the surviving portions of these wooded areas to meet the classification of ancient woodland and therefore inclusion in the Natural England's register. Now, Dorset Survey of Ancient Woodlands was only begun last year, so I haven't got any kind of final stats or analysis on it. But another project managed by the National Trust, which made extensive use of manorial records, was completed in 2015. During the 1930s, Cyril Diver assembled a team of volunteers and experts who meticulously surveyed, mapped and recorded wildlife on the heath and sand dune system on the Studland Peninsula. It's near Poole in Dorset. 80 years later, the National Trust led a three-year project to re-survey the peninsula. The work of Cyril Diver and his team was repeated and the changes in the species of flora and fauna recorded. Here, Diver and his team are pictured on the heath and within the dune system, which are two of the key elements at Studland that make it a designated place of special scientific interest. To understand the changes that had taken place, why some species have become more numerous, some remain stable, others declined, it's necessary to note the changes to the landscape that had taken place both before and after the original project. Well, after the original project, it's fairly straightforward, but before the project, the changes to that area over the previous two, three, four hundred years that's more difficult to establish. So one of the first task, tasks was to establish the rate of environmental change, and particularly the rate of, the, the rate of growth of the sand dune system. Here we see on Ralph Treswell's map, produced in 1585, alongside the 21st century LIDAR image, the same area. But both maps of Pool Bay, Pool Bay's to the bottom left of each map as you're looking at it, and uh, at the top it's facing towards the Isle of Wight into the open sea. Trestle's map's extraordinarily well surveyed and drawn, particularly we can see how the coastline facing into Pool Bay, that's towards the pair of compasses bottom left, looks remarkably similar to the survey on the LIDAR image. Above this, we can see the LIDAR image has a large area of land that's shown as sea, open sea, on Trezor's map. These are the sand dunes that had hardly developed in 1565. The so-called Little Sea, which is in the centre of Trezor's map, is entirely open and tidal whereas on the LIDAR survey, only a few black pools remain, separated from the sea by the dunes. On Trezor's map, we can identify certain key features of land, such as the salt pans bordering the Little Sea in the centre of the map and a small group of enclosed pastures at the bottom. Each different use of the land contributed to the soils 
that support the flora and fauna today. So it's important to know how the dune system developed almost, in, or that the dune system developed almost entirely within the last 400 years. How it developed and the use of the land during that period is where the manorial documents really come into their own. Two hundred years elapsed between Treswell survey of 1585 and the next survey by Woodward. And Woodward refers to Treswell survey as the old survey, and his new survey conduct is conducted in 1775. Between these dates, the stewards' papers, court rolls, and rentals give details of how the land was managed. Details such as the number of animals that each tenant could graze on the heath. And it's only from a close reading of these manorial documents that a timeline can be established of how Studland Heath and Dune system were used and worked. We can already see in 1585 that the former salt pans were leased as close seats. That's in the document on your left. And in the stewards' papers, we can see that they were used as pasture. And at different times, we can see that they're used as pasture for different types of animals, which then contributes to the different qualities of the soil. Partly, this tells us about the soil build-up from those animals, but it also just gives us the important piece of information that they had ceased to be used for salt production, at least by this day, which is a particularly important piece of information regarding the soil quality. William Woodward's survey of the Manor of Studland, produced in 1775, also includes a map, but it's his written survey that provides the most useful information. The heath covered 1,200 acres, and intermixed with it were a further 1,000 acres of waste. Woodward states that the waste was, and I quote, mostly consisting of sandbanks, flats, and mud, many hundreds of acres of which have been left by the sea and become heath ground since the old survey was taken. That part of the waste, called the Little Sea, is yearly growing into heath and will become heath within a few years. So we have a chronology, we have a description of how that land has changed within the relatively recent past and how it is continuing to change at the time that the survey is taken. Now, neither the ancient woodland nor the civil diver project set out to use manorial documents. They'd have been equally happy to access information from parish records or local government records. But it's the manorial documents that were the most useful to them. So as we've seen, manorial documents survive in surprisingly large numbers. And they can answer lots of questions on a wide range of different projects. And they're now easy to locate as the National Archives has completed the Manorial Documents Register. If Dorset is representative, you'll find that around half of the manor's records are in the local county archive. Up to another quarter in the archives of other counties, and particularly adjacent counties, with up to another quarter being accessible in the National Archives, the British Library, and various schools and colleges, and only a relatively small number are still held in private collections. And many of these may be accessible by arrangement. So if you're lucky, you might come across a document like the charts that plot the rotation of reeves and tithing men at White Regis in Dorset in the 17th century. Important information to see who held these offices, how they held them what property qualification there was for somebody to hold the office of Reeve, working on behalf of the Lord of the Manor, working to administer his estate, or tithing man, working on behalf of the courtly, upholding local bylaws, weights and measures, etc. I was particularly lucky yesterday in the British Library where I was looking through a set of Manor court records and happened to stumble across half a dozen women being elected as tithing men, or tithing women in this case, in the late 16th century on a man in their Chippenham. Now, this isn't supposed to happen, but this sort of thing does happen. 
Occasionally, when you're looking through Manor Court records, you're looking for something else, you're not really intending to find information on maybe manorial officers, but it springs out. It's that sort of serendipitous thing that you can find information about all kinds of different subjects. Now, these women were elected as officers or selected as officers because they had a particular property holding. It was their turn in the rotation as the wheel turned around. Their property came up as being the one where the officer should be provided. We might expect, well, OK, you know, they're women who are being elected. Maybe they're providing a surrogate. Maybe they can't actually do the job. Maybe the court isn't going to allow them to do it. But in fact, they come to the next court and make their presentment as tithing women. It's not supposed to happen like that. If you look in the steward's manuals of the 17th century, you know, they, they wouldn't accept that women could undertake these offices. But sometimes these local customs, these local anomalies just develop organically. And sometimes you find particular pieces of information that you're not expecting to find. So these documents may show both archaic and current customs. The terms by which tenants held their land, the formation of the landscape, the management of fields, woodlands and meadows. They had biographical information to tenants who served as officers and those who appear in the presentments. They give information about crime and punishment and the regulations that prevented conflict. All the people are represented from the families who entered the workhouse to the small farmers, to the local elites. So in conclusion, for local historians, looking at both urban and rural areas, from the 16th century to the early 20th century, perhaps now is the time to ask, at the start of every project, no matter what the time period or the theme, what manorial documents are available and how might they be applied to our research? Thank you. Questions? Yes, happy to take questions. If anybody has a question. I have to wait for a microphone. Thanks, Mark. This is a question right from the beginning of your talk. You said that the youngest son was going to inherit. What? What happened to the other children? What the older sons? What did they not get an inheritance at all? They don't get to inherit that piece of land. Now, if, they might already have had a piece of land somewhere else. Yeah, if if, if the parents required other land that's held under different conditions, maybe they have a bit of rental land they can pass that on. But the copyhold agreement states that that block of land, that tenement of land, has to pass to the youngest son. Um, it, it's something that seems quite common in, in, in Sussex, uh, North Surrey, um, areas of Fenland around uh, Somerset, and I think it's to do with those areas that in the 10th, 11th, 12th centuries, the, the, there was a large amount of open land, a, a, a land that could be taken in. So the eldest children had the opportunity to go out and make their own living, as it were, and the youngest children needed the support of the established thing. So... And it, 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 it then persists in some areas. But, uh, yeah. So the daughters just had to marry somebody with land? Sorry? The daughters had to marry somebody. Daughters had to marry somebody, yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't get to inherit land. Unless there are no sons. But it's a thing, could be a whole thing. It, you can pass it to daughters. If you have no sons, it descends to your daughters. Um, and then the custom may be the eldest or the youngest or partible inheritance, and it depends on the custom of the manor. Could be any of them. <laughs> You can always ask me questions later if you Hi, thank you, Mark. Excellent talk. Um, could you just clarify some of the roles of the people within the manors? Does it depend on which court? Like, what's the difference between the homage and the jurors? 
reeve and steward mm. um, does it depend which type of court it is or what's the difference yeah uh the court baron and court leak both appoint juries uh the jury at the court baron the lord's court has to come from among his uh copy held tenants and the uh, court leak has a wider group of people from freehold tenants uh, and other people who are obliged to attend. So the, the court leak has a, a larger pool of people to select from, and there are a large people, group of people who it can select. Um, the, the other officers, it, it, sometimes it's on a property qualification, sometimes there are officers uh, like the, uh, the assessors of fines, the people who set the level of fines within the court, who are the sort of top jurors, the foreman of the jury. Um, the Reeves and the Haywoods are usually people who have significant agricultural holdings, always customary tenants, not lease, usually not leaseholders um, or freeholders, and they are, are, are selected on rotation. Um, some officers might be salaried. Um, I think that you know, constables and Reeves in areas where the job is quite onerous can receive remuneration uh, for it. So there's a whole different range uh, and it depends on the courts and it, de and it depends on the size of the area of jurisdiction, both how many officers are required and uh, how those officers are selected, but frequently by rotation. Thank you. And sorry, the difference between the homage and the jurors? Difference the between the homage and jurors. Well, yeah, the, the, the homage will be at the court baron. So, 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 so the homage is at the Lord's court. They, they are homages. They are people who have sworn a kind of feudal allegiance to the Lord of the Manor. Uh, whereas the jurors are people who are obliged to attend the court as inhabitants of the area. Thank you. Oh. Yes, thank you very much. Oh. Is this on? Yes. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk, and it's um, clarified a number of issues for me. But I wonder if you could explain a little bit more about the relationship between the uh, Maronial uh, courts and parish vestries. And the reason I ask this is that uh, I come from a, a, a parish in North London, Hornsey, which enclosed two very distinct manors. And on numerous incidents, looking through the records there, the vestry seemed to be appointing uh, officers um, which one would assume were normally uh, the uh, responsibility of the uh, one or other of the, of the manners. Um, and so it seems to me it must have been a very complex relationship between the vestry and those two independent manners. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't say that's unusual. I think there's often a complex relationship between the vestry and, uh, and, and, and manors. Um, everything's much simpler if you have one parish manors, but frequently, probably usually you don't, frequently there are several manors uh, that occupy the same parish and spill over into adjacent parishes. Now, there's the sort of theory and legislation uh, from the Tudor period onwards about who should appoint particular officers. But in practice, you find that local custom and local precedent tends to take over. So you can have highways officers and you can have uh, other constables being appointed at either. And it really depends on the power and the authority of the local organisation. If, if, if the manorial court has retained its authority, then, then, then it may well be appointing those officers rather than the parish vestry. But over time, it's quite likely that the parish vestry will take over. over. I mean, if we took at the period from 1550 through to 1920, whatever's happening in 1550, 1600, 1650 may well change by the time we get into the 19th century. So it's quite likely that the Manor Court will start off being the more powerful organisation and, and the one at which those officers were appointed in, in the 16th and 17th centuries, and then that will change and, and it will flip 
as the man of court becomes less significant. And that's a really interesting process. And, and, and that's one of the reasons why the manorial documents and the manorial history is so interesting, that that, that that relationship between the manor and the parish is constantly changing over 400 years and plotting that change and charting that change, seeing when it takes place, why it takes place, does it take place at the same time as adjacent parishes? Really interesting. Thank you. Hello. I'm studying a respondent in Derbyshire and you mentioned the surveys in the man in the manor court. Um, is there any uh, specific um, methodology where you can use these surveys to transfer them into transform them into a, a map? Yeah, um, do, I mean there would have been a, a methodology for transforming surveys into a map in the 16th and 17th, the late no, 16th no, no. and 17th century. But from today, now, from, now, I mean. from now, not that I'm aware of, there are plenty of examples where this has been done. Um, uh, I'm thinking about June Palmer's book, Three Tudor Surveys, which was published by the Dorset Records Society, but that's because I'm a Dorset person and uh, I uh, happen to know that one. Uh, but I'm sure there are plenty of others. And certainly uh, what June did was she took a map that was an estate map from the 18th century and surveys from the 1580s. And she found that by taking the fixed points in the surveys and by looking at the size of the um, holdings, both in the survey and in the estate map, uh, that she was able to plot quite accurately uh, different, uh, 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 more or less all the holdings in the 1580s onto an um, estate map, which I think was from the 1750s. It's, uh, it's a very good piece of work, but I'm sure, but I'm sure that's been replicated in other places. So, so if you're talking about taking yeah, surveys really now really and yeah. how to plot them out, then I mean, I would say that's, that's not a bad place to start. <laughs> no, I've got some, so that's what I'd like to do. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure it's possible. Uh, hello, everyone. Hi, Mark. It's me what? at the back. Oh. I, I, hi, Mark. Uh, I've got some questions from the chat online, which I'm going to read you now, if that's okay. Okay. So we've got question, pe people asking questions. So, um, first question, what advice would you give to those of us who want to access documents in Latin but have not yet acquired the relevant skills. I think there's several of us who like to. <laughs> How long have you got? Well, I'm, I'm, well, assuming that you've already booked into a day school at Keel or a, 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 a kind of one of their week-long courses or somewhere where it's possible for people to learn Latin for local historians and that you've already picked up a copy of Eileen Gooder's Latin for local historians, assuming that that's the case, and so you're looking at manorial documents, but you haven't yet got the level of Latin to do it. Well, what I do, I think, is start in the 1650s. I think if you start in the 1650s, then the handwriting's difficult, but not too difficult. If you can read a parish register from the 1650s, you can read a manorial document from the 1650s. And it will give you the whole range of activities of the court. So, 1650s, a lot of manor courts are still very active and they're still carrying out the full range of actions and activities that you would find a century earlier. So you can look at documents from the 1650s in English, all these documents produced during the Commonwealth are in English, and so you, you can get a head start of finding out how the court works and get a good decades worth of information and for a lot of studies a decades worth of information will take a lot of time to establish but it will give the roles of the officers it'll give some of the technical proceedings some of the technical terminology that you need to then carry through to uh, other documents great um, i should also be cheeky 
conflict of interest here, but I should, I should uh, declare that the National Archives has an award-winning, wonderful online Latin training. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, online. <laughs> right. Uh, next question, Mark. Um, may have missed this, but you divide urban and rural manners, where many, where, where many manners were mixed between urban and rural. So will the county record office here in Cheshire let the inquirer know which is my manor in Warrington? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch the first bit of that. Um, that well, you mentioned that um, there are urban, sorry, that you divided between urban and rural manners. And yep. there were many mixed manners between urban and rural. So the question really is, so will the Cheshire Record Office be able to tell the inquirer which manor is in Warrington? Which manor it is that they want? Oh, well, the man manorial documents registered online ought to tell you that. If you, know, if you know the parish, if you know the ancient parish, then uh, you ought to be able to find out which manor is within each parish through the manorial documents register online. I'm sure Cheshire Record Office will be able to help you as well, um, but to save using um, somebody in the middle to do that, then uh, the manorial documents register online will tell you all the manors within each parish, whether or not any manorial documents survive from, for them. Okay, and one final question, I think. So, was the legal process the same for all, for all English places in this era, or was North and South different? And I guess also you can include Wales in that too, can you? Same question. So again, was, I think was, sorry. Was was the legal process the same for all English places in this era, or was North and South different? Uh, where manners are holding a court baron, and that court baron is a customary court. It depends on the custom of the manor, and that custom will depend on the manor itself. There isn't a north-south divide for that. There is a divide in Wales, uh, because the statute of English laws that's brought in in 1540-something, I'm thinking possibly 1543, but I'm not quite sure, um, determines that um, all courts have that have previously been following Welsh practices have to adhere to English laws. So there, there is a, um, a, there's a distinction in Wales, but in northern and southern England, uh, I'm, I'm not aware of any distinction, but for me, the north starts at Chippenham in Wiltshire. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, I think I will draw some. But this is Paul Driver, by the way. I'm the acting chair at the moment. I'm, not, I'm on. I'm online, live in the room. We've had lots of comments to you, Mark, online that you can't see, but you'll see shortly. Thanking you for a great talk and asking other interesting questions. I should say to everybody online and in the hall that you can buy Mark's wonderful new book on post-medieval manorial records, which he co-edited with Helen Watt. Many people are holding those up in the room. Um, you can buy that if you're in the hall from our bookstore today, or you can buy it online from the association's website. Although obviously Mark won't be able to sign necessarily your uh, online copies. <laughs> Although I'm sure he will if you ask him nicely. Um, we're now going to move in the hall to a short break. And I think for those of you online, you know you will have the choice between continuing to hear from Mark and joining us for our annual general meeting, which starts in about five minutes. So many thanks, everyone, and thanks to Mark. Thank you. Hello, I'm Helen Palmer and I work for the BALH as the Outreach Officer in Wales. But that's only a voluntary position and my everyday job is as an archivist. I'm the County Archivist in Ceredigion, which is the county around Aberystwyth, um, Cardigan to the south, uh, which used to be known as Cardiganshire. And I want to tell you a bit about being an archivist and about archives and about the county record offices and why you should use them. Uh, I'm sure many of you will have used archives many times and have visited very many archives and record offices, but some of you may still have that treat in store. And I really would recommend that one of these days you go along to your county record office and see what's there. I like my history first hand 
and that means looking at the original documents which recorded it at the time. Um, I'm actually working from home today, so uh, these documents here are part of the family collection. <laughs> but I've treated them as an archivist really would. Um, they're very, very carefully preserved and conserved in special polyester um, coverings, which incidentally, if you have your own records at home, I would very much recommend that you invest in because with history, any archival material is precious. Um, books are wonderful things, but books are always printed and published in multiple editions often, whereas with archives we get just the one chance to preserve it. So there is a huge responsibility on archivists, but on anybody and everybody that has original records in their possession to look after them really, really carefully. There was a joke when I was an archive student. We used to have a t-shirt which said, archivists make it last longer. But actually, you know, that, that joke has some truth in it. Um, my job is to preserve documents and equally importantly, to make them available for people to use. So um, what we've got here actually is some amazing letters written by my own great grandfather, um, who was um, a painter of ships in the dockyard at Portsmouth and also a painter of the portrait of ships. So we have some beautiful paintings that he left behind him. Um, but that's really not what I wanted to talk to you about today. Um, if you come to an archive, you will expect to look at original documents. Never ever feel embarrassed or unsure about asking an archivist for help. They have trained specifically to help you. So it would be a terrible waste of the profession if you didn't go in and ask for some help. Often now, usually now, you'll find that the catalogues of a record office or archives are available online. So you can have a sneak preview at the kind of documents that you might be um, hoping to see when you get there. The catalogue will be probably just that. Um, although increasing numbers of documents are digitised, an awful lot of them aren't. And sometimes now we see people who say, well, it's all online, isn't it? And they're thinking of the subscription sites, um, Ancestry.com, Find My Past, uh, primarily um, genealogical sites. And those are fantastic. They are absolutely brilliant and they've brought um, first-hand history um, into the home. So they're marvellous, but they're not the end of the story. There are still loads and loads of archival sources which you can only see by visiting a record office. Oh, and here is my cat come to help me, thank you. Um, so if you go to a record office, they will probably ask you for some details, your name, address. You know, don't be offended. Uh, the security of the archives is very, very important. And we ask the same thing of, of everybody. And then you will be told very, very firmly, you must never, ever use a pen. Um, most of you will probably be taking your laptops and your cameras and your phones along uh, to record any information that you find. But if not, what we archivists still do is to go equipped everywhere with a 2B pencil. Something you get when you qualify as an archivist. And what archivists do, as I've said, is to make documents available to the public. And we do that by preserving them, as I've said, by already, by, by, by making sure that they're packaged appropriately. And by creating catalogues, which explain exactly what that document is about, who created it, when they created it, maybe what it was created for. Because of course, just because a document was created for one purpose doesn't mean to say that we might not use it for all sorts of different purposes. Um, the census, I mean, a document everybody's familiar with, that was created to help government to work out how it needed to use and provide for the people of Britain. But of course we use it as a genealogical source, we use it as a local history source, we use it to find out um, what professions were in an area, 
uh, maybe what professions weren't mentioned, although they must have been present in an area. Um, we can use it to see how buildings, which we know today, were used back then. It's got all sorts of potential uh, that wasn't originally envisaged, and that's true of a lot of documents. So the catalogues are really, really important, and I spend a lot of my time creating those. I also spend a lot of my time helping members of the public to figure out puzzles. The past is full of puzzles, and that's one of the great privileges and um, really enjoyable things about the job. Somebody will walk into the archives and they'll say, I want to know this thing. I want to know about this person. I want to know about the house I live in. And part of my job is then to help them to find the right documents to answer the puzzle. A gentleman came into the archives a couple of weeks ago he lives in a particular house in Aberystwyth and he'd never been into an archive before, like some of you may be. And we managed to find him the plan of his house that was built in 1903 and who built it. And then we did some exploring to find out why that man wanted to build that house back in 1903. And he, the gentleman who was visiting left with a narrative, well, he left with far more than he expected, a picture of his house in the days before it actually existed. That's just one little example, but archives are full of thousands and thousands and thousands of documents. Every, every record office has them. And each one of those documents has been retained for posterity on the basis that somebody will find its contents interesting and that somebody could be you. So I heartily recommend you to go along to your archives and find out. Bye bye. Hi everyone and I hope that you've just really enjoyed that wonderful talk by Dr Mark Forrest just now. Um, for some of you um, your questions were answered during the live uh, session in Conway Hall but we're going to be answering some of the questions online as well. Just a reminder, if you do have any questions that you want to ask Mark, please make sure to put them in the Q&A section of the webinar. I'm going to be looking down at my laptop here to answer your questions. I have made notes of some of the ones that were in the chat, but um, if we can try and make sure as much as possible that they are in the Q&A, that would be amazing. And once again, thank you so much, Mark. We've had so many comments in our chat saying how amazing the talk was, lots of food for thought and lots of local history research as a result. So. Right. That's what we want. <laughs> More local history research in manorial documents. Absolutely. Um, and also, just as a reminder, sorry if you can hear sound from the hall, there is a video playing on our live stream, which is on YouTube, uh, which is for the AGM that is going on concurrently. Just a reminder, this is a hybrid event with lots of different things going on, so do bear with us. But the first question, and um, when Mark and I were chatting just off uh, camera just now, he was very excited to see uh, this person in the chat. So Trixie Gad said, thank you for the great talk. I'd like to know whether manorial, borough or parochial officers were all drawn from the same pool of inhabitants and did the different jurisdictions come into conflict? Now, she is from your local area, isn't she? She is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dorset person doing Dorset research. So uh, fantastic. Yeah, I'd be very yeah. pleased to have people researching. Dorset and I think probably Hampshire as well. Um, yeah, manorial um, parish and borough officers sometimes do come from the same pool and sometimes they don't. It's a bit tricky, it depends on uh, the area that you're looking at. Uh, I think probably the best research that's been done on this is Marjorie McIntosh's book on the Royal Manor of Havering. Um, Margaret Spufford's book, Contrasting Communities, has some pretty good material too, where people have looked at the different pools of officers and seen whether they're part of the manorial administration and how they hold their land and what the property holding qualifications are for different types of officers. Um, certainly at Havering, I think the, the, the borough officers and the manorial officers are probably quite distinct in Essex. Um, so they're the same type of people quite often uh, at, at the top end that uh, they're the people who you'd expect to be church wardens um the people you'd expect to be 
managing the local community deficit, enough status to be able to do that. In many of the manorial offices, that's true. Uh, but in some manorial offices, some manorial offices don't carry a lot of status. Some of the manorial offices, something like Haywood, um, uh, Scavenger, uh, not very much status there at all, if any. In fact, it's probably a job that you have to pay people to do. So there's a, there's a wide range of manorial offices, the, the ones that uh, you would expect to overlap with a borough elite might be perhaps the jurors in a court elite um, or uh, the assessors are fine but 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 the um, the more onerous work you might think would be attached to a particular land holding and it would go around in a rotation and people wouldn't necessarily particularly want to do it it could be an onerous task they wouldn't enjoy it. they might even employ a surrogate to do it so so, so there's, there, there's variation but but there is some overlap excellent okay. that's amazing and i can see that joyce is just about to join um the uh agm as well so i will ask this question now from her uh but were many manners mixed um so for example urban and rural and she also asked will county record offices in cheshire let her know where her manor is in warrington Okay, I think I think we answered the Cheshire and Warrington section uh, out in the hall. Um, but mixed manners, yes, um, there is some overlap between urban and rural manners. Um, there are some manners that are entirely urban. The manner of the Savoy in London, I think, is often held up as a classic example of that. But there are also manners which overlap and, ha and have a either a majority urban area with a rural hinterland. Uh, or are principally rural, but then little pockets within an urban area as well. So, but this is true of all manners, really, that they can be very... Ma manners don't have to be like the map of Chalbury that I showed as the second slide, where everything was in, within one border. Manners can perm into each other, that several manners could have shares of a common field or several manors could have share of common meadow or woodland and particularly downland so that that's also true with the manors that have a an urban element that they can that they can perm mix in um, to another administration be that another manor or a borough excellent and then with um m lawrence owen and i think that was miranda earlier so apologies if i've not said that um so what exactly was each copy hold tenant given and presumably that would be only a copy of the section of role relating to their holdings yes that's right um just the copy of the section of role relating to their holdings um the court role itself would record uh often actually not as much detail as the copy of court role that it would include the name of the lords of manor the name of the steward the date at which the copy was granted the tenant who was incoming whose life was uh, to start the copy hold was tenancy for life and then the other um people usually his children, nieces, nephews, brothers, who, who could be named on the copy, so it can be men and women. Uh, and it would give a brief outline of the property itself. Um, sometimes naming particular closes or fields, but not going so far as to name individual strips within fields. Um, it would be assumed that that copy would be recognisable from the most recent rental or survey. Um, and it would be assumed that the customs of the manor were known to the tenants and known to the jurors and the homage, so that uh, it wasn't necessary to put them into the copyhold agreement. Now, copyhold agreements can be very useful because they often survive where manor court roles have been lost. So I'm thinking of a manor like uh, Broadmain in Dorset, where there are no manor court rolls at all, no court rolls, no books, we've got no record of the court in session, but we've got two or 300 copyhold agreements. And from those copyhold agreements, we can reconstruct uh, the pattern of tenancy and a lot of the uh, 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 setup 
automatically don't let them the, the, the fields and woods the closest where they were who held them at different times because there will be enough information in those copyhold agreements to kind of know who's adjacent to who and whose land butts on to something else thanks then and then we found this question quite interesting it's about suffolk i think it was mm -hmm. um so lynn boothman said i've used records from the later 17th century through to the 19th in a suffolk manor mm -hmm. i've been interested in the growth of conditional surrenders where the property is being used for short-term loans i'd be mm -hmm. interested to know if this is common elsewhere it's an interesting way of getting credit it is an interesting way of getting credit it does happen elsewhere how common it is I don't know. I haven't. I haven't read anything on that. I haven't seen anybody else's study relating to that. Um, in Suffolk, I mean, there, 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 there are there, there's good work on Suffolk. I already um, talked about Margaret Kim and Margaret Spafford. Um, we had uh, Richard Hoyle and uh, Henry French's work on Earl's Colm in Essex for that uh, as being. Uh, work within that area. I would have thought that Henry French and Richard Hoyle would be likely to pick that up if it had happened in Essex. Um, it's certainly the case that increasingly from late 16th century onwards, more and more property speculators invest in copyhold land, more and more urban merchants um, build up a property portfolio, if you like. So they've got land as security. So I wouldn't be at all surprised if that wasn't happening elsewhere. Uh, but it's not something I've looked at myself. Okay. Maybe that's something for some something of our Something for more study. Yeah, there's yeah. So, so much in manorial records that there's just nothing published about it. So, so almost any area that you pick, the, 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 you can be doing the, the, the definitive, the, the type article that people will then refer back to because it's the only article on that subject. So, so yeah. groundbreaking, groundbreaking history. research. <laughs> yeah, it really is. So many aspects of the oral history of life. Definitely. And I believe that we might have answered this already in the hall, but um, Colette Miles said, was there a conflict between court and vestry? So, for example, regarding the uses of resources for the poor? Regarding the use of resources for the poor, not necessarily because the um, the manor court has quite prescribed areas of interest and the vestry has quite prescribed areas of interest. And I don't think, I could be wrong, but I, I don't think that there's likely to be a conflict between them. But what's certainly the case is that the church wardens um, and therefore available to the, the church within the parish um, are, are parts of the manor that are designated as fields uh, for the upkeep of so you will quite frequently find that within the manor court there's a piece of land that is held by the church wardens rather than being held by a tenant as an individual. Um, within a conflict between the vestry and uh, the court would be more likely to occur over jurisdiction and uh, and I think the, the question in the whole um, really related to the changing role of the manor court leads and the changing role of the vestry and the vestry becoming a more important organization over time as the court leads became less important and and that's certainly the case um, across most of the country and and, and, and it's rate and that rate of change how that happens and when that happens again it's, a, it's an interesting area because it doesn't happen at the same rate everywhere and it can be centuries apart um on manners and parishes that aren't geographically very far apart. Wow, that sounds amazing. I'm learning so much about these oh, records, I kind of want to look at them myself now. <laughs> um, so Phoebe Merrick has said, here in Romsey, the records of those eligible for jury service for the three town tithings survive in the Broadlands collection in the University of Southampton for the later 17th and 18th century. I've not met other examples of this, so do they survive elsewhere? Records of people available for jury service. I haven't come across a document that specifically has that heading, but what you do find are things called resident roles, um, which are essentially people who are resident within the manor. Um, so that could be 
an equivalent form of document. The, the, those people who are within the manor are, are the residents, in other words, resident really. Um, and, and resident resident roles is a, a, a classification of manorial document which can be searched for on the manorial document register. So I would say that's uh, the most likely equivalent. Lists of jurors, they may well exist elsewhere. Uh, I don't think I can recall seeing them. Um, so Susan Rose has also said, in my parish in Devon, uh, we have a farm now called Court Barton, earlier known just as Court. My theory that is that this was where manor courts were held. Is that likely? Uh, it's quite possible. Yep, 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 the name is for that. It could be where the manor courts were held. It could be where the a manorial court, courthouse, a manor house was located. Um, the site of the manor, um, either an area where the Lord of the Manor lived or an area where his principal salaried officer, somebody like a bailiff, lived at essentially a home farm. It, it sounds to me like it's the site of a, a, a home farm which could hold a court, which could, because it's got the word court in the title, most likely did hold a court. Um, I think if I can just kind of go off at a tangent from yeah. that, that people often think of manors as having manor houses. And um, if you I know, if I go out in Dorset and I talk to local WI, I say, oh, you know, what's my house, a manor house? I say, well, manor houses didn't exist on every manor because if a manor was owned by a crown or if a manor was owned by a local monastery, it wasn't necessary to have a manor house. They didn't need to have a house in every manor that they had. Um, so, and similarly for lots of um, larger estates, multiple manors, you don't need to have a house in every one, but you usually have some kind of home farm, at least in the Middle Ages. And these quite often worked in hand as part of the estate by salaried officers of the Lord of the Manor up until, say, the start of the 13th century. And then they could be, and they were retained as an area known as the Demean uh, well after that. And, and it could well be that what you've got there is, is a site that had been part of that principal home farm area. Again, one of these interesting things from 1500 onwards, from 1500 to 1900, is how that broke up. When the domain breaks up, that often produces a lot of leasehold land um, that gets put into the property market in the manner for tenants to acquire and augment their holdings or hold instead of copyhold land. So it produces a dual system within parish. We've got some leasehold, some copyhold. The leasehold being the old home farm, the old domain, and the copyhold being the land that was held by the sort of villain tenants, the serfs in the early Middle Ages. So there's a lot going on there that you can find from the name of a particular place. And I, yeah, I, I, I think it's quite conceivable that the court and the court barton is the site of an original manor court. There you are, you are absolutely <laughs> right with your assumption, which is wonderful. Um, so Richard Neely has said, in the court leaks we've been studying, it's fairly common for leaseholders to be fined for not appearing. Was this a serious offence, or did people prefer to pay the fine rather than turn up? And how important was it to turn up? It depends. Leaseholders often don't have quite as many rights as the customary tenants. And leaseholders often usually can't serve uh, as part of the homage. So it's restricted to customary tenants in most manners, not necessarily all. So the lease what advantage does the leaseholder get from turning up to the court? Well, probably not very much. Um, the fines probably aren't punitive. The fines probably only a couple of pence on each occasion. So a leaseholder who holds quite a lot of land, well, there's no real reason for them to turn up. Many leaseholders could be um, property, property speculators from a local town, so they're certainly not going to turn up. They'd much rather pay the fine. Um, but then again, some leaseholders could be very small leaseholders who are perhaps younger sons who are doing a combination of leaseholding and wage labour. 
in which case that the financial loss is a greater hit to them. So really, it, it depends on the status of the leaseholder, I would say. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the leaseholder who's a property speculator, much less likely to attend. The leaseholder who's a, a, a minor um, landholder, principally engaged in wage, like wage labour, much, much more likely to attend. Excellent. And then uh, Rhiannon Lloyd has said, in your talk, you mentioned that there certain court officers were chosen on rotation. Yes. Would it be usual for a bailiff to serve in the office for many years? Um, she's a genealogist working with a client whose ancestor seems to have held that office in the Somerset Manor of Lincoln and Whitcomb. Okay. Yeah. Bailiff is, well, a bailiff is much more likely to be a salaried officer. Uh, so a bailiff is, is much less likely to operate on rotation. Um, there's some, some, some them. it's not inconceivable that they could be a tenant of the manor who serves once every 15 years or so, but it's very unlikely that bailiffs usually, some of the officer, like the steward, are brought in by the lord of the manor to get all the jobs done that he wants to have done as um, um, by somebody who can't do it part time, really. That uh, job, jobs like a Haywood or a Reeve, you maybe would put in, I don't know, maybe sort of seven to ten hours a week, uh, <laughs> conceivably. Um, maybe more at harvest time. A Haywood is essentially a harvest officer. Um, you might get some remuneration for it, so you might get um, an area of the land within the manor which is called the Reeves Acre or the Haywood's Acre that gets given to them as remuneration for the office. But a bailiff is much more likely to be somebody who's planted in there by the Lord of the Manor um, and, who, uh, and, and who serves for a term of years. Wow, sounds like a very important job. <laughs> yeah, 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 it could be. Um, yeah, a reasonable salary, uh, probably literate as well, so, yeah, or to some degree. That sounds incredible. And then Jennifer Southernwood has said, my village in Norfolk was divided between six landholders mm -hmm. after the conquest. Would this have merged into fewer manors over the time? Very likely, yes. Um, there is a general process of consolidation that takes place in manors uh, in the uh, probably in the 13th century. And then another phase of consolidation that takes place probably in the 15th century. A bit hazy on the dates because I'm sure it happens in different places at different times. In Dorset, um, I know one of the manors, well, if, if I had two of the manors, I quite earlier, Durwiston is actually a manor called Durwiston cum Knighton. That's Latin cum for weed. Um, so Durwiston with Knighton started out as two separate manors in the, the or by the 13th century. By the 16th century, merged into one. Lichit Minster is Lichit Minster cum beer, Lichit Minster with beer. And again, they had merged together um, by the 16th century. So, quite conceivable that your um, doomsday manners have merged, altered, and changed by the time you get a, a written record of them from the 14th century onwards. Yeah, so absolutely. So, my um, area, so I'm from the East Midlands area, and I know that slightly further north in Nottinghamshire is the Duke of Reeds area. So, I always wondered whether there was those overlaps there. So, it's nice to see that it's not just my neck of the woods that mm. potentially has that um, going on. Um, and then Brian Phillips has said, and apologies, first of all, if I'm mispronouncing anyone's names, um, hopefully, I'm doing okay. Um, hi, Mark. Thanks yep. for the talk. You're welcome. <laughs> um, much different additional information to your book. Uh, what's the involvement of Victoria County history with manorial records today? So, for example, in Wiltshire, mm. yep. any idea if the BCH is working on Dorset? Mm -hmm. And he is from Milton Abbas Local History Group. A very active local history group, Milton Abbas. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, the Victoria County history produces standard manorial descents and works on manorial documents and, and aims to produce a standard description of every manor across the country. Um, Victoria County history funding isn't um, as forthcoming as it was 20 years ago. Uh, generally, uh, Victoria County history was funded partially by local authorities and local authorities have other pressures at the moment. Um, Wilshire is being finished by money raised locally by local volunteer groups. Um, 
I don't know if that would be something that would be particularly easy to start on another county because Wiltshire was um, sort of forfeits complete uh, when the local authority funding uh, stopped. The, the, it was probably possible with the setup to finish it off. But there are several active Victoria County history counties. Gloucestershire is active, Somerset, uh, Essex, Staffordshire. Um, there are probably others as well. And um, yeah, so uh, yeah, it, it, it will be the aim of the Victoria County History Series to cover every county apart from Northampton, uh, Northumberland. Okay. Because Northumberland already had a um, county history series. So uh -huh. But every other county in theory at some stage should get a Victoria County history. It might be a very, very, very long time. Absolutely, and that's something we actually had in a webinar recently um, where we learned a bit more about Victoria County history and how to get involved. So everyone at home, uh, this is not a plug for them, but if you do want to get involved in that research, definitely check out their social media platforms and uh, potentially help them to make these lovely little red books that we all know and love as local historians Terrific. come to, to life. I say little, they are quite significant. <laughs> um, and yeah, um, so also just to give everyone an idea, I know that our programming says 12.45. The AGM is currently overrunning. Hopefully those of you who are trying to live stream on the AGM have done so. Um, and Katie and Chris have been very active in the chat with helping you, so thank you again. And then Miranda Lawrence Owen has said again, I work in the Duchy of Cornwall Manors with a colleague. We are wondering if Duchy Manor courts and rules were much less likely to change and develop than uh, non Duchy Manors. I think the short answer to that is probably yes. Um, it's nice to be able to give a short answer, which is nice, <laughs> isn't it? I've looked at two um, Duchy of Cornwall Manors. I've looked at Mere in Wiltshire and I've looked at Fordington in Dorset. Um, and yeah, I'd say they're pretty conservative, really. They've certainly got large numbers of copyhold tenants right into the end of the 19th century. Um, their rentals, their surveys, their, um, their, their division of fields, they're much more likely to have uh, open fields for them longer, resisting enclosure. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think from, from my own experience of two Duffy of Cornwall Manors, I would say, super conservative super conservative yeah. excellent and also thank you to miranda there for giving mark a, a short um answer for his question <laughs> um, i'm very conscious that you've been talking for well over an hour now <laughs> um, and then keith woolley has said can customary tenants make raise mortgages on the basis of their tenancy um not something that i've looked at um, I would expect that they can. Um, I wouldn't expect that it's necessarily called a mortgage, though. No. Um, so I'm uh, floundering a bit there, really, because I mean it really isn't something that I've looked at. Um, but I, if you expect to say, okay, if somebody has land as security and that land is held for a defined period of time. And it's, it's held as your capital, then I don't see any reason why you shouldn't be able to raise some kind of loan upon it. Um, yeah, I'm sure you can. I'm sure you can. And I'm sure I've seen examples of it that I just can't bring to mind at the moment that we've been talking for two hours. <laughs> it's been a very long time. I'm very impressed. But, 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 but I, think, I, I think the short answer to that is yes, but it's not necessarily going to be termed a mortgage. Okay. So those are all of the questions in the Q&A. If anyone does have any last minute ones, um, then please do feel free to pop those in the chat. But I have a question that's slightly less highbrow than these wonderful questions that we've been having. And something I always like to ask local historians is yeah. what got you into that particular topic that you've been talking about the last two hours? What got me into manorial history? Uh, well, because I'm from London, I'd always refer to the area that I grew up in as my manor. I just always called it my manor. And, um, and if I was going to somewhere that I didn't really know, it was out of the manor. <laughs> and, and so when I came to university, I started studying manorial history. I, you know, my, my tutor, Clive Birch, found it really funny that I'd refer to my, my home area as my manor. Um, and then when I came to look at um, medieval history more seriously as a postgraduate, I remember uh, looking at a manor court role. And more or less the first one, and I hadn't been learning Latin for very long, and, and I looked at a medical, and I, 
puzzling through it, trying to work out what's going on. And I discovered an entry where it said, John Coke struck John Ladd's pig and broke its tibia. He's fined four pounds. I thought, well, fantastic. That's reaching a level of history. That's reaching into a society that I wouldn't find out about in any other way. That these records are going to tell me about what's going on in local communities across the country in a way that no other records can. And so, yeah. So that's principally why I study memorial history. That's so interesting because I find the exact same. So I know I keep going on about, on about this to our online audience. So apologies for talking about it throughout the day. Um, but my PhD research is looking at the commemoration in care of First World War dead in the United okay. Kingdom. Yeah. And some of the records that I'm looking at is inquiries, files and letters that we're receiving from the families. Mm -hmm. And again, they're very similar in the style of those memorial records where anywhere else those pieces of ephemera might be lost um, and you might not be able to find the similar degree of information there. So to see the manorial records acting in a very similar way, it's so lovely to find all of these different documents that you can look at as a local historian. Because for a start, we all love the archives, don't we? we do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Going in and feeling like Indiana yeah. Jones or someone like that and discovering these records that might mm. not have ever been seen for hundreds of years and things. Um, and so it's really wonderful to, to look at that through the lens of what's yeah, going on yeah, and yeah. the pig with the tibia is a very funny one for me as well. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> but, 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 but almost certainly nobody had read that since it was written mm. five, six hundred years ago. And, and, and that's very often the case with these minority that you really are you know, in virgin territory, that this is looking at material that nobody has used, nobody has seen, nobody has, and certainly nobody has analysed for hundreds of years. And so, yeah, I mean, it's the opportunity for a unique study. There's always the opportunity to discover something that's interesting, groundbreaking, original, different, that nobody's seen. So, yeah, why not? Why, 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 why rework something that people have been looking at for years when you could be looking at something? That nobody's ever looked at before. And I know we're incredibly biased here at BALH towards this, but local historians are doing that groundbreaking research mm, absolutely. and you know learning on social media I've, I've become more of a generalist in my history because I think it's quite mm. common when you are in different fields to yeah. really narrow down your research so now I learn so much niche history from our local historians and now when I go to these villages and things I can think oh I remember someone tweeted about that memorial document yeah. or again to shout out Pam uh, who live tweeted your wonderful talk earlier yeah. talking about Rillington and her connections to there through her genealogical research mm -hmm. and so you know local historians really I think sometimes underestimate how important they are to history. Yeah yeah absolutely and, and I think that that plays out through people perhaps starting looking at parish registers, looking at censuses, looking at tithe records and then maybe the manorial documents are a, a, a stage on from that that you kind of you, know, you can cut your teeth getting the handwriting from the parish records and doing the analysis from the census and mixing the different sorts of records together by looking at the earliest census and comparing it with the tithe map and then you overlay the manorial records on top of that and it's just another set of records that overlay and just give you a wider broader picture of the whole community. Definitely. And I suppose my other question for you is what's next for your research? Because I know that you are very busy with lots of different things. <laughs> the big question. <laughs> oh, I am, and I, I just keep finding more. And that's the problem. That, you know, the more records you look at, the more things you find that uh, you want to look at, and the more uh, things that you find. The, 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 the next memorial piece of work that I want to do is to look at the court's leet in Dorset. <laughs> And the hundred courts in Dorset, and the hundred court is a, a tier above. Uh, um, oh, it's a tier that runs in parallel or above the court lead. And to, to look at the relationship between the hundred court and the court lead, uh, and how they interact in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, and the types of cases that are brought to each court, and in those hundreds, well, the court. The curia legalis takes all of that business and the, the legal court of the hundred means that there's no court leaks within that hundred all of the business is brought to the hundred court that happens for instance at the mayor in wiltshire um whether there's a difference in the cases that are brought and what's happened 
than say a uh, hungry like Badbury hungry in uh, Dorset, where half the manors go to the hungry court as their legal court, and half the manors go to a court that um, held on on the manors themselves. And and does that make a, a, a qualitative or a quantitative difference in the type of cases brought to different courts? Gosh, that sounds amazing. And yeah, definitely following on from your wonderful guidebook for it, us as well. It's a lot of number crunching. But, it, but, but, there's, but there should be some fun stuff in it too. I bet your spreadsheet looks absolutely terrifying for that number. <laughs> We've all been there as local historians mm. looking at number crunching and those mm. sorts of things. Yeah. Um, again, a reminder, if anyone does have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat or in the Q&A section. Um, and we can do that. Um, I think we're just about to potentially go back to the AGM. No, sorry, I'm looking away from you uh, and just seeing what's going on. Um, and in terms of the guidebook, how do you um, kind of go about that research? Because obviously it's going to a slightly different audience sometimes. Yeah, uh, that was quite tricky because that was in lockdown. And what I'd originally intended to do, and Helen, my colleague who, uh, who co-produced it with me, uh, we'd, we'd intended to go around to a lot of different archives and sample a lot of different uh, records and uh, we were very lucky that many of the archives that had more recently uh, contributed uh, their information to the Manorial Document Poster had uh, done outreach programs around that and so they were able to send us some documents that they'd used in their outreach programs and some summaries of what they found in completing the Manorial Documents Register and so we had a, a reasonable amount of material from across the country because I mean, I'm based in Dorset, Helen was based in York, and there was only a certain amount that we could gather locally. Um, fortunately, it turns out the Wakefield Court Roll series and the Manchester Court Roll being online, fantastic. No, I, I really would say that for anybody who hasn't looked at manorial documents previously, that they contain so many examples that, you know, the, the part of our process was triaging them and saying, oh, that's interesting, that happened in Manchester, that happened in Wakefield, and, you know, I know that that happens in Dorset, Helen had worked a lot on Wales and she you know, was able to say whether certain things had happened in Wales. And, um, and, and we put it together by our collective knowledge of what we glean from other places, but obviously made it a little more difficult by lockdown. But it is the case that there's so much variation between the others. And, and so much of what's been published has been based on Essex, Suffolk, and Norfolk and Cambridge that uh, it's, it's quite difficult to get a national picture. And I'd say, well, if you're working in Essex, Suffolk, Norfolk and Cambridge, well, that's great because you've got quite a lot of really good examples to compare and contrast against. And so that can help you with your research. If you're in other counties, it means that any, count, any study that you do you can set against a lot of public published material from a different region and so that means that uh, you've always got that kind of compare and contrast which, waiting, uh, i'm waiting for a cue for the online side of it to to come the very very local, uh, and, and means that i'm going to get a wave in the minute so definitely and again just to <laughs> yes. you know go over that with my own research having digitized records has been so helpful in lockdowns and things i know it's incredibly uh, a difficult task and a bigger picture than a lot of people see when they are doing their own local history research um, so definitely um, and now we are finally finished up with the agm in the other room thank you so much to mark for talking with us for the last two hours <laughs> about manorial records if you do have any other questions please just pop them in the chat and we can pass them on to mark and he can answer them in slow time a little bit but we're now going to head back to the hall and we're going to be going to the local history photographer of the year awards so the theme this year was what does local history mean to you and we had some wonderful images coming through about local history and a variety that covers across all time periods uh, it was a really tough competition um, i'm sure that you'll see the images okay. and be blown Hello, away um, by them um, no, so we're now going to go to the hall and to our outreach lead susan moore to find out who the winners are and hopefully some of them are online as well but thank you again mark you. and uh, you should be able to see conway hall's main area just now and so many people are coming through with thank yous uh, in the chat um, and yes we're just going to see if we can get into the main hall for that live stream there so i'm just looking behind the camera so thank you
Hi, I'm Susan Moore. I'm chair of the outreach team. Um, understandably, the COVID pandemic forced a complete rethink of our strategy for outreach and within BLH. And we, throughout 20 and 2021, we've been implementing a highly popular programme of online events, as you've been hearing. But we wanted to reach further. We wanted to see into the lives of local historians across the country. How better to do that than through the viewfinder of a camera, or more likely a phone screen? So last August, we launched our new nationwide photography competition, asking the general public the question, what does local history mean to you? This would be in the form of both a photograph, and we hoped a few words to explain what that image meant for the, for the photographer. Initially, we wanted to see how lives had been affected by the pandemic. But as time wore on, we realized we'd all grown tired of that. I wanted to see the positives as doors open and we're able to connect in person once more, just like here now in Conway Hall. A key goal for the outreach team is to connect better with young people in the country. And so the under 18s were given their own category within the competition. We've been delighted by the breadth and variety of the submissions received for the competition and our judging panel were given quite a job in shortlisting the finalists. You're about to see a short video which showcases some of the photographs as well as our finalists being announced for the local history photographer and young local history photographer of the year for 2022. And if all goes smoothly, you will see a video.
Throughout the lockdown, I spent most of my time walking up on the beautiful and rugged Culmstock Beacon, exploring the wildlife, stunning views and magical surroundings. It's a wildlife haven and attracts a great amount of animals, reptiles and birds. One of the many reasons why I love walking up there is a change in the atmosphere at the different times of the year. In the spring you can see the frog spawn metamorphosis into frogs. In the summer you might catch a glimpse of the disguised adders cloaked in with the terrain and astounding sunsets shimmering on the horizon. In autumn time you can feel the familiar breeze brush upon your shoulder once again and in winter you can wrap up warm and see the frost, ice and snow glimmer on the paths. High on the southwest point on Blackdown Common is Culmstock Beacon. It is one of a chain of Elizabethan beacons used for lighting fires to warn of advancing enemies, for example, the Spanish Armada. The beehive-shaped structure was built of flint and was rebuilt after the collapse of the earlier one. The beacon has been lit up for numerous celebrations, including the Queen's Golden Jubilee in February 2002. I loved how the colours in this image connected local history to the broader landscape and nature, which is so important when considering the environment. It felt as though this beacon should be found along many routes, and again connects us to our local history through all of the things that this building has seen. The Druid on the Ruins is one of my favourite places to visit while at Sugarborough Hall. It is a family favourite as long-standing members of the National Trust, but I think that it is a perfect frame for the river behind as you can walk into it and view the wildlife passing by, including swans, geese and other waterfowl. The contrast between the well-upkept gardens and house and the disappearing ruins is beautiful and I think it intertwines past and present perfectly. This was a beautiful image that showed how local history weaves into our world like the branches around the folly or ruin. It felt like something magical and the colours made it feel really warm. The Posada pub, Litchfield Street, Wolverhampton. This is a Victorian Grade II listed building situated in the town, now city centre. Built in 1886 on the site of the old Noah's Ark Inn. It still has many of its original fittings and fixtures, including ceramic tiling inside and out. Rare snob screens and beautiful floors that absorb the natural light coming through the stained glass windows. For me, it's always been the pub where the fans of Wolverhampton Wanderers stream out of, having pre-match drinks before supporting their team at Molyneux. As a young teenager, I always wondered how so many noisy, golden black fans could fit into such a small place. Once old enough to use the pub for its intended purpose, I discovered the big beer yard at the back, an iconic and much-loved building in Wolverhampton. Carol Langford's pub interior perfectly tells the story of years of use by the locals and we love the tie-in to stopping off on the way to see the wolves play. The use of limited depth of field to throw the background slightly out of focus was very effective. The only thing linking us to the present was the lack of cigarette smoke. Grade 2 star listed Sandfields pumping station is a forgotten hidden historic gem. Like most industrial heritage building, its familiarity in the landscape has eroded away the curiosity of the casual passerby. Yet this Romanesque styled masterpiece is a cathedral to the Industrial Revolution, for years unloved, for years abandoned.
Its Romanesque style took the language from the past and built the way to the future. Celebrating new technology and progress, it brought life-giving clean water to the beleaguered communities of the industrial black country, bringing health and well-being to all. This building and its historic contents showcase the provision of clean water that seeded the developments that enabled Britain to become a modern industrial country. Britain led the world in technical and scientific developments that have improved the quality of people's lives worldwide and are a testament to the vision of the Victorian engineers and their philanthropic endeavours. Let us look at this building and remind ourselves of the tens of thousands of people who died in the cholera epidemics of the mid-19th century. Most of these unfortunate people were buried in mass graves or cholera pits with no identity, dignity nor recognition of their lives. This building is a monument to their life, giving them back a voice that allows them to tell their remarkable story. The heritage of the modern water industry is almost entirely absent despite its unarguable relevance to human development. We all agreed that David Moore's evocative picture of Sandfield's pumping station was a worthy winner. His use of dramatic moody light emphasises the subtle beauty of the Victorian architecture. We are much more utilitarian now. The words beautifully illustrated its importance for public health. So what amazing photographs. I have to admit, it's the first time I've seen them, so I am hugely impressed. Anyway, congratulations to all our entrants, and especially, of course, to David Moore, the BLH Local Histo History Photographer of the Year, and to our runner-up, Carol Langford. Madeline Davis, age 14, is the BLH Young, Histori BLH Young Local History Photographer of the Year, and our runner-up, Sophie Poor, age 11. We know that both Madeline and Sophie will be watching this announcement from home. Sophie has a friend's birthday party she was anxious not to meet, miss, so she had to choose. And she, we persuaded her, go to your friend's birthday party. We've made a special arrangement for her to have her own YouTube premiere of this video to watch when she gets home. We'll be showcasing more of our entries during the Local History Awards later, and of course across our online and print media in the coming weeks and months. Thank you to everyone who entered. While you would all agree that the standard has been very high, that wasn't the only point for us. We wanted to take a visual census of the country, of how we see local history in our own environment, the mundane as well as the dramatic, the subject matter being as important as the image quality. I'm delighted, therefore, to announce that the Local History Photographer of the Year 2023 competition, with its highly important young section, will be launched again next month. That means there'll be plenty of time through all seasons to submit entries. There's absolutely no excuse for you not to take part. You've seen there's a bit of competition, but please, take photographs, use the summer, use the autumn, use the spring, and thank you very much. And well done to all of our wonderful winners there. And I should particularly shout out, and I'm going to look down at my notes here so I get names correct. Uh, we have two of our under 18 winners and runners up in our online audience. So really well done to, let me just find it, uh, Madeline Davis and Sophie Poole. Uh, who are both in the chat. Now, Sophie is currently at a birthday party, but she will be watching this on Catch Up later. So really well done to both of those winners. 
Um, and just a reminder that this is an annual award, so we really look forward to seeing some of your entries next month when the next year's Local History Photographer of the Year opens. So keep your eyes peeled for that as we talk about that on our social media channels. Um, as one of the judges, it was a real privilege to take part in this event and to see so many wonderful photographs from the competition. So I'm sure that there's going to be just as incredible ones next year. Um, as you will see in the chat, we are going to be replaying that video a little bit later on, um, just so that we can get that sound quality a little bit better. Um, the lunch is now going on at Conway Hall, so we are going to take a little break for lunch. Um, but before we do that, I'm just going to announce um, some information about something that we're going to be showing now. Now, Dr Jill Draper was our Events and Development Officer for many, many years. Um, in actual fact, when I've spoken to people this morning, we're not quite sure just how long, but we're thinking about 20 years. So a very long time and hopefully Jill is joining us in the chat today. She was a key member of the outreach team and really helped to make the BALH what it is today. She is now retiring this year and so we put together a short video to wish her well on her retirement and remind her of the impact that she has had on our organisation. So we're going to have a short video now for about eight minutes and then we're going to potentially break for lunch. So let's have a look at that now. At the end of 2021, Dr Jill Draper retired from her role as our Events and Development Officer. Here's a short appreciation from the BALH team, acknowledging Jill's many years of service to the organisation. Hello everyone, I'm Paul Dreiber, Acting Chair of the British Association for Local History. Now today marks the end of an era for the Association, as we celebrate, although I think for many of us celebrate is not quite the right word, the retirement of Dr Jill Draper as our Events and Development Officer. Now Jill has admirably filled this post for around 20 years now, and when I asked fellow trustees and committee members for their memories and views on Jill, everybody sent me their warm wishes and hopes that Jill will enjoy a happy retirement, getting involved in more of the things that she loves, particularly research on medieval and early modern Kent. Now, Jill, as many of you will know, has been dedicated and committed, not just to local history, but to the British Association for Local History for two decades and more now. Many of you will have come across Jill when she was manning a bookstore or giving a talk at a local or family history event around the country. And that's testament to her brilliant organisational skills, which has often been seen to best effect at our flagship annual Local History Day. Jill, as many of you will also know, is a very warm person. She's willing to adapt. And nowhere was this more obvious was when she came up with our 10 minute talk programme, um, which was kind of one of the successes of lockdown. Jill has always been a kind of a quiet leadership figure and has formed a formidable partnership with Dr. Jane Howells, the editor of Local History News, in bringing the association and local history to as many audiences as possible. So on behalf of the trustees, Jill, uh, I wish you every um, best wishes with the retirement, and we hope to see you many more times in future. Good luck, Jill. Thanks. Hi, Jill. I'm really sorry we won't be able to say goodbye in person to you at the BALH Local History Day. I'm sure you've been finding plenty to do since you've relinquished your role with BALH. And I thought you might like to know that a friend of mine, Mark Halewood, has been working on marking and signing documents in the West Country. So, of course, I alerted him to your chapter on the New Romney playbook. Look out for an article shortly. All the best. Bye. Jill, uh... Although I've been a member of the BALH for very many years, decades, it's only in the last few years that I've been uh, involved in its organisation. And um, you've always seemed to be there. Um, you've always seemed to be running things. Um, and particularly, um, and uh, what concerns me most, you've always been there uh, selling our publications. Um, you'll be a very hard act to follow and we will uh, miss you uh, and all your uh, organisational skills uh, enormously. So uh, a very big thank you um, on behalf of all of us who are involved with uh, the publication side uh, of the uh, BALH. Hello Jill, 
Firstly, a huge thank you generally for all you've done for BLH over many years. I appreciate how indebted we are for your perseverance and continued promotion of BLH. From a personal perspective, I'd like to thank you for your support and kindness when I took over the role of Chair of the Outreach Committee. Without your experience and the knowledge that you were there, my position would have been so much more difficult. Finally, as BLH has moved into the digital age, I'm sure I won't be the only person to thank you for the inspiration that is the 10 minute talks. This was exactly what was needed as COVID struck the land and we were forced into a very speedy change from in-person events to our present very successful online presence. Thank you, and I hope you have a wonderful retirement with lots of time to do all that research that you actually want to do. Thank you. Hi Jill, you're one of the first people to welcome me when I joined the BLH team, and you've always been extremely supportive of our digital initiatives. Not least, of course, with uh, you pioneering our 10 minute talks, which was such a great success during the pandemic and continue to be so. Um, Pre-pandemic, you were certainly one of our uh, most public faces with BLH, tirelessly going out to all of those events, often accompanied by Stephen, your husband, uh, promoting both BLH and local history in general to many different people, and of course, selling loads of our publications. So thank you, you're greatly missed, and uh, wishing you all the best for the future. Hello, Jill. This is just a message from me in the depths of Wales to say thanks not only for everything you've done for BALH but in particular thanks for being so very kind and welcoming to me um, when I joined the team and of course very very best wishes for everything you do in the future. Um, hope we can stay in touch. Bye. Hi Jill. Uh, this is just to say thank you for all the support that you gave me, particularly when I first started with BLH, um, sort of helping me learn the landscape, who was who, uh, always there with a friendly comment, a um, bit of advice or support, um, which I really appreciate when you join an organisation like this. Um, people like you who've been around for a long time and know the lie of the land and are willing and keen to have uh, younger people help out. Uh, that's always been um, that's so important so thank you very much hello jill i'm very pleased to add a few words to your tribute you've been a dedicated knowledgeable and supportive colleague and the association and all of us have benefited greatly from your hard work and expertise i'd particularly like to thank you for your contribution to the historic england report on assessing the value of community generated research all my very best wishes to you and Stephen. Hello Jill. You've been such a major part of the British Association for Local History that it's difficult to envisage the association without your central role. A lot has happened in the time you've been involved with BLH and your imprint is found in many successful aspects. The AGMs, the attendance at key local and national events, your many detailed reports to committees and the trustees, your interaction with members and non-members. You even played a key role in finding David Killingray as uh, our new chair. When you became ill, you found many ways to get round your restrictions and showed your real resilience and commitment. You did ask me, uh, when you first became a bit incapacitated, whether I'd like you to give way to someone else. I, of course, said no, and the subsequent years have proved that this is absolutely right. Associations move on, and they do so, though, with the imprints of those who have contributed. You've certainly left a strong imprint. Good luck, and all the best for the future. That was a wonderful tribute to such a lovely lady who was a powerhouse in the BALH family. Now, we are currently having lunch here in the hall, but I'm here with Catherine Moore, who is our Digital Engagement Fellow, and we're going to be having a bit of a Q&A over the next 10 minutes or so. Um, we are back on schedule, so apologies for running over slightly with the AGM. Um, we are going to make sure that we are back on schedule for this afternoon. 
Um, just as a reminder, if we are dual streaming it again, if you are wanting to go to the YouTube link, make sure to leave the webinar and then come back to it once that live stream has finished. Um, and that cuts out the dual audio that some of you are experiencing. Apologies about that, um, but make sure to do that if we do dual stream. We are really looking forward to welcoming Dr. Yanina Ramirez this afternoon. Um, but for now, we're going to talk to Catherine, who is a historian in her own right with a big following on Twitter and on social media. I mentioned this morning that Catherine has a hugely successful YouTube channel and you may recognise her face because she has been quite literally everywhere recently with the YouTube campaign. How was that to work with YouTube officially? It, it, was, really, it was really good. Uh, I must admit, when they first contacted me, I thought it was a scam because it was just an email from YouTube. But no, it was real. Um, and they wanted me to be part of a campaign which highlights regional creators and what YouTube can do in spotlighting uh, regional issues and sort of things which may not reach the mainstream because they may not appeal to that many people and I, I was I was so fortunate to be selected because relatively speaking my channel is actually quite small you, there are people out there with hundreds of thousands of subscribers and I only have five and a half thousand so I, I was quite taken aback but I, I really loved being part of it the image that was used for the campaign, I dressed up as Amy Johnson. And so that was on billboards and in papers. And so it, it was just really nice to be able to get that, that platform and that exposure for my work. Definitely. And now one of your big brand things is you talk about Yorkshire's hidden history, which means no Bronte, no York <laughs> Minster. We don't talk about those when we're in meetings. So what sort of areas of history really interest you? So I like pretty much everything. I've gone all the way from the Romans up to World War II and beyond. I've actually gone all the way up to the Beatles. So what I find interesting is uncovering stories. So people's lives or events, these narratives which have gone under the radar for most people and they probably weren't even aware of. Things which are just, just fascinating to learn about. So while some people specialise in a particular topic and they can become experts in that, I like to do lots and lots of different topics, probably not expert in any of them, but I know enough about each of them to get along. Definitely. And nevertheless, your YouTube videos, and I'm not just saying this because we work together, are really fascinating and quite amusing to see you wandering around in fancy dress. And I just imagine what the behind the scenes shots look like. And I know that sometimes your family get involved and help you with mm. those shots, don't they? Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in terms of, you've of course sent, uh, done webinars with us about how to create YouTube videos and things like that. Um, what got you into creating content in that way? So. I mean, history has always been a part of my life and the idea came to me out of the blue. I was in uh, last year of sixth form and I just realised that there wasn't anyone making videos about Yorkshire history and I thought, oh, well, I can do that. So I did. And it, it took a while for me to learn the skills because I never studied it at school. So no one taught me how to do it. And my early ones were very bad. In fact, my very first ones were so bad that I deleted them all and they, they're banished now. <laughs> But when I restarted my channel in, in 2018, again, you know, the videos are very good, but I look back on them as learning experiences. And through practice, I've been able to develop my skills to the point where I'm now quite proud of what I make. But no, so I, I, I was motivated to start it because I wanted to tell these stories and I thought I could do it in a way which was quite different to everyone else. Definitely. And I think your style is so unique in such a positive way. You know, you sit there and you think, I really want to go and visit that place in Yorkshire now um, as you're gallivant gallivanting around, which is wonderful. Um, what's been your favourite video to film so far? OK, Big so question. yeah, there, there's a couple, I think. So sometimes I get these really wacky ideas and I think that's insane. It's amazing. Got to do it. So when I did my Amy Johnson one, not only did I go to Hull and I was traipsing around the city, trying to find these statues of her. And I was in full costume, so I, I had a group of lads shout at me, hi Amy, because they recognised me and people were looking at me and it was, it was great. But when I, when I was filming the internal shots, I was like, why don't I just build her plane? <laughs> so I made a little, little cardboard plane. And I think that sort of represents the creativity which the, the medium of video enables you to have because I was able to do all that wacky stuff. And I mean, there's, there's just so many videos I've done, which, which I love. I was commissioned by Middleton Railway to do a video on their history and I love that. I love climbing on the trains, 
just being given the freedom to do whatever I wanted. So, yeah. It sounds very exciting. Like, I know it's very cliche to say things as a, a freelancer and a, a local historian and things like that, but it definitely sounds new to you guys are the same to you. <laughs> um, and I should also say, for those of you who watch our videos on YouTube and on social media, this is the face behind all of that wonderful editing there. Um, so I cannot claim credit for any of, of that. And I am always blown away by what you can create through my very rambly videos and <laughs> podcast episodes. Again, with the podcast that is coming out currently, um, Catherine has spent many an hour cutting out all of my ums and ers and likes and other ticks that um, people will get frustrated with. So I'm sure you've had enough of the sound of my voice for a little while. Well, I've got to put up with it. <laughs> <laughs> you did scare me once when you said you could splice it together to make it look like a no context sentence. <laughs> um, so no pressure at all. And that just shows how much over the last few years you've learned mm. to develop your skill set when creating that content. Um, and I suppose as well, one of the things that your brand is really important with is you really highlight that you don't need to spend tens of thousands of pounds to create such wonderful content. Do you want to talk a little bit more about exactly. that? Exactly. So all I use for my equipment is, is just a phone, a normal phone and a lapel mic like the one I'm wearing now and a tripod. And that's it. The rest is just how you edit it, how you put it together, how you construct the video. Because, you know, there's a saying, all the gear, but no idea. A lot of people are tempted to go out and buy the most expensive camera. But if they haven't got the skills, it's not going to make a bit of difference. And I'm, in a way, being restricted in my equipment has forced me to be more creative. Because if you're limited in what you can do, you have to think outside the box. You have to think, how can I actually say what I want to say or show on screen what I want, want to show? And, you know, I, I'm, I, I always love talking about how you don't need to have all of this stuff to be able to create brilliant videos. And I, I think I can demonstrate that. Definitely. So what sort of um, things have you been doing here today? So we've been calling Catherine our roving reporter. Um, so who have you interviewed and what sort of things have you seen outside? So I've been interviewing some of the award winners, uh, the individuals whose research has won awards, which will be presented soon. And that's, that's been fascinating listening to um, in detail to what they've done and why it's important. And then after this, I'm going to find a few more people to capture and make them talk. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds very ominous. <laughs> um, and as well, in terms of the content creation that you've been doing, you're also going to be helping to splice together these videos that we've been recording throughout the day to upload them to our website in over the next week or so, aren't you? Yeah. So that's going to be very good. And Catherine's also been working with someone else I'm going to be interviewing this afternoon. So Marek, who is one of our, um, we've been doing an internship program with the Canterbury Christchurch University History Department. And we'll he hear a bit more from him about the sorts of things that Catherine has been getting him to do today. Um, and if you do have any questions, just as a reminder, feel free to pop those in the Q&A section and I can ask Catherine them. Um, but I suppose what's next for you with your YouTube channel? What sort of things have you got coming up? So there, there's quite a few things. I mean, I'm, I'm supposed to be having a book coming out in the summer. I say supposed to be because I haven't been told yet when it's coming out. So it's a bit of an, in, in the weird limbo stage, but it's about Yorkshire folklore, customs and traditions. So if you think of Steve Rood's The English Year, which is a brilliant book, except mine does actually cover 365 days, 366, sorry. Um, <laughs> And so that's going to be taking up most of my time, but also I've got tons of videos planned. I've just made one on a forgotten Yorkshire explorer who traveled and then fell out with David Livingston. And I've got ones coming up ranging from medieval feuds to musicians to, I don't know, I've got a whole list of them, but the, the creativity never stops. And I, I, I'm just so passionate about what I do that I work really hard at it and I love churning out this content. And that really shows as well in the types of content that you produce both for the BALH and more generally. Um, and in terms of your fellowship, obviously we started both together in September of 2021. Uh, and this is also the first time I should say that we've actually seen each other without looking at a, a square Zoom box. So it's very strange to see heights and things like that. And I knew you were going to wear a fabulous outfit as well. Um, but I suppose what's been really interesting about the fellowship for you, because I know I've learned so much um, over the last year, I don't know if you have to. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's sort of getting really involved in the local history world and sort of seeing what societies are doing and what they may need help with. So 
I've been making podcasts and videos and as a young person, I mean, I say I'm 23. I mean, there's people younger than me, but if we're talking about local history, I'm, I'm young. Um, I'm, I'm very excited to be able to use the fact that I've grown up in a digital age to reach younger people, to reach different people and to make sure that the information uh, is being communicated in different ways. So to give you an example, a few months ago, I was a panelist for the Society of Australian Genealogists at eight o'clock in the morning whilst they were in evening time. And it was amazing because they found my videos because it was on the internet and I've got viewers from Australia, America, Canada, Europe. Some of them have family history links to Yorkshire. Some of them have no connection to Yorkshire, but they just like hearing someone talk about history like me. And so that's only because of the internet. And I think, you know, if you're producing a leaflet of what went on in your village, but it's staying on that leaflet, how is anyone ever going to find it? And so being able to give my my knowledge and my skills to help local societies develop their digital skills and outreach, I think it is great. And it's only going to bring more positivity in terms of the people who can get involved in and appreciate local history. Definitely. And I think as well, if you do want to get in contact with us to participate in 10 minute talks and podcast episodes and all of those sorts of things that I mentioned at the start, and I will go through uh, those again in just a second, please do get in touch with us. We, um, our website is balh.org.uk and our email addresses are there so you can get in touch with us and talk about those things. And especially even if you don't know necessarily how to create a video, we've got people on hand to talk through those sorts of things. Um, so definitely make sure to look at those. Hi everyone, my name is Paul Driver. I'm currently acting chair of the British Association for Local History. Now originally from Lincolnshire, where I'm a proper yellow belly, I now live in Brentford in West London. And you join me here at the confluence of the Thames and the Grand Union Canal, about 135, 140 miles from its beginning in Birmingham. Now, during May, a local group, Brentford Boyce, have been running a pop-up local history exhibition around the town. And I'm going to take you on a walking tour now to show you some of the highlights and to really congratulate them for their great work in bringing local history to life here. And as acting chair of the association, I know that's really vibrant work going on, really exciting work going on across the country in local history. And this is just one demonstration of that. See you in a minute. One of the things I think people probably know about Brentford or is most infamous about Brentford is that it famously has a football ground or had a football ground, Griffin Park, which had a pub on each corner. And here behind me, we can see the Griffin pub. And it's obviously one of those greater pleasures in life, football and beer, and Brentford has always mixed those very well. In fact, Brentford had um, several breweries, famously the Beehive Brewery, which is now in the dock, but also locally we have the Fuller's Brewery, which is still one of the big employers in the area, which is based in Chiswick, just down the road. Now here you find me at Griffin Park. Founded in 1889, Brentford FC first played here in 1904. And they played here until very recently, just for a couple of seasons ago, when they moved to the Brentford Community Stadium, much nearer Chiswick. And this, as I say, is the ground famously where there are four corners. Now, Brentford have always generally played in the lower leagues, but famously, of course, two seasons ago, they were promoted to the Premier League. And under Thomas Frank's brilliant management, they've managed to stay in the Premier League this season successfully and are hopefully going to build to a couple of years of being, you know, West London's best club. We can hope at least. Sport, of course, is one of those really important markers of local identity and building community. But there are more important things to life, arguably. He lied. Now, behind me, you can see the London Museum of Water and Steam. This was formerly the Kew Bridge Waterworks, and it was one of the biggest pumping stations in London, and in the Victorian London, at a time when sanitation and building the great city that London became was one of the key drivers of the local economy in Brentford. Now, not everything, of course, is industry, and Brentford has a long storied history, which we'll explore in my next um, little clip. Well, many visitors today wouldn't really understand or appreciate Brentford's long history, particularly those who are you know, visiting the, uh, the county court here, Brentford being one of the county courts of Middlesex. 
Now, of course, Brentford, historically, the place name means literally the ford over the River Brent. And the River Brent is a tributary that flows into the Thames here, about 10, 12 miles west of London. But Brentford, of course, actually has a really long history. And behind me, as I turn around, we have this curious, curiously shaped totem, which is sort of a late Victorian monument to Brentford's history. And it tells us that there was an ancient battle fought here between um, a Roman tribe and Julius Caesar. And then in the 17th century, there was also a really important civil war battle, the Battle of Brentford, where the Royalist army under Charles I was turned back from reaching London by parliamentarian forces. And Charles, in 1642, was never able to reach the city and, and take the city for himself again. Despite being under Heathrow's flight path and next to the M4, Brentford does have some really large areas of tranquility and peace that you can find quite easily. So behind me, you can see Cyan House, which is the London residence of the Dukes of Northumberland. There's been a, a residence on this site since the 16th century, but the site behind me you can see is one of London's finest houses, designed the interiors designed by Robert Adam, and the gardens, the 200 acre um, gardens landscaped by Lancelot Capability Brown. Now, the actual site stands somewhere close to Sion Abbey, which was founded by Henry V in 1415, and it was of the unusual Bridgetine order, where it was a mixed house of both men and women, monks and nuns, under the rule of an abbess. Now, although it survived to the Reformation, the, um, the community then were dispersed across Europe for various centuries, but then eventually came back to England in the 20th century, and until very recently, were based in Devon. The archives you can actually find in the special collections at the University of Exeter. So do check that out. Well, as you can imagine, doing all this walking makes one thirsty. Fortunately, Brentford were really well served for pubs. And I'm standing outside the Six Bells on the high street, named for the, uh, the Six Bells of St. Lawrence's Parish Church behind us. Also, you can see on this plaque here, a poem written in 1948 which shows the 50 pubs that were available for drinkers on Brentford High Street in around 1900. If only there were 50 pubs here still today. Now for my final stop, you find me outside my local pub, where else? Which is the Brewery Tap, here in Brentford Dock. Built in around 1870 and raised above the river level, this has been a pub here for about 150 years. Originally it was a tap room for the, um, tap house for the um, Beehive Brewery, but of course most recently it's become a Fuller's pub. Now, I've just, I've just given you the highlights of this little walking tour of Brentford. You can see more of the yellow that's behind me. Inevitably, I've missed out some other highlights. Sky TV, the Hoover building. But I really want to do, um, talk to you really about the vibrancy of local history in the area and also across the country. Um, our team here at Brentford Voice, as you can see, getting a lot of local interest, are really, really doing some great things for public local history. If you know of anybody else who works in this, in this way, or you'd like to reward or acknowledge their, their achievements and contribution to local history, please get in contact with us and nominate them for an Outstanding Individual Achievement Award. You can do this basically from July this year, and we'd love to hear from you. Hope you've enjoyed this tour. See you again soon. Thanks. If you've enjoyed this little walking tour, I think, yeah, I could do better than that. Why not send us your local history walk local history tour, send it to digitalteam at balh.org.uk. It doesn't have to be polished, as you can see from my effort. It doesn't have to be perfect. All we ask is that you record it on your phone or mobile device or another camera, and you, you take um, images in the landscape format. We really, really look forward to seeing them and to sharing them on our social media and on our website. Thanks. So that was a video by our new chair, Paul Driver, talking about Brentford, which is in Middlesex, not to be confused like I did earlier with Brentwood, which is in Essex. Um, so we are just waiting for Yanina to join us. Uh, she is on her way to Conway Hall, where we are in London today. Now, Yanina is our special guest speaker, and she is Dr. Yanina Ramirez, who will be talking about her new book, which is Femina a new history of the Middle Ages by the women written out of it. It's a groundbreaking reappraisal of medieval history, which reveals why women were struck out of our historical narrative, and she's restoring them to their rightful positions as the power players who helped shape the world we live in today. 
Now, many of you will have watched some of Yanina's wonderful works. She is an Oxford lecturer, but also a BBC broadcaster, researcher and author. Many of us will have watched the wonderful documentaries that she's presented and written, um, and she's actually created in a cumulative amount of over 30 hours of BBC history documentaries and series for both TV and radio. So she will be joining me when she does arrive. So make sure to put your questions in the Q&A section for Yanina in that section so that I can answer as many of them as possible with her before she goes on stage to present uh, this afternoon. She's also written five books for children and adults, so definitely have a look at those as well and make sure to check out her new book once it is published. Now, we are just going to show another video while we have our local history awards, which hopefully those of you who wanted to watch that have gone over to the live stream on YouTube. Now, our next video is from our outreach lead, which is Susan Moore. Now, she published, uh, she presented rather a wonderful local history hour earlier this year on the magic of the chancery. And this is a video to supplement that. And as you will see in the recording, she's supporting Mark's talk earlier, talking about manorial records as well as that magic of the chancery. So I hope you enjoy this video. And we're just going to put that up now. So bear with us. Hello, my name's Susan and I love local history and I've been doing some research into our village, the village of Horsington in Somerset. This is one of my favourite walks down a green lane that was once common lane leading to the common land. And I'm going to show you first of all what the la lane looks like and then we'll do a little bit of the history on it. It's a magical place. In the spring, it's full of wildflowers, cowslips, carpets of orchids, lots of shade, as you can see, that we're coming into. And we've still got a few of the orchids flowering now. If I show in to show you there, beautiful orchids. So why do I love this lane so much? Well, partly it's very beautiful, but also because of its history. And what I'm hoping to be able to tell you is a little bit about a Chancery case I've come across about the lane. The Chancery case was brought in 1665 and we find that Robert Gapper was hoping to be able to buy the manor, the advowson and the parsonage of Horsington from a William Gowan. The price was fixed, £630, and was all agreed in October 1664. A deposit was made and £300 was due by the following March the remaining 300 by the following September. All seemed well. Robert Gapper, however, found that although he had paid his deposit, nothing had proceeded beyond that stage and he was upset and brought the whole case to Chancery. He had the remaining money, he was willing to pay, but he hadn't been given the deeds. He also claimed that he'd been given permission to enter into the land, but no deeds to back it up. So did he own the manor, the advowson and the parsonage or not? He felt not and was pretty upset about this, as you can imagine. As in so many chancery cases, there is another side to this. And we find that actually what had happened is the agreement had been made, the money was right, the deposit had been paid. However, he had been appointed then to manage the animals that lived on or were pastured on the common land. And he'd done this incredibly badly. He'd upset all the tenants. He'd forbidden some of them from taking their animals onto the common land, which they'd been doing for hundreds of years, as was the manorial custom. And so William Gowan had decided not to sell to him. So we then find that the, the animals were being looked after properly. In the end, Robert Gapper backed out of the whole thing and life continued. The local rector had also um, claimed that he owned the manor, the advowson and the parsonage. What was interesting is that during the Civil War, he was a recusant Roman Catholic supporter and so had obviously been ousted from his position. This case is in 1664, so he's come back. So is he now trying to claim what he thought was probably rightfully his, certainly as far as the advowson and the parsonage were concerned? What about the manor? So, this is what I love about research. There is always more to do. And with this village, there are so many interesting things to find. The follow-up from the Chancery case will, of course, be the manorial records to find out exactly who did own the manor at this time and what happened to it and what happened to the tenants. Is there anything in the manorial records about this case? So, 
future to come, lots more research. And I'll just give you one more lovely picture of the orchids that I'm standing beside. Here we are with the orchids again, which just makes history so interesting to have natural life and beauty of the flowers brought into it. So my favourite walk, Green Lane, which is the common lane leading to the common land and a chancery case. What more could I want? And manorial records to look at as well. This is the joy of local history. Okay, so that was a wonderful video there from Susan Moore talking about the magic of the chancery. We're now going to head into another video, um, which is going to be by one of our trustees, Joe Saunders. Many of you will know Joe from social media. He is a wonderful local historian, um, and he is talking in this video about his one place study, which is Crosby Garrett in Cumbria. Now, Joe is a part-time PhD student looking at the 16th and the 17th century um, and has a wealth of information. He works with AGRA and various other organisations um, ha and has recently been doing some uh, digital courses um, with various local history groups. Now I can also see in the chats that we've got some lovely conversations about how wonderful the video from Susan was so I will definitely be feeding that back to her. So we're now going to be going to Joe's video and hopefully when we come back to that I'm going to be joined by our very special guest. We hope you enjoy this video. Hi there. I'm Joe um, and I'm here to tell you about my study of Crosby Garrett, uh, which is a, a village, um, a hamlet really, uh, and parish in the county of Cumbria in the northwest of England. Um, and it's in what formerly was the county of Westmoreland, um, which sort of people may know from Appleby, Appleby and Westmoreland, um, Kendal, two of the biggest towns, um, and the other big town or biggish town, Kirby Stephen, which is in the Upper Eden Valley. Um, and that's where Crosby Garrett is. Um, so Crosby is important to me um, because I've lived here for the last three years. Um, and for me, someone who works as uh, an academic historian as well as a, a freelance family historian, um, I end up doing a lot of research, you know, for other people or under certain time constraints or, or to certain sort of standards and expectations um, that are outside of my control and why I really enjoy this. and. Of course, it helps me make ends meet. Um, I really enjoy my study of Crosby Garrett as a local history um, that is purely for myself. Um, and while I've no doubt I'll end up, you know, giving talks and, and I do hope to publish things at some point, um, really the work that I do on Crosby is, is just for me. Um, so um, I started the study mostly by collecting things, so books, for example. Um, so you've got here um, the Cumbria historical gazetteer um, edited by Angus Winchester um, and that's got an entry for Crosby Garrett. Um, Cumbria of course uh, not yet properly covered by the uh, Victoria County histories so this is a good stopgap for anyone working on Cumbria that needs um, something, uh, an overview of, uh, of any particular place. Um, I also joined uh, the Cumberland uh, Westmoreland Antiquarian and Archaeological Society um, and they have a, a transactions and regular newsletters as well um, and a series of talks that's been really enjoyable um, I've also been collecting books so for example um, life on an Eden Valley farm so some testimonies from older people um, from the last century so that's also good context um, for what I'm doing um, and of course um, as well as general books on Cumbria and Westmoreland um, there is a uh, antiquarian style history um, this is a, a reprint, um, I'm not lucky enough to own an original yet. Um, it's Crosby Garrett, Westmoreland, a history of the manor of Crosby Garrett um, in Westmoreland with local customs and legends. And this is about 100 years old and by a guy called Josiah Walker Nicholson. So I've collected all this information, uh, mostly from secondary sources so far. We've got maps, for example, the map behind me, um, as well as things like postcards. So, for example, um, postcard there of Crosby Garrett. Lovely. So, on top of that, I've been working on population studies at the moment, looking at things like the heart tax and, and protestation returns, trying to calculate estimates of population from um, pre-census records like those, as well as looking at the census itself. Um, I've been involved in a uh, project to memorialize 
um, some railway workers and their families who died during construction of the Settle Carlisle Railway, which ran runs through Crosby Garrett. Um, used to be a station until the 1950s, um, it's now closed down, um, but the trains still run through. Uh, a lot of the, the navvies and their families lived in shanty uh, huts uh, nearby during the construction of the railway in the mid 19th century, uh, but many of them I've known from my own research to actually lived um, with families in the village as well. Um, so they were buried in an unmarked grave, those who died of disease and accidents and things like that. So I've been involved um, in uh, in the research behind um, a memorial that's now um, up um, for them. Um, in addition, um, I've been working with some locals to hopefully get together a sort of oral history, show and tell kind of session, um, which will be really good to see what people have got um, hiding in their, uh, their lofts and uh, in uh, unused drawers. Um, so yeah, I, I, I really love my, my study of, of Crosby Garrett um, mostly because I can do anything under my own steam, I can take it whatever direction I want um, and really it's just a fascinating um, study of a, an area of the country that I think is understudied, rural Westmoreland, Westmoreland in particular being historically one of the smallest counties in England, very underpopulated, um, doesn't have as much history written about it generally um, and there really aren't these kind of um, studies of local parishes, uh, not to the same level that they may be found elsewhere in England or in Britain. So um, a really important um, thing to do, I hope, um, and hopefully, like I say, while I'm doing things um, for my own pleasure, um, there might be some publications or talks and, and things that come out of this um, in the end. So um, that's my study of Crosby Garrett, and that's why it's important to me. Um, thanks very much for listening. Okay, so you have just missed out behind the scenes me having a bit of a meltdown about meeting my idol. <laughs> um, and as you can see, we have proof copies of the book here. And this is Dr. Yanina Ramirez, who is speaking to us this afternoon. And as we can see already in the chat, everyone's saying, hello, Yanina. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm physically here. <laughs> And you've had, the odds. An, you've had a bit of an adventure to get here. I have. You? I've done. I've crossed uh, the river twice to be with you guys today. Um, yeah, it's been a, a catalogue of disasters in quite an amusing way. But fortunately, I'm here, and uh, <laughs> and I got the most warmest welcome ever. So that made it all all the better. <laughs> and as uh, many of people will be seeing earlier, I wasn't shaking earlier. I am now. Oh, bless. <laughs> so it's very exciting. And your new book sounds incredible, and we're going to be hearing a bit more about that later on. So again, if you do have any questions for you, Nina, please do pop them in the Q&A and we will be looking at the computer just here. So what made you want to write this book? Oh, well, I have been, um, actually, I had to write a letter to accompany this, weirdly, back to my old college, St Anne's in Oxford. So they found out I'd written this book and they said, oh, Nina, you know, we're so proud of you, you know, St Anne's wants to celebrate you. And they had this magazine called The Ship. And I said, can you just like give us an extract from the book and then write us a little letter to go with it? And I was writing this letter and I was getting all emotional because what I realised was that this book, the seeds for it were sown over 20 years ago when I was an undergrad. Yeah, um, I had this amazing lecturer, Professor Vincent Gillespie. He's the J.R.R. Tolkien professor at Oxford. I mean, what a title is that? Um, and he um, it was him that first put the flame of loving medieval literature into me when I was like 18. And I'd never even heard of Beowulf before I got to university. And suddenly I'm obsessed with old English poetry, the sound of it, the world it conjures up. And he had this thing, he said, Nina, I'm back, because there's a group of us, we called ourselves a medieval nerd group, but there was, uh, you could do English at Oxford, or you could do this thing called course two English. So a thousand people would do English, and then 10 real extreme <laughs> medievalists would do course two. And it was only a small group of us. And he said, I'm gonna put on a week, a lunchtime seminar where I'm gonna look at the mystics. Would you join me? And I was like, yeah, okay. And so I remember there was five of us around a table and he said, let's read Julian of Norwich's Revelations of Divine Love together. And I'd never heard of this book. And I remember opening it and being absolutely blown away by how beautiful it is as a book. And then he said, right, let's meet, read the book of Marjorie Kemp. And in contrast, reading Marjorie after, yeah, it's like, it's like watching the trickle of French films and then being, uh, putting on EastEnders, you know, <laughs> that was the sort of the contrast. And I loved Marjorie so much. Um, and so that was a long time ago. And, but what I realised was, I came out of those sessions thinking, why the hell don't people know about these women? Why don't they know they exist? I've never heard of them. 
And I thought, well, I've got to do something about that. So I suppose everything I've been doing since then has been a reaction to that initial feeling of why don't people know this? Mm -hmm. So all the documentaries I've made, you know, podcasts, radio, my lecturing, my writing, all of it has been scratching away at that surface, trying to say to people, no, the Vikings didn't wear horn helmets. No, you know, <laughs> there were women in the medieval period, bizarrely. But I'd never synthesized everything in one place. Mm -hmm. And I realized a few years ago, I'd been doing all these things organically, but I needed to, to put my approach together in a big book that really, I think, could make a difference to how we do history. And that's what this was. And I thought so long and hard about how I was going to do it because I don't didn't want it to be a series of biographies. You should know what happened to this woman and where she lived. I wanted it to be changing the way we think about our relationship with the past and with the people of the past and putting the individual women in. So there is Hildegard of Bingham, there is um, Marjorie, there are, you know, there are these individuals, but they're part of these complex societies and they're addressing big issues of the time. So they're the frame and then the period comes into view around it. So it's, I think it's different to anything I've done, well, it's certainly different to anything I've done before. I think it's different to anything I've read before. <laughs> I was sort of reading it back the other day going, I can't believe I wrote this, but it's, it's a big book, it's a brave book. Um, and, and I tried to go big, because I've, I've only got a short bit of life left, so, you know, who knows how long I've got. If I'm going to write a book, it has to be a big book. <laughs> and I should also say, I'm just going to hold it up to the camera here. It is a big book. Though. It's a big book. <laughs> and I think as well, you're absolutely right. We have so many of these stories and you have sometimes bit pieces of yeah. someone being mentioned elsewhere. And often we find that they're being mentioned as wife of. Or oh, exactly. Of. And that's such a shame because these women are so interesting in their own right. They're not just a wife of or a daughter of or a sister of. And that must have been really rewarding for you when you're researching yourself. Absolutely. I mean, actually, I've got my other book here, which I wrote simultaneously, oh. um, <laughs> uh, which, um, again, you know, I have colleagues that go, what the hell? Nina, just do one thing. I'm like, I can't do one thing. I have to do lots of different things. So this is the book I wrote, Goddess. Um, which is absolutely stunning. And it's 50 goddesses, spirits, saints, and other female figures who shake the leaf. And it's aimed at a younger reader. Mm -hmm. But it, look how beautiful it is. I mean, you can see, look at the cover. It's shiny. And then the pictures are just... Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. I work with this incredible illustrator, Sarah Walsh. Um, and this was incredibly hard to write. I didn't realise how hard it would be. Mm -hmm. But the difference between this and that is... This is like so many of these books that are trying to get women's stories out there that are hugely valuable. It's like 50 women you should know, her story, you know, read a, a, a chapter about this particular woman. And I didn't want this to be that. I didn't want it to be a potted life of a woman from the past because I've read lots of those and there are brilliant versions of those books out there, but they never really position the individual within, the, within society. They just seem like, you know, an anomaly that, yeah. that just appeared and then disappeared. Whereas what I tried to do with this is it's quite chronological, it's quite careful, and you can see the evolution of ideas coming through across time and how the women and the men are playing a part in that narrative. Um, so it's as much about you know the people around these, these women as it is about the women themselves. And that's just going to be so incredible for people to read. I haven't read it just yet because I've actually got it. <laughs> I just gave it to her. <laughs> <laughs> Too much joy and adulation. <laughs> um, and so we've got A. Raymond in our chat just saying, yeah. pre-19th century, were women denied the opportunity to read and understand Latin and hence be executed for new officialdom? Well, this is, again, oh my goodness. I mean, this whole book is about busting lots of assumptions. So I wrote this book, got to the end of it, and I thought, I'm now seeing a period I've studied for decades in a completely different light. I, um, sorry, it's um, A. Ramon, thank you for your question. I thought this, I genuinely thought this, and I thought maybe that's the reason why women have always been the second sex. We are all about, you know, the last hundred years of uh, getting our rights and getting our vote, but that's not the truth. When I actually went back to the evidence, there is a period where women's rights are slowly eroded from the Reformation onwards. And that really accelerates as you go into the colonial era, into the 18th, 19th century, where laws are drawn up to segregate women, where they really are deliberately made the second sex. But that is just not the case in the, the period I studied before that. So no, I mean, so many of the women in here are highly, highly educated and an absolute rival, if not betters, of their male counterparts at the time. Mm -hmm. So I do Hildegard, I mean Hildegard of Bingham, have you heard of Hildegard? Yes, yes. Well, <laughs> she, to me, is, is Leonardo da Vinci, hundreds of years before Leonardo da Vinci, 
and better than Leonardo da Vinci. She is one of the most singular minds that's ever lived. And she was a polymath. She was a, a theologian, a philosopher. She was a scientist. She's the mother that seen as the originator of natural sciences in Germany. She was a musician. She created her own language. She did art. She did drama. She did, you know, I mean, I can't think of a single human being alive now that does what Hildegard did. And that was nearly a thousand years ago. And she was so highly educated in Latin. You are right to the extent that women were excluded from universities. To, um, but what would emerge are really vibrant convents, places where women would go to be together, to become highly educated, highly cultured and create the art, the, the thoughts of their time. And I think this is an important distinction because if I ask you, Megan, to think of the word nun, yes. you'll have an opinion, and you guys at home, you'll have an opinion of what the word nun means. Mm. To us nowadays, it's probably someone in their 80s, yes. <laughs> but, you know, in a herb garden, praying all day, maybe a ginger cat floating around I imagine my aunt is a nun, and she's oh, exactly that. Oh. <laughs> and it's that choice of seclusion from the world, mm. going somewhere away from everything, giving up sex, giving up the opportunity for children, all the, the, the devotion that that takes. To be a nun pre-1400 was the opposite. It would be like going to Oxbridge. You would be choosing to leave behind a life of child rearing where you could die, forced marriage um, with somebody that would benefit the family or servitude. And instead, what you would be doing by entering a convent is you'd be in the hub of education. You'd have manuscripts around you. You'd have time on your hands to think, to write, to create. I mean, art is made in the convents and science is taking place in the convents. Medicine is evolving in these places. So it is the opposite of what of our modern assumption. But again, you know, I've been studying this stuff for decades and it was only putting this book together where I suddenly, that, that, I woke up to that fact. I just woke up to it that it was a choice to embrace um, a different alternative way of life, but a way of life that was actually quite empowering and, and then again, as I say, after the Reformation, that's removed. The rights of women to be in those sorts of environments slowly arose. So lots of things changed in those few hundred years. And it leads us to where we are today, which is a time where we still have just a veneer of equality in terms of the, the genders, but also other people who are excluded from society. You know, all the people that we see around us in our eclectic, complex, cosmopolitan world, they were all there in the past. Yeah. And they were thinking like us that we, you know, we treat the people of the past as if they're, you know, the idiots that just sort of bumbled through their life like Monty Python and the peasants <laughs> in the in the mud, you know. But it, that's so not true. They were able to to challenge things in the way we do today. And some of the women in this book, you know, they are at the cutting edge of politics, of war, of um, you know, that they're involved in everything. And looking for them brings the whole in, whole of that world into sharp relief for me. That sounds amazing and it, exactly and it's suddenly that discovery of it's not hidden it is hidden history in a way but they didn't exist it's not like they just appeared in the 19th century totally. and as we can see here talking about you know so the rock started in the 16th century and just in europe and we have julia todd mentioning uh christine to Oh, Hassan and amazing like Christine. that. Oh. <laughs> and so I take it she maybe appears. She's not in the book. Oh. No, it was quite a deliberate choice. Um, I have chosen a handful of people who are better known, people like Hildegard, people like Jadwiga, people like Athelflaed. And but I when it came to France, I wanted to do the French approach differently. So I went in through the Cathars, through the spies and the outlaws oh. that were the Cathars um, in southern France. And, and that was really interesting. And again, that was unknown stories. And it's, it's women who were just mentioned by a name or a, a phrase, but they existed. And once you put them back into the world they were part of, they're there and they're powerful and they're, you know, they're fighting against the system. They're trying to change things. And, and so again, you know, um, I think that was unexpected, but Christine is amazing. And, and I think better known, you know, if you want to know about Christine de Pizan, you can go out and you can find out about Christine de Pizan. Whereas quite a lot in here, you, you simply can't. I've put them together in this way. Um, some of them for the first time that they're appearing in print, you know, so yeah. <laughs> That's such an incredible privilege to be part of. <laughs> it is, and it's slightly overwhelming as well, Megan, because like, I really believe in this book. And, and it was only when I was recording the audio book I've never done an audiobook of my works. And I was in the studio for three days with this wonderful guy called Rich. And he was on one side of the screen and I was on the other with my, my script up. And I'm reading it out. and 
in the process of reading it out, I'm putting my voice back into the words um, and nuancing it and, and lifting it and adding all the accents. And I'm reading it to myself going, good point, Nina. Wow. <laughs> and then Rich, who was supposed to stay completely silent through the records, he kept interrupting going, no way. You're not, you're joking. I never knew that. That's amazing. And so by the end of the three days, the two of us were like, yeah, it's a good book. <laughs> you, know? you know, it's a good book when you're hyping yourself <laughs> yeah. up because you're your own worst critic, aren't you? Exactly. When you're hyping. And, and he was my hype man. He was sort of in the booth going, this is brilliant. So um, all in all, I think, yeah, I have, I have confidence in it. I know it's, uh, you know, I have said all the way through, this is the start of the conversation. This is not a finished piece. I am not an empirical historian. I don't believe I know best at all. I don't have all the facts and all the information. What I want this to do is free up our discipline. So we're not constantly tugging at our forelocks at the guy, you know, the person who thinks they have all the answers. This is the start for all of us, local historians, genealogists, um, people to go out and write their stories into this narrative. Look at it differently, add it. And I say it throughout the book again and again, go to your local church, go down to your archives, trace your DNA, see what stories come up and add those stories because they're the ones that have always been missing in the bigger narrative of history. We know about the warlords, we know about the kings and the queens, but there were so many other more fascinating people. <laughs> Absolutely. And I know our audience will know exactly how that feels. And I can see Rhiannon Lloyd's there saying, in my genealogy work, I do tend to find that there is a divide between higher class and lower class women. How often are they mentioned in the records yeah. and how are they seen by society? Um, yeah, uh, that's an excellent, excellent question, Rhiannon. And actually, Rhiannon, you're in my goddess book. There's the goddess Rhiannon appears in there. Um, so I, I completely agree. And one of the real problems I had when I was structuring this book was getting a balance because I can write you 2000 words about King Yadviga because she was a ruler. Um, and as a result, there's information about her. But can I give you 2000 words on one of the Cathar um, outlaws? No, because there simply isn't the evidence surviving. But that's why I took this approach of putting the individual almost in the background and building up the story and the context around them. Um, in that way, you get a better sense of a society where lower and upper classes are both playing roles. Um, and as the book progresses, as, as I move on chronologically and I start to get to the 13th century, 14th century, then yes, the last two chapter of this book is absolutely pulling the gaze away from the privileged and the higher echelons and shifting it firmly onto the lower classes, the people from impoverished backgrounds. You know, I'm, I'm dealing with issues of slavery. I'm dealing with issues of prostitution, of, of you know, London as a, as a, a city that's just bursting with, um, with complexity. Um, and so, yeah, but it's a really good point. And I think I am very honest about it throughout the book. I say, sorry, I am now going to talk to you about a queen because this queen is really interesting. And by looking at her, we can see a bit more about the time in which she lived. But I know it's another high class, top notch, high echelon person. Um, and then I, I try and balance that out in other examples. Definitely, and that kind of links to um, Rhiannon's second question of how you, have you found there's still that sort of divide in the work that you've done? And mm. I think you've just said that there, and it's like you say, when we think about women historically, we often think about Queen Elizabeth and mm. various people yeah, like yeah. that, those, you know, we think of the Paxton letters and yeah. there's wonderful documentaries on that, which are interesting, but don't necessarily emphasize the full picture of women. Exactly. It's really, really hard because the evidence is, is weighed in the favor of those who had means. They've left behind more and they've left behind beautiful objects because they have the money to commission beautiful objects and beautiful houses because they have the money to afford beautiful houses. And so the, they sway our historical viewpoint. But what I'm doing in this book very deliberately, and this is something I think I was talking to you about earlier as well, is I am deliberately interdisciplinary. I can't box myself. In my academic life. I've taught in the departments of literature, language, archaeology, theology, history, art history, um, lexicography. You know, I've taught across all these different disciplines because I am not a single disciplinary academic. I call myself a historian because that's what I study. My material, my evidence is history, the past. But the evidence I use comes from a range of disciplines. Um, and so I said that the, in the beginning of this book, the really big changes that are going to change how we move forward in our relationship with the past are technologically, technological advances, things like digitization that allow us access to archives, things like DNA te testing, 
um, things that are going on in labs, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, there's a whole chapter in there about the Berkel warrior woman um, in Sweden and how the DNA analysis allowed us to see her for the first time ever for who she was. And now all these other women are coming out of the, the background because they were ignored, they were lost. Um, so technology is our friend. Technology is changing the discipline. And archaeology and social history, those two disciplines that have been there for a long time now, but they have always looked for the many, not the few. It's history that looks for the few, not the many. So I think bringing the, the, the thing, these things together creates a way of doing history that, that we need to do more of going forward. Absolutely, and I couldn't agree more. So as a more modern historian, looking at the archaeological finds that we find for the 20th century and things like that, mm. I then listen to you know someone like Alice Roberts and her books and things like that and think, wow, this you know even looking at that century, you can't box yourself in because you need to think about what happened before and what happened after. Absolutely. You can't just think, I'm going to go this really niche, narrow bit and not look beyond it. And there's a difference between empirical research and interdisciplinary, isn't there? Totally. <laughs> totally. Oh, you are 100% on board here. This is exactly it. And Alice is my dearest friend and we do <laughs> knock these ideas around between us. And she's known about this when it was a tiny little spark of an idea. So, you know, we talk about these things and I do work a lot with archaeological evidence. And But she would term herself an archaeologist, a scientifically approach um, to archaeology. I would term myself um, someone who works in the humanities and someone who works as a historian. But the bridge is not that distant and our work coalesces because I have always said as a medievalist, I can't understand my period without looking backwards and looking forwards. What a lot of historians tend to do is they go from their point in the future and look backwards to the point they're trying to get to. But they don't tend to think forward. I mean, we don't know what's going to come in 100 years and people will look at us as an influence on what came 100 years later so i think we've been doing history the wrong way around you know yeah. we need to be looking at it much more as this journey this movement and that's why you know, much as i i didn't necessarily want the book to be chronological it organically became chronological because i think you see an evolution from the very early uh, individuals i mentioned right up to the later ones and you know for me that was important that people could, could follow the sort of the, the developments as they were going along um so yeah i think i think these things are changing and i think that when i started making tv which is 12 years ago now which is unbelievable to think um i was nothing in the discipline looked like it did now it has transformed in a decade but there still needed to be something like this there still needed to be a book that just said you know, this is how this is how I've done it over these years, and this is how you know we can continue doing it and, and you know throw the ball out, catch it, take it on, do your do your versions of it. So I'm really proud of it. <laughs> I, I would be so proud of it, and I know when I'm studying research and those hidden histories, and I know our local historians at home will feel the same. You sometimes end up falling in love with a story. Is oh. there any in this book that really stood oh. out for you? It must be really hard. It's so like picking a favourite child. Uh, it, it is absolutely <laughs> like picking a favourite child. And this is why I'm so happy to be here today. I feel like I'm with my people, <laughs> local oh, historians. You so are fine. you are the ones that have been doing it. Um, uh, I, <laughs> you're the ones who've been doing it on the ground for so long. You've been doing real social history. You've been doing real explorations to find people from the past in a way that um, a lot of acad academic historians ignore. So I think that this is this is where the real spark comes alive when it comes to have people looking around them in their environment, in their local environment. So, um, but yeah, in terms of um, thinking about uh, what you guys all do, it is storytelling, but it's often hard. I had to stop myself because I'm a natural. I love telling stories, and that's why I write for children <laughs> too. I love telling children stories. I had to stop myself being too much of a storyteller because I didn't want it to become all about the individuals and and like i said i didn't want it to be a, a tied together set of bio of, you know little biographies of these women but that said i adore hilda gunning and she comes right in the center of the book and for me she's just oh she's just awesome and everything she did and there's a particular story that um she told which was about um she was i'll, I'll say this is our last story and then i'll, I'll stop but <laughs> she was um a little girl before she went into a convent and she was walking with her nanny and she said to her nanny, nanny, do you see um, things that aren't there? And she was like, what, what, what? Uh, no, <laughs> it's a little bit like sixth sense. I see dead people, but she was saying, do you see things that aren't there? And she said, because, because I'm looking at that cow over there and she's pregnant and I can see the calf inside it. 
and it's a white calf and it's got ginger on one side it's got a patch on its back that's shaped like a heart and I can see it and the nanny's like okay this is really weird goes home tells Hildegard's mum what's happened Hildegard's mum goes to the farmer and says when this calf's born let me see it second the calf's born she runs over to see it it is exactly as Hildegard described it and at that point Hildegard's mum is like right you're different to everyone else and that's when they sent her to become a nun and for me, that is a little tiny nugget of, of a much bigger story. But I like that. It's a story, I mean, I'm sure it's fabricated. It was written up in her life when she was 80, you know. And so I'm sure somebody creative was thinking, oh, let's make up something about Hildegard when she was a child. But the story itself, for me, sets up what it is that's so extraordinary about her and the time in which she lived. And I think that's the important part of these little nuggets of histories that bring it all together and suck you in and they yeah. don't make you want to leave the story behind. Exactly. <laughs> and then you just keep nibbling away at it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, I'm very conscious that you're going to have to go on stage very soon. Yes. Um, and already you've come in, you've been sat down, had a, barely had a time to have a drink. So we're going to give you some time to relax just before and take in the stage. But thank you so much to our online audience for your questions there. And we will be seeing Nina on stage very soon. We are just going to show you a video while we let her get set up uh, of Adrian Webb talking, to, talking about Taunton Castle. So we will see you in a few minutes. And thank you again, Nina, for being here today, in thank spite you. of all of the odds. <laughs> I'm here and I'm delighted to be here. Thanks, Megan. Thank you. Hello, my name's Dr. Adrian Webb, and I'm here outside of Taunton Castle to talk to you about one of the research projects that I've been involved with for quite a long time. So it all started in 1988 when I was very fortunate and a good friend of mine took me into the building behind me. In fact, the room there uh, above the gate you can see and showed me where the bishops of Winchester they used to store their records relating to the ancient and very vast manor of Taunton Dean. And I became very interested in not only the records, but of course, the people who were involved with creating them and looking after them as well. Were these local people? I, obviously at the time I didn't know that. Um, and of course, who were they? Were they all lawyers? Or were they simply clerks? Uh, I didn't know at the time, but after many years of research, of course, that picture is becoming a lot clearer. And perhaps one of the most shortest lived uh, occupants of any of those roles, administrative roles that supported the Bishop of Winchester in managing his estate, uh, was held by a man called. Thomas Spigernal. Now obviously Spigernal is not really a Somerset name so where did he come from? He was a bit of a mystery but thanks to some recent discoveries he has turned out to be quite a fascinating man and his life uh, I've now been able to piece that together. So he was actually born in Berkshire but Thanks to uh, the early death of his father, who was put under the care of uh, just a relative, who was then able to put him uh, under the custody of Dr. Thomas Palmer. Uh, and Palmer was uh, basically MP for Taunton, uh, just before the Civil War. And it's around about that sort of time that Spigernal would have come to Taunton and he was seen in Taunton actually looking after Dr. Palmer's horses. Then after a short time uh, being educated under Palmer's uh, careful eye, he actually came back to Taunton in the uh, early 1650s and became a surveyor of the lands that were sequestered from the Stowell family. And this really put his career on the map. It really did, he, it took off from then. He became quite wealthy. Uh, and he married into a, a very wealthy Catholic family from Wells. But unfortunately, that marriage didn't last very long. And then shortly after, he married a lady called Elizabeth Brown. Now, Elizabeth's family had been clerks of the castle of Taunton behind me. This is, and this is the local connection. 
They also lived in a lovely house at Wilton, which is about a couple of miles from the centre of Taunton. And subsequently, there was some uh, a fallings out. He didn't get his marriage portion. Uh, and so all this went to Chancery to be resolved. And the subsequent records, the depositions that were taken in Taunton, reveal a great deal about his life. And also one particular event that is very relevant to the building that I'm stood in front. And that happened when Elizabeth's brother offered Spigurnal part of the money that was due for him for his marriage settlement. Now we're not talking like a few pounds, we're talking hundreds of pounds, which in the 1660s uh, was a great deal of money. Unfortunately, although the arrangements were made and local men came to the castle to witness the event, and Elizabeth's brother, George, had the money in a bag of, and it says, you know, it was there on the table, and they waited until dusk, but Spigurnal didn't turn up. Spigurnal was very fly. He was basically a lawyer based in Clement's Inn, and he also obtained a very nice house at Long Sutton. And subsequently, uh, the money wasn't handed over and the dispute wasn't settled. And then Spigurnal died in Taunton shortly afterwards. And then for many years afterwards, his widow uh, was left in a perilous state. She remarried, but she tried on many occasions to get the money back through the Court of Chancery. And that's just one of the many, many stories that are associated with Taunton Castle behind me and the people who worked there and were associated with it. Hi, I'm Dr. Daniela Gonzalez and I sit on the Outreach Committee for the British Association for Local History. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the local history project that I'm currently working on. And this is based off of my doctoral research on medieval London. Um, I'm currently trying to turn this into a book proposal and a variety of articles uh, based around the different chapters that I wrote. Um, and I work on medieval London. I'm really interested in urban environments, in how medieval cities were run, um, the civic community within these cities and political discourse, particularly how people negotiated these political conflicts. Um, so I've looked at a variety of archival records that are housed at the National Archives, London Metropolitan Archives and Trinity College Cambridge. And the types of records that I've looked at include warrants of proclamation, petitions, customals and letter books. They're all really varied and there's lots of exciting information that we can find out in these records. Um, so, for example, we find out who the main political players were at the time and um, the main political ideologies that were really important within medieval cities and how medieval cities were governed uh, as well as key moments so for example thinking um, about the peasants revolt or thinking when different parliaments take place um, as a medievalist on late medieval London I chose to work on the um, on London in the reign of Richard II. This is because it's really exciting but troublesome time in London. There's loads of political um, infighting. People are also not very happy with the king. And there's some kind of really turbulent times um, to look into. And what a wonderful presentation there that was. That wasn't Adrian, that was in fact our former social media fellow, Daniela Gonzalez there talking about her research. Just to clarify, the talk is still happening. We are going to be going live there in just a few minutes. Um, yeah. We are just setting up stage side. Um, but for now, we're gonna be having a chat with a very special guest as well. Now, Marek, you are a second year history student at Canterbury yep. Christchurch, aren't you? That is correct. And you have been doing some work experience with us recently, um, haven't yes, you? Yes, I have, as part of my placement from Applied Humanities in practice. Okay, so what sort of things have you been doing for that? So um, obviously when my placement first began, I was set the task of creating a 10 minute documentary focused on elements of Roman Canterbury and plain sight actually. Cool. So what sort of things have you found about uh, Canterbury and Roman history there? So primarily I've learned that um, there's been a few locations like uh, St. Martin's Church, um, 
uh, danger on to mound, actually. And certain areas of the city wall around the city centre that include like old Roman building material and um, uh, Roman foundations. And whilst um, much of it has been wiped away, like the foundations are still in plain sight, actually. So, and it really does show you the depth that the Romans like basically provide the platforms for like civilizations to build upon. Actually. It must have been amazing. So are you, have you always been interested in uh, that kind of history or are you more interested in the filmmaking? Because I know you are doing a dual yeah. honours degree, aren't you? Yeah, dual honours degree. Well, I, um, I've always um, had a passion for history and uh, film's been a new like sort of interest as well. So I think like the way I approach this placement is sort of like combining my passion with history with my creativity with the film. That's been so great to sort of like use. That well. must have been amazing. So what sort of things have you been doing today? Because I know we haven't seen each other very much. So I've been in the yeah. green room and Marek has been out and about with Catherine showing uh, different uh, people and sharing different stories. So what sort of things have you been up to today? Um, I've mainly just been um, like going around um, the building, just uh, getting small snippets of like people either like paying attention to the presentations or getting nice aerial shots of the presentations from above on the balcony. And so that's been fun, but really good fun. And um, I really feel that um, it's going to be a fun highlight reel at the end of the day. Definitely. So just to clarify again, we are going to be uh, sharing these recordings very, very soon. Um, and so if you do want to catch up with anything, then please feel free to do so. Um, so we are also doing lots of different things and in just a few minutes we are going to be going live to the main hall uh, to hear Yanina talk about her new book that we just spoke about. But Marek, what in terms of next steps for your research, what sort of things are you going to be looking at? Well, like most of my research is all done and I've made that into a script actually. So I've recorded all my um, uh, narrative voiceovers as I like to call it. Um, so it's no David, David Attenborough, but it's a close second I like to think. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what I've been doing now is just like adding in the dialogue and sort of making sure that they match up with the images because um, a lot of the problems I've had recently is just like if the footage is too short then obviously that's going to mess up the dialogue. If the dialogue's like uh, too short then obviously it's not going to match up with the images actually. So it's a lot of like trial and error but that's uh, sort of like the beauty of film actually like there's a lot of like ways that you can go back and correct something so there's really no hardly any pressure on myself to get it right first time. Definitely um, and in terms of going into third year what are you looking forward most to looking at as you start to finish up your undergraduate degree? Well um well like a great like sort of joy for me is like sort of like combining my interests with history into film actually so what I'm planning on doing in the future is starting up my own YouTube channel where I'm going to like be making a series of like short videos around the historical buildings of Canterbury and um, sort of like build up a platform of what I can do creativity. So being part of the British Association for Local History has been a big part of that and it's actually given me a lot more enthusiasm for third year because I'm um, not going to lie I was very like feeling very nervous about it because it's my final year of university and I wasn't like I feel a bit unprepared still for for life after university, but this placement with British Association has really helped. Definitely, way. and in terms of uh, the placement, we should probably talk a little bit about that uh, while Yanina is setting up just the other side. So please yep. do bear with us. As we said previously, uh, there's been some difficulties with her getting into London here today. So do bear with us and we do apologize for the delay, um, but we are going to be talking a bit more about the placement so that those who are interested in future opportunities can do so. So it was through an actual module at university for yourself that yes. you got into the placement, wasn't it? It really, it was actually, but um, what's actually contributed to my excitement and thrill of the whole placement is how I've been able to sort of like do that whilst also being on a holiday with my family in South Africa. And that's actually brought with me a lot of like funny stories about it. Because I remember like when we were staying at my grandfather's house, there was a lot of power cuts basically. So I would have to get my phone out like at night and then sort of like just use my torch to sort of like read through all the books I had to make as well. And so in, in a way that sort of like pushed me to be more creative as well. And um, so I think like it really does show that circumstances did 
dictate how your final product is going to go out. Absolutely. Right. And we should also say, you know, based on Marek's experiences of being both a film uh, production student as well as a historian, it's been so helpful to have someone else to help create the content that all of us love to see on social media and things like that. Yeah. Um, and have you always had that interest in filmmaking and things like um, that? It's, um, it's a relatively new interest because I only started like properly looking into film at A level. But, I'd, but I always enjoyed when I was a child, like basically like telling like short stories about it and so I sort of like saw like film as an as the next step to that bringing my ideas of storytelling and bringing them to life on the screen actually and that's the proper thrill of it right yeah now. absolutely and in terms of some of the people that you've met today who's been your favorite I know we shouldn't have favorites <laughs> but has there been someone that stood out for you whether that was you know a local historian that you've admired for a while or anyone like that well, I have to say um like <laughs> If it was Yanina oh, too, then we were in a safe space. Well, well, Yanina is actually definitely one of them that's really caught my interest as well. Um, but my favourite person to work with has been uh, Catherine mainly as well, because um, it's through through like our sessions today, whether they were like short or very like long, um, they've actually been. It's really fun to sort of like talk to a fellow a nice fellow in film enthusiast. That's Absolutely, all. and I should say as well. So behind the scenes of creating Local History Day, we've been having a lot of conversations with Marek about uh, camera work and things like that. And I must admit, I'm very much a novice with anything filmmaky, um, which is yeah. why Catherine does such a wonderful job. And I remember being sat there as you two were talking and sort of thinking, gone way oh, over my head. Yeah. Um, but it's been so lovely. It is the absolute dream team to have the two of you there um, yeah. working together. And I cannot wait to see all of the wide shots and the wonderful things that you're doing. Um, and just as a reminder for everyone, if you are interested in getting involved in a similar way to how Marek and Catherine have been creating these videos, um, if you go to our website, www balh.org.uk you can learn about things such as the 10 minute talks which you can provide um, a short presentation about your local history research like Marek's talk on Roman Canterbury which you'll of be course. seeing very soon um, so check that out and make sure to keep, look and, uh, keep an eye out for Marek um, and then as well we've got podcasts and local history hour as well as our blog but I'm very excited to say we are now going to go live back to the hall thank you so much for bearing with us we're now going to hear from Dr Yanina Ramirez in our final talk of today which is going to be about the wonderful book that we saw earlier which is Femina which is her new book and this is an advanced copy so we're very excited at BLH to have this so we're gonna hopefully go live to the hall um, and have a chat with you, Nina. Right, hello everyone. Uh, we're back again now for our final session of the afternoon. Just a quick notice, first of all, from John, just to let you know that those of you who've used the, the card reader uh, to purchase books this afternoon, that on your bank statement, it won't say BALH, it will say Hobnob Press, which is John's own bread. But that, it's, that money's only resting in, in his account, and it is genuinely for us. So that's what you'll see on your account. Now, this next session is going to start with a, as I said earlier, a short video tribute to our Events and Development Officer, our retired Events and Development Officer, Jill Draper, who, as I say, served the association for about 15, 20 years and was probably the, the driving force um, behind its continued success. Um, several of us are now going to uh, regret doing little, on, on, actually Heather's nodding at me, but I will hand over now for the video and I will move out the way. At the end of 2021, Dr Jill Draper retired from her role as our Events and Development Officer. Here's a short appreciation from the BALH team, acknowledging Jill's many years of service to the organisation. Hello everyone, I'm Paul Draper, Acting Chair of the British Association for Local History. Now today marks the end of an era for the Association, as we celebrate although I think for many of us celebrates not quite the right word, the retirement of Dr. Jill Draper as our Events and Development Officer. Now, Jill has admirably filled this post for around 20 years now. And when I asked fellow trustees and committee members for their memories and views on Jill, everybody sent me their warm wishes and hopes that Jill will enjoy a happy retirement, getting involved in more of the things that she loves, particularly research on medieval and early modern Kent. 
Now, Jill, as many of you will know, has been dedicated and committed not just to local history, but to the British Association for Local History for two decades and more now. Many of you will have come across Jill when she was manning a bookstall or giving a talk at a local or family history event around the country. And that's testament to her brilliant organisational skills, which has often been seen to best effect at our flagship annual local history day. Jill, as many of you will also know, is a very warm person. She's willing to adapt. And nowhere was this more obvious was when she came up with our 10 minute talk programme, um, which was kind of one of the successes of lockdown. Jill has always been a kind of a quiet leadership figure and has formed a formidable partnership with Dr. Jane Howells, the editor of Local History News, in bringing the association and local history to as many audiences as possible. So on behalf of the trustees, Jill, uh, I wish you every um, best wishes with the retirement and we hope to see you many more times in future. Good luck, Jill. Thanks. Hi, Jill. I'm really sorry we won't be able to say goodbye in person to you at the BALH Local History Day. I'm sure you've been finding plenty to do since you've relinquished your role with BALH. And I thought you might like to know that a friend of mine, Mark Halewood, has been working on marking and signing documents in the West Country. So, of course, I alerted him to your chapter on the New Romney playbook. Look out for an article shortly. All the best. Bye. Jill, uh, although I've been a member of the BALH for very many years, decades, it's only in the last few years that I've been uh, involved in its organisation. And... Um, You've always seemed to be there. Um, you've always seemed to be running things. Um, and particularly, um, and uh, what concerns me most, you've always been there uh, selling our publications. Um, you'll be a very hard act to follow and we will uh, miss you uh, and all your uh, organisational skills uh, enormously. So uh, a very big thank you um, on behalf of all of us who are involved with uh, the publication side uh, of the uh, BALH. Hello Jill. Firstly, a huge thank you generally for all you've done for BLH over many years. I appreciate how indebted we are for your perseverance and continued promotion of BLH. From a personal perspective, I'd like to thank you for your support and kindness when I took over the role of Chair of the Outreach Committee. Without your experience and the knowledge that you were there, my position would have been so much more difficult. Finally, as BLH has moved into the digital age, I'm sure I won't be the only person to thank you for the inspiration that is the 10 minute talks. This was exactly what was needed as COVID struck the land and we were forced into a very speedy change from in-person events to our present very successful online presence. Thank you. And I hope you have a wonderful retirement with lots of time to do all that research that you actually want to do. Thank you. Hi, Jill. You're one of the first people to welcome me when I joined the BLH team and you've always been extremely supportive of our digital initiatives. Not least, of course, with uh, you pioneering our 10 minute talks, which were such a great success during the pandemic and continue to be so. Um, Pre-pandemic, you were certainly one of our uh, most public faces with BLH, tirelessly going out to all of those events, often accompanied by Stephen, your husband, uh, promoting both BLH and local history in general to many different people, and of course, selling loads of our publications. So thank you. You're greatly missed and uh, wishing you all the best for the future. Hello, Jill. This is just a message from me in the depths of Wales to say thanks not only for everything you've done for BALH, but in particular, thanks for being so very kind and welcoming to me um, when I joined the team. And of course, very, very best wishes for everything you do in the future. Um, hope we can stay in touch. Bye. Hi Jill, uh, this is just to say thank you for all the support that you gave me, particularly when I first started with BLH, um, sort of helping me learn the landscape, who was who, uh, always there with a friendly comment, a um, bit of advice or support, uh, which I really appreciate when you join an organisation like this. Um, people like you who've been around for a long time and know the lie of the land and are willing and keen to have uh, younger people help out uh, that's always been 
um, that's so important so thank you very much hello Jill I'm very pleased to add a few words to your tribute you've been a dedicated knowledgeable and supportive colleague and the association and all of us have benefited greatly from your hard work and expertise I'd particularly like to thank you for your contribution to the Historic England report on assessing the value of community generated research all my very best wishes to you and Stephen. Hello Jill. You've been such a major part of the British Association for Local History that it's difficult to envisage the association without your central role. A lot has happened in the time you've been involved with BLH and your imprint is found in many successful aspects. The AGMs, the attendance at key local and national events, your many detailed reports to committees and the trustees, your interaction with members and non-members. You even played a key role in finding David Killingray as uh, our new chair. When you became ill, you found many ways to get around your restrictions and showed your real resilience and commitment. You did ask me uh, when you first became a bit incapacitated, whether I'd like you to give way to someone else. I, of course, said no, and the subsequent years have proved that this is absolutely right. Associations move on, and they do so, though, with the imprints of those who have contributed. You've certainly left a strong imprint. Good luck, and all the best for the future. Just waiting for the signal from online, everybody. Okay, everyone. So we're now going to move on to one of the highlights of the day, our special guest speaker. And it's Dr. Yanina Ramirez. And she's going to be talking about her upcoming book, Femina, A New History of the Middle Ages, through uh, the women written out of it. And I understand the first draft has just been delivered, which is excellent. So this groundbreaking reappraisal of medieval history reveals why women were struck, were struck, sorry, from our historical narrative. Not stuck, struck. <laughs> sorry. They might have been stuck as well. Um, restoring them to their rightful uh, positions as the power players who shape the world we live in today. Now, Dr. Ramirez is an Oxford lecturer, BBC broadcaster, as many of you will know, researcher and author. She's also, I guess, one of Britain's most recognisable historians. Uh, she's written and presented over 30 hours of BBC history documentaries and series on TV and radio, and written five books for children and authors. And without further ado, I am now going to hand over to Yanine. Thank you. Thanks, That was really kind. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> now, I think you all knew I was coming because I said uh, there is no way I'll be able to stand behind the lectern and talk because I, I do a lot of this when I talk. So I have a head mic. Can everyone hear me okay? Excellent, excellent. I want to pass on my congratulations to Jill. She was clearly very important to you all and, and good luck on, on her retirement. Um, I feel like I'm among friends when I come to speak to a group like you. Local historians, you have been doing what the whole discipline of history should have been doing all along. <laughs> but you have. You have, that, you have been looking for those people who've been ignored from the past. You have been really going through archives. You have been looking at storytelling, putting people back into the places they lived in, the streets they walked on, the landscapes that surrounded them. So I salute every one of you here and online. Well done, local historians. You are the core of history as a discipline. <laughs> I also have a little bit of a treat. Um, this book is not out until the 21st of July. 
Um, but I have a proof copy. And I checked with my publishers if it's OK to do with this. And she says it is. So I would like to give this book to someone here today. Um, it's signed. I'm going to do it as a quiz, though. <laughs> First person with their hand in the air gets to answer first. So my question is, what kingdom was Athelflaed the lady of? Oh, yes! Yes! <laughs> well deserved. Well deserved. <laughs> Excellently done. Brilliant. So uh, my baby book is out in the world. It is growing wings. Um, as Paul said there, you know, it is now in print, and I think that the actual physical copies turned up at my publishers today. So it will start going out to bookshops, but it's not released till the 21st of July. That doesn't mean you can't pre-order. Please pre-order, because it helps. Um, and I've come to talk to you today because I've been a busy bee during lockdown. I wrote Feminar, and I also wrote this beautiful book, Goddess, which, um, which is is available to buy in all good bookshops. And um, if, so when I, what I want to do is start off by telling you the thought processes I've been going through for the last few years in my research, and you know, why I'm so delighted to be speaking to you today, why I'm trying to do something different with Feminar that I don't think has been done properly really um, before. So I'm proud of it, but I'm also excited and nervous, of course, of doing this. But I want to start with a quote from... Hildegard of Bingham. She comes right at the center point of the book. She's like the central chapter. And, and she's just this absolutely awe-inspiring individual. Has anyone heard of her, Hildegard of Bingham? Yeah, good few hands going up. She was, uh, she, she was born in 1098, and she grew up in and around um, the Rhineland. Uh, she was in a monastery in Dissi-Bodenburg, which I had the immense pleasure of being all alone in on a stormy day at the top of a hill for an entire day, pouring over the ruins and feeling my way into her space. She died at the age of 81, which I think makes a difference because she managed to cram in the equivalent of four lifetimes into what she achieved. She wrote the, the most enormous amounts of books, philosophical, theological, but also medical, scientific. She's the founder of natural sciences in Germany. She was a musician. Her music to this day, it's unlike anything else that was written during that period. It's so beautiful. It's so distinctive, so different. She was an artist. She did these illustrations. She was just the most extraordinary polymath, and yet she's so little known about. I like to say she's Leonardo da Vinci, hundreds of years before Leonardo da Vinci, and better than Leonardo da Vinci. And yet, her story gets told very rarely. But I wanted to start with this quote, because for me, it comes right at the top of Feminar, and it sums up how I feel about writing this book. I am the fiery life of divine substance. I blaze above the beauty of the fields. I shine in the water. I burn in sun, moon, and stars. And this is um, an illustration from one of her works, Scivias. And as I say, she, she was, had a hand in these illustrations. And look at that. It is so unlike anything else, I think, that's, that's around from medieval manuscripts. It's, she's trying to capture in words, in sound, in art, what her visions looked like. And what we now think was that Hildegard was a migraine sufferer from a very young age. The things she describes, the scotoma, the, the light and dark, the jagged edges that she sees around things, they all ring true with sufferers of migraines. Um, and yet, she undergoes a bit of a change as she goes into, I think, the menopause. And her visions start to take on an even more intense nature. And that's when she starts to write. And she goes out in the world. She becomes a best-selling author. She goes on book tours. And this is a woman living a th nearly a 1,000 years ago. Now, I like to think, to anybody who opens up that book, you will have preconceived ideas about the role of women in the past. I certainly did, which is why I wrote the book. And what I discovered quite quickly was a lot, of our mo um, a lot of our assumptions today about women being the second sex, the real tireless work that men and women have been doing more, for more than 100 years to bring about votes for women, to bring about e some sense of equality in the workplace. These things seem like they're an entirely modern phenomenon, that, that it's just the work of the last 100 years or so that has made this happen. But what I realized in this book is it was a, an invented 
distinction that came about and was quite contrived from the Reformation onwards. The deliberate suppression of female rights took place over a, a number of centuries. It was accelerated during the 18th century and the age of colonialism, but it was part of um, a deliberate attempt to put women in, women in the place of the second sex. In the time of Hildegard, there is still gender discrimination, but she is surrounded by a cast of men and women who are changing the landscape. They're involved in politics. Hildegard was known as the Sybil of the Rhine because she had the ear of the emperor, the pope, and the major kings and queens of Europe. So this sort of gives us a slightly different view of the past. And this is a view that I'm encountering again and again in my research. Now that I'm looking for them, surprise, surprise, I'm finding these women. There was a best-selling um, book that came out last year about um, the period I study, the early medieval period. And in that, there's an apology near the beginning which says, I'm really sorry, I haven't put in any women from the early medieval period because they are simply unrecoverable. Well, 600 pages of femina will tell you that's not the case. They are not unrecoverable. They're just harder to look for, and you need different skills, and you need the skills that you local historians use to find them, but they are there. Um, and it's the same, in a way, with goddesses. I started off with lots of preconceptions when I began writing that book. I believed that... You know, I was going to write 50 accounts of fertility deities, of, of sort of the idea of women as birthers, women as mothers, women as nurturers. And I was thinking about some of these beautiful ancient sculptures, um, uh, Villendorf and, and Holofels. Um, and of course, you know, I, I started to look backwards in order to look forward. So I went way back. I went back to um, those pieces, which are over 10,000 years old, then to Chattel Hoyak, which is about 6,000 years ago. This is probably the world's oldest city. And it is an astonishing place, Chattel um, it, There are people living in city dwellings, right on top of each other, like we do today. Their houses were right up next to each other. And the way that people got around the city wasn't through a sequence of streets and doors. They went over the rooftops and dropped down into their houses via ladders. But that's how cheek by jowl people were living all this time ago. And what's been incredible, finds like this came up originally when the, the day, day began. And she is beautiful. She is this sort of... Uh, Jimmy Mallard, who discovered Chattel Hoyat, describes her as this divine goddess, this, this powerful woman. Um, she's got her arms subduing two panthers because she's got this sort of power over nature. So he proposed that there was probably some sort of worship of a goddess deity at Chattel Hoyak. But what was so extraordinary about this place, which is thousands and thousands of years old, is there was no centralised point of power in the city that we've discovered. No church... No palace, no administrative buildings. People were all living quite in a quite an egalitarian way. And that certainly seems to be the case between the sexes too. When archaeological excavation, um, where osteo and DNA analysis was done on the bones, they discovered male and female bones, many, many hundreds of them. And they looked at the wear and tear, things like repeated action, so many of you will know this, but if you do a repeated action over and over, it leaves an imprint on the skeleton. So longbowmen, for example, uh, during the Hundred Years' War, get these very overdeveloped scapula. Um, they looked at the works that these bodies were doing. They looked at their diets. They looked to see if there was any differentiation. If you look in a graveyard even today, and you find a, a male set of male bones and you find a set of female bones, you will see from looking across a broad amount differences between what each of them eat, what sort of um, activities each of them are doing, and this leaves an imprint on the skeleton. Remarkably, at Chattel Hoyak, there was no difference. The men and the women were living alongside each other, doing exactly the same jobs, eating exactly the same things, with no differentiation. Now, I can't help think <laughs> that in 6,000 years, we've sort of gone backwards rather than forwards. Um, and it is wonderful to look further back in the past to find these sorts of, of sources of inspiration. And that was certainly the, the case when I went to Knossos as well in Crete, a, uh, the Minoan civilization where actually the pendulum had swung the other way. It's the men who were the athletes, the entertainers, the ones that are doing the hard work, the decision makers, all the leaders of the religion, the leaders of the um, politics, the decision makers are women. So there's this variety that we see across time and across space. So I thought I want to apply that to the period I love, the medieval period. And that's what 
really was the spark. All this curiosity. I, I am a child at heart, I think. I love a detective story. I love fascinating stories from the past. And I love looking for new ways of digging up evidence, finding evidence, which is why I wrote this book. It moves across a number of centuries. We start in the 7th century, and we go right through to the 14th century. So that is a big time period. It also moves across space. I didn't want it just to be about the British Isles. I wanted to show that, you know, we have this concept, and you'll all know this, but we have a very clear idea that individuals, particularly in the medieval period, lived and died, were married, you know, had all their major events within sight of their local parish church, and basically they didn't really go anywhere. That's not the case. This was a cosmopolitan, engaged, interconnected world where trade is taking place along the Silk Road. You know, you've got Buddhas made of jade turning up in Sweden. You know, this is not a world that's tiny and closed. It is interconnected. And at the very end, I'm going to talk to you about the wonderful Marjorie Kemp. Does that name ring any bells to anyone in here? Does anyone know who Marjorie Kemp is? Some nice nods going. Good. So she's our end point, if you like. Um, Marjorie herself in the 14th century, travelled to all the locations I have chosen in this book. So we start off in the north of England, we move down into the south of England, then we go over to Sweden, then we go down to northern France, to Normandy, then we go across Poland and into... Ger we go across um, Europe and into Germany, then we go down to the south of France with the Cathars, over to Poland um, to look at Jadwiga, and then we end up back in, um, in East Anglia, and finally in London, this beating metropolis in the 14th century. So I deliberately wanted to take you on a journey through time and place. <laughs> but it's, um, it was, as a result, a very hard book to research. And you'll know the, the intricacies of researching, particularly if you're working with archives that are in different languages. So I have used a lot of different languages in, in my research here, but also called on the help of others in my research. So let's move to our first person that I want to talk to you about from the book. And she is chapter number one. And she is called the Loftus Princess. Now, I don't know if anyone knows anything about her. She I didn't know anything about her when I started this book. I'll tell you why. I, um, I, I'd written a previous book about the lives of saints from the medieval period. And in that, I'd done a lot on Hilda of Whitby, who I think is amazing. And I go to Whitby quite a lot. It's nothing to do with being a goth. I just like Whitby. Um, uh, <laughs> but I went up on this one occasion with my kids. And where my friend's house is, we have to go through the abbey ruins to get down the, the, the steps to her house. So we're passing through, and as we're coming back, the children are tired, we've had a long weekend, they're windswept, they're exhausted, they're trying to get back to the car. And one of the guides appears on the site as we're leaving the, the um, English Heritage Whitby Abbey site. And she says, Dr. Ramirez, you filmed here a few years ago, you were lovely, we talked a lot, really good to see you. So, oh, it's so good to see you too. So we caught up, and she went, um, what are you doing at the moment? And I said, well, I'm writing this book, Femina, I'm, I'm working on women from the past, and I was, you know, I was thinking about Hilda and how I tell a story that sort of relates to that. I said, well, you'll know about the Loftus Princess, of course. And I went, I probably should, shouldn't I? Um, yeah, of course I know about the Loftus Princess. She went, oh yes, you know, just discovered just down the road, about 15 miles down the road, um, at Street House in Loftus. Um, she's on display now in the local museum. We only, you know, she was only found a few years ago. You should definitely, you know, go and have a look. And I was thinking, this sounds really interesting. So I started digging, and what I discovered was this amazing um, local archaeologist. His name is Steve Sherlock, and I love that. He's like the Sherlock Holmes of archaeology, discovering things. Um, he had been working away at this site at Street House for decades. And over those decades, he found a landscape that had changed constantly over through different eras, but had continually been reused, reappropriated. Um, people made, found new use for it. So there's this wonderful thing that he found, which was a Neolithic um, wooden circle. Uh, they found the post holes for these huge uh, wooden um, megaliths that would have stood in a circle with passageways through them. And, you know, he, he didn't know what it was. The speculation, was it ceremonial? Was it used for ritual purposes? Why is it there? And in the end, because they couldn't be conclusive, they just called it the was it, as in, what is it? 
um, because nobody knows. So it's known as the Loftus Wasset, um, which I like. And so that, but this particular site, he could see it had been used in Neolithic times. It had been used right the way through the Iron Age, from big Iron Age forts and Iron Age circles. Then it was being used by the Romans. There's Roman remains all over it. And then, quite recently, in, um, I think it was 2002, he saw an aerial photo of this particular um, location. He wanted to look at what looked like the outline of Iron Age forts. Um, but in, cut into the Iron Age forts, can you see those circles that are sort of outlined? Cut into those were these sequence of graves and, um, and a couple of mounds, little burial mounds. So this brought the Loftus site right up to the early medieval period. Once he started to look what was inside here, he realized that these finds were 7th century. Um, this means that this site, again, has taken on a new role. Now it's being used as a burial ground. And look how regular it is. All of the graves laid out as this sort of rectangle around the edges. And again, with these sorts of routes through, processional areas where you could move through the site. So something was going on here. He knew it was important. And then, she didn't look quite like this when he found her. This is a reconstruction. Um, the, this particular individual emerges from the very central burial, grave number 42, underneath the major mound, right at the very heart of the Loftus site. This is a reconstruction of what she would have looked like. You can see not much of this would have remained, but her jewellery was found, and the bed that she was buried in was also found. Now, I have already put my order in for a bed burial. I cannot think of a better way to go to the afterlife than asleep in a cosy, comfy bed. So, um, and this was a thing that starts around the seventh century, and it's always women that are being buried in these beds. And if you think yourself back, in, back to the seventh century, the things that are going on around this time, it's a quite a macho world. It's a world where politics is about military might. There's conflict between kingdoms. You've got the Sutton Hoo ship burial, where, which is going on in East Anglia. You've got the Staffordshire horde going on in Mercia. This is expressions of, of the end of an era, an end of a sort of pre-Christian um, early medieval world. But for women, this, is, this becomes a way of distinguishing them in the grave, putting them in a bed, and burying them, of course, with jewellery. That changes, as you'll know. Christian burials that come in from the 8th century onwards, they tend to have nothing in the grave. You just shroud the body, lay them out east to west. But in these things that are called final phase burials, there's a mix. It's like they've got one foot in the past and one foot tentatively reaching towards a new Christian future. And this is why she fascinates me. And this is the story I wanted to tell. I didn't want to tell a story about a princess who lived in and around Loftus. I wanted to build up the world she lived in. I want to fill it with the people around her and the issues that were obsessing her and the things that were changing around her. And I have to do that with just bits of evidence like these. Now look at those. Aren't they beautiful? Um, so little known. Has anybody in the room seen any, or heard anything about the Loftus princess before? I, I love this. No, so likewise. <laughs> Um, and I think we should be telling her story. So she was found buried with these strung around her neck. You've got two cabuchon garnets set into gold. You've got a couple of beads, and then you've got this massive central pendant. And it is absolutely beautiful, but it is unique. Another one of its kind has never been found, because in the very heart is this garnet shell. Such an unusual symbol. What does it mean? Why was she buried wearing it? Well, let's dig a little bit deeper. I mentioned there the Staffordshire Horde. Many of you will remember the joy when it was discovered. I remember because I had my very recently born son in one arm and a phone in the other going, you what has been found? Um, so it was a major, major discovery. The single biggest hoard of early medieval metalwork ever found. Um, hundreds and hundreds of, of pieces, thousands of pieces in fact, all in this fragmentary state which suggests they've been prized off other objects, probably weapons. It's almost all, you know, um, hilts from swords, um, helmets, shields. They're military pieces. And what is entirely absent from the Staffordshire Horde is any female artefacts, anything associated with, with women. It's all about war. It's all about battle. So it's a wonderful find, but it's a find that gives us one view of that period. It doesn't take on board what the other 50% of the, and more of the population were doing. 
And, but what it does give us an insight into is the metalworking, the skill that was required to make these objects, these, these glimmers that stay in the earth and remind us that people were there before. And this is a, a panel from the Frank's casket in the British Museum, which many of you, I hope, will have seen. It's about the size of a shoebox, and it's made of walrus tusk ivory. And it depicts with runes around the edges that are really mysterious, riddling and um, runes, images that come from Jewish history, that come from Christian history, that come from Roman history. So you've got Romulus and Remus in the woods. And on the front, married up with one of the most unique depictions you'll ever see of the three magi visiting the baby Jesus and Mary. Alongside that is this scene. And it's a baffling scene in many ways because that the inscription doesn't really tell you what's going on in it. But you've got this bearded figure to the one side and then a woman approaching in a cape with another woman behind clasping a bag and then another woman who is strangling birds in the margin on the side. And there's a couple of clues as to what's going on in this scene because the character up against the frame, the male character, his leg, can you see it's bent like this? And that's an indication that we are dealing here with Welland the Smith. Welland Smithy, I mean, that's another sort of thing that where I live, there's quite a lot of Welland references. Um, the, the legend of Welland the Smith is part of Germanic mythology. He was the best worker of metal, um, so much so that he takes on this role as a, a, a god, a deity. But the story goes that this particular king, Nidund, didn't want to share his metalworking skills with anyone else. So he has him hamstrung. He has the, the, the strings at the back of the leg cut. And then he's imprisoned on an island, so he can never escape, and he has to work for the king, creating beautiful, beautiful jewellery. But Welland has a plan to escape. He lures the king's daughter. Oh, first, first, he lures the king's son over to the island, where he kills him, and he decapitates him. So can you see there's a body underneath Welland's legs, just lying on the floor? And he made a goblet out of the son's skull. Gory, gory, gory. And in this, he put the, I suppose, the um, early medieval version of Rohypnol, because then he invites the king's daughter over, gives her the goblet made of her brother's skull. She drinks this drugged liquid, and then he impregnates her and escapes on a flying machine made of bird feathers. I mean, it's, you know, if Hollywood tried to put this on today, I think they'd have some issues. Um, it's hard. It's hard hitting. But this is the world that, that's filling the landscape, the imaginations, the, the language of the people that live in what we call England today. For a few hundred years, they were speaking a language that was more like Germanic, whereas people in Wales, in Cornwall, in Ireland, they were speaking Celtic tongues. They were believing in this pantheon of gods like Thor, like Odin, like Freya, while over the border, they were still worshipping Christ. It was a different little world, England, from 400 up to 7800 AD. And this is the time we find the Loftus Princess emerging. So I thought, if I put my frame around her, what else will I find? What else will I discover? Of course, I discovered the beauty of, of these early medieval metal workers. This is the Sutton Hoo shoulder clasp. I've held it in my own hands. I think that's one of my biggest life achievements was to hold the Sutton Hoo shoulder clasp in my hand. I did drop it, but I dropped it onto a cushion because I was so nervous. It was all fine. <laughs> it went about that far down like that. Uh, but it's, in, it's the most beautiful, beautiful, beautiful object in the world. And um, the more you look at it and the more you turn it and the more time you spend with it and the more you understand the mechanism of it and how it's made, you just, it just beggars belief. I've had students who have taken to the British Museum to see the Sutton Hoo treasures and they've taken one look at this and I've tried to ask them, you know, how do you think they did it with no running water, no electricity, um, you know, very limited sort of um, resources, your eyesight, as soon as you got good enough to make the details would be going because of experience. And they said, well, it's obviously made by aliens. And I thought, well, there you go. So, new Channel 5 documentary, the Sutton Hoo treasures were made by aliens. Um, they're not made by aliens, but they are made by highly, highly, highly skilled craftspeople whose skills we have lost. When I went to Garrett um, Jewelers to ask them how they would go about today making a pair of Sutton Hoo shoulder clasps, they said I'd need £100,000 in materials. It would take two to three months to make one, and they could only do the back plates to these using lasers. And yet these were made over 1,300 years ago. Um, maybe it is aliens. Who can say? But the artistry displayed in something like the Sutton Hoo treasures, 
that's top end. We're talking high society. This is a problem I'm sure you will come up against in your research as well. It's often so hard. You're, all the best artifacts, all the best houses, all the best archives tend to belong to the ones who had all the money and all the rights and power. Getting to the people underneath them is often really hard. And that's what I've tried to do in the book. I've tried to kind of say, oh, does it all have to be about kings and queens and rulers? Well, in the case of Loftus, what I love is Sutton Hoo is clearly the burial ground of a king, somebody absolutely at the top of the tree. When we get to Loftus, we've got someone middling, but powerful within her community. But what's really interesting is how all the people around her seem to have responded to her death. So if I just take you back for one second, um, if you look at the arrangement of the site, have I got a laser on this? I think I have. I won't use it to cut gemstones. I'll uh, do it to illuminate here. Can you see that there's a, a cut here in the graves, yeah? And can you see there's another sort of pathway and a cut with a ridge that runs down here? So what you've basically got is early medieval crowd control. This is, you know, enter here, move around here and pass out down the hill there. This is the way that the site has been articulated so that people can move through it. And that suggests that whatever's going on here is the real heart of the site. And what you've got, you've got a building that, well, this is a reconstruction of it. You've got a, what's known as a Grubenhauser, quite a simple wooden structure here. You've got the two major burial mounds here, and then you've got something that looks like a, a sort of prototype church. It's a very simple wooden structure, quite small. But remember, these graves are appearing around the year 600. And St. Augustine is just just turning up in the Isle of Thanet in 597. So this is a critical moment where, I mean, it's so funny, I'm sure you'll have all read books or chapters in books that say things like, the coming of Christianity. And this is, this is I have this wonderful vision of sort of everybody across the country wakes up on the uh, you know, 1st of July, 597, and goes, it was Jesus, not Odin, all along. How did I not know? And that's it, completely. Christianity has come, and that is it. Um, of course, it's not like that. There is processes, and change is so slow. Uh, what's interesting with the, con with the conversion is they start with the top, they start with the kings and the queens, and they try to filter it down. Um, but even in the 9th and the 10th century, you've got religious people saying, why are you still telling stories about Ingeld and about this hero and that god? And this? Because it takes time for these sorts of changes to filter down. And what we're seeing with a site like Loftus is that change, that ideological change. How do you find ideological change in, the, in, in records? Well, this site seems to be suggesting it. And what's really fascinating, and I think, again, I think this is why I slightly fell in love with the people of Loftus. They loved history and archaeology in the same way that I do. They've chosen this site at Loftus because it has a history. Because as they're laying their graves, they're seeing Roman stones. They're seeing the remains of an Iron Age fort. They're seeing the remains of the Wasset. They know that this landscape has a history. They could have picked anywhere along the coast. They picked this particular site that has history to put their own moment into it, their burials. But then they're also putting artifacts into the ground that are historic. Now, look at this, this necklace. You know there were the two mounds. So Steve Charlotte calls them Mound 41 and Mound 42. 42 is the princess burial in the bed. This is the one next to it. And this woman was buried with a necklace um, that you can see these beautiful beads. And on either side are two coins. Now, at the time that the burial was taking place, England wasn't a monetary environment. They didn't use coinage. So these coins are not coins from the time that the woman has been buried, they are in fact Iron Age coins. So whoever this person is, they found these coins, dug them up, found them in a field, thought they were beautiful, and rehung them into a necklace some four or five hundred years, six hundred years later. And what's amazing is, if you look at the imagery on them, can you see a horse? It's very stylized, but there's an eye here, and then this is the shape of the horse with the legs running down there. And here is another horse. There's its, its head, and there's its back, and its tails. Two horses. And what I love about how they've been strung is it's been done quite deliberately, so it looks like the horse is, is running across the woman's chest when she would have been wearing this. So it's quite modern. It's quite fun to imagine this you know, on the person that was wearing it. But interestingly, 
what's on the other side of the coins, the, the side of the coins that would have been pressed up against the lady's chest, are two crosses. A cross here and a cross there. Did she know they were there? Why was she wearing them? Well, this is part of a number of finds that are turning up across England at this critical point around the year 600. And they, on the outside, look like they're part of the old tradition. So look at this one. This one's called the Eccles Buckle. On the outside, you've got two knotted serpents, um, and they're either side of a double-headed dragon. Now, this is all the imagery of Beowulf. This is the world of pre-Christian Germania. But on the inside is this silver plate in the shape of a fish. Now, Christians still use the fish to identify, um, so you can get bumper stickers with fish on. And it's because the word fish in Greek is ichthyos. And each of the letters of the word ichthyos form part of the sentence, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Saviour. And that's why for two millennia, the fish has been used as a shorthand reference to Christianity, ichthyos. So this person who's wearing this buckle... On the one hand, they're signalling to the people looking at them, I'm, I'm, I'm totally part of the old vanguard, I'm all here for Odin and Thor. But on the inside, they're hedging their bets. They've got this fish. And it's happening again and again. So we find things like this buckle, this brooch, this is the Kingston brooch. Um, up until that point, I don't know, you probably can't see, I'm, <laughs> for Valentine's Day, my husband's so romantic, he, he bought me a reproduction of the Faversham um, pendant, because that's what you get, a medievalist. I love it. Uh, but I don't know if you can see, it's three ravens with cabochon eyes, and they're in a circle, and, there's, and it's the number three. And three is the number of Odin. Um, ravens are the birds of Odin. This was found in a grave around the year 600, and it's very much off the earlier tradition. But when you look at this, the number three has, is out. What is in? A cross shape, the number four. Can you see there's multiple fours going on across this brooch? So suddenly the whole aesthetic of jewellery is starting to slowly, slowly change. And ideas are coming in. And who are they coming with? The women. Who has heard of Bertha of Kent? Some Hey, <laughs> that's, that's an extra high five. Not only are you working hard with the camera, you also know about Bertha of Kent. So one of these women who we do have a record of, again, a queen, unfortunately a high echelon member of society, but the wife of Athelbert of Kent, the king of Kent in, um, around the, from about the year 560 up to the time of Augustine, 597 and beyond. Now, Bertha was a Frankish princess who was married to this pagan Athelbert of Kent as a way of Christianizing the people of that kingdom. And when she got over to Kent, she came way before Augustine. She probably came in the, in the 560s. And she insisted that this building, St. Martin's in Canterbury, which is the oldest church still in use in the world, in Kent... Um, that that it has uh, Roman bricks in it, and she had it reused, reappropriated, and turned into her personal chapel. But she also ordered that her bishop come with her, Bishop Ludhard. And in a wonderful archaeological historical twist of fate, not only have we got a building that we know associated with Bertha, a named individual, Ludhard, the bishop, a text, because Bede, in his ecclesiastical history, writes lots about Bertha, and lots of references in letters and other surviving documents to this woman. There was then this remarkable discovery of the St. Martin's Hoard, of which this is a part, this medal. And this is known as the Ludhard Medalette. Now, you can see it's been strung as a, a pendant to be worn around the neck, but it was originally a coin. And as I mentioned... The English are not striking coins at this point. This is an imported coin, or at least the style of it is certainly imported. And what is fascinating is you have this figure who looks very Romanesque, you know, got the, the, the laurel and the toga. And around the edge uh, is the name Ludhard. Who is Ludhard? Bertha's bishop. But something is unusual about this because the letters are back to front. Now, what has happened, probably... I mean, I, when I first read about the Ludhard Medalette, all the books go, oh, stupid, ignorant, early medievalists, didn't have a clue, aren't they idiots? Well, I'm trying to explain is they're not idiots. They are working with new ideas, new concepts, new terminology. They don't have Latin literacy at this point. They're not using writing, and they're not using coins. And somebody says, make us a coin that looks like this. So they've taken the original, they've carved it into a stamp, and when they've gone to stamp it, it's come out back to front. 
but because they can't read, they can't determine whether it's back to front or not. So that's not stupidity. You know, illiteracy and stupidity are two very different things. But it is an indication that they're changing and they're having to embrace so much so fast. Don't you find this exciting? I find it exciting because I don't like necessarily doing the big wars that change history. But when it's this sort of ideological transformation, how do you find that in the historical record? Well, it seems there are these little breadcrumbs that lead us back. And of course, things are very different on the continent. So you've got um, here Empress Theodora, very famously depicted in the San Vitale um, mosaics. And what I find, again, a, a reminder of how international and engaged parts of the early medieval world were, is if you look at the necklace she's wearing there. Now, this is from Italy, but of course, Theodora is reigning all the way over in Constantinople, Istanbul. And yet, in Kent, at exactly the same time, what's popping up in a woman's grave? The exact same <laughs> necklace. So it's almost like this woman in Kent has got her latest copy of Hello Magazine Europe delivered and has thought, oh, that's a nice necklace. I'll get one of those made up. She's copying the fashion, and it's completely different to the fashion of what everyone else around her is wearing at the time. But what's coming in are these things, these cabochons, these big fat gems set in. Before that, as you saw, it's all about the um, uh, cloisonnate, the, the cut gems that are smoothed and set in cells. But suddenly the fashion turns, it twists, and it becomes about cabochons. And yet, we've got a foot in the past and a foot in the future. These other weird objects start popping up in graves from exactly the same time as Loftus. These are equal armed crosses that are made with the techniques that go back to the pagan past of, of Sutton Hoo, of Odin and Thor, but in the service of the Christian church, a cross. And goodness me, they're popping up in fields all over the place. There have been a couple of recent discoveries. Holderness Cross has just popped up, but it's such it's this meeting of worlds, the old tradi um, traditional techniques, but m using new symbols, new ideas. And, um, and I love it because my job as a historian, as I see it, is to put all the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together as best as I can, which means I end up being interdisciplinary. I do work with DNA analysis. I do work with um, osteoarchaeologists. And I also look at artworks, artifacts, and then I look at texts. But it's pulling them all together to me that matters. I wouldn't imagine trying to tell you what it's like to be alive as me in 2022 by just showing you the latest headlines of the Times newspaper. That's not my only source of evidence for what it's like to be alive now. I might play you some music, I might show you some art, I might show you some film, but that's how you put a person into the context of the past. And that's why I'm an interdisciplinary historian. Um, but what I like about this is Bede even knew about these jewels that were being made, I think, because he says, um, when he's talking about St. Cuthbert, and we may know St. Cuthbert, buried in Durham Cathedral, big, big player, for he, Cuthbert, not only provided an example to his brethren of the monastery, but also sought to lead the minds of the neighbouring people to the love of heavenly things. Many of them, indeed, disagree, um, disgraced the faith which they professed by unholy deeds, and some of them, in the time of mortality, neglecting the sacrament of their creed, had recourse to idolatrous remedies, as if by charms or amulets or any other mysteries of the magical arts, they were able to avert a stroke inflicted upon them by the Lord. <gasps> Big quote. So these people who are tentatively converting around this year, 600, 620, they might say, oh, yes, I'm totally on board. I believe in Jesus, and yeah, tell me about the Bible. And yet, when it's coming close to death, they're reverting to their old ways, and they're having amulets, charms um, put on their bodies when they're put in the grave. I mean, B wrote it as it was. And even the people at the top of this fledgling English church were doing this. So these are finds from Hilda's Abbey of Whitby, this is a comb that was discovered in, Hilda's, um, in the ruins of Hilda's Abbey, and it's inscribed with a runic love poem. This is the actual coffin that St. Cuthbert was buried in, the oldest surviving piece of wood in England in terms of medieval wood. And it's got angels and saints and Christ and the Virgin all over, carved in this sort of quite simple cartoon style around the sides. And yet, it's also got runic inscriptions carved in runes being associated the, the symbolic 
alphabet that was used in, in Germanic territories. So <laughs> it's a time of complete transition. And this is his pectoral cross. It wasn't discovered until recently, but it was wrapped in the bindings pressed up against his chest. So every time there was those stories that monks used to brush the hair of the corpse of, of Cuthbert because it kept growing after... Oh, I, I don't know which is weirder, the, the fact it's still growing or the fact that someone's opening it up to keep combing it. I don't both weird um, but the, the despite the fact that they're opening it looking at it for year after year after year nobody noticed this object it was only recently when um, the coffin was moved that they found tucked right inside was this cross which is everything we've seen with the others and then we come back um, sorry I will I will wind this up but if I flag us back just briefly to Loftus this is her pendant this is what she is wearing around her neck now, what is going on here? On the one hand, she has these two cabuchons that are clearly inspired by, by Theodora, by the fashions that are coming from the continent into Kent and up to the north. But what about this one in the middle? You have got cloisonnée cut jewels and then this massive raw cut garnet in the shape of a shell. Well, interestingly, these garnets around the edge are all reused. That means that somebody had an object, like a belt buckle, like a shoulder clasp, that she owned, and she's had the garnets taken out of it and reset in this way. Why is she doing that? The memory of a loved one? I was just doing um, a programme about the, royal about the um, crown jewels yesterday, and it was really interesting. The Queen's wedding ring is made of a solitaire and five uh, diamonds on each side, which Philip designed, and he used the tiara of his mother, Alice, to make the Queen's engagement ring. And I thought, God, that's like this. She has taken an object and had the jewels reused and recast in this unique way. But she's used that old traditional method. But then this central gem, what does it mean? A shell, what does it mean? Well, it's not a cross, it's not a fish, but it is a very old Christian symbol. Has anybody done or heard of the Santiago de Compostela? Yeah, oh, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. What do you see all the way along there? Shells, it's shells all the way. The symbol of St. James, but also the symbol of um, death and martyrdom and resurrection. So if you go around any church, you might see a saint or a figure, a religious figure, under a shell canopy. And that's a sign that they are eternal, immortal. And it comes from the Aphrodite, the story of Aphrodite. She was apparently washed up on a shell, born from nothing, um, apart from, well, it's rather gross, but it was the cut-off private parts of, of one of the gods. But she appears out of nothing from the sea and becomes this immortal deity. When Christianity was looking for symbols in its early days, thinking, oh, we'll use the fish because of this, oh, we'll use the cross because of that, they landed on the shell because they said, well, as Aphrodite came out and as, as an immortal deity, we can use it to describe the eternal life of the saints. And so this symbol changes meaning, but it becomes embedded with this association with Christianity and with immortality. What better thing to put around the neck of somebody who's touching their toes into the water of Christianity around the year 600? It looks backwards, it looks forwards, it's symbolic without being too overt, it's fashionable, and it's survived. And I took the time to bother to look at it and think about it, and as a result, I hope I put a slightly different window onto this time. Um, so they're not unrecoverable, they're there. They just survive in very small remains. Um, I'm going, I have <laughs> totally overrun. Do you want me to carry on right the way through to four, or do you want me to stop a little bit before, or... 10, 50 more minutes. You all right with that, everybody? I have an extra PowerPoint here that I'm going to have to go through. So I will show you what you, what you could have won uh, if I'd spoken a bit quicker. I was going to talk to you about Kinnathrith, the discovery of Kinnathrith's monastery just this year. Um, I was going to talk about Islamic dinars and how they rock up in, in England. I was going to talk about Mercia. There's the Staffordshire Horde again. Lichfield. I was going to talk about Athelflaed, which is, of course, Lady of the Mercians. But you'll have to read the book to find out all of this. But I will finish by talking to you about Marjorie, because I promised you at the beginning I would. And this takes you from the very beginning of my book, 600-700 AD, up to the 14th century and the lifetime of Marjorie Kemp. And we haven't geographically moved that far. We've gone from Loftus up the coast, down the coast to, to uh, East Anglia. And she grew up in King's Lynn, here. 
And the reason I, this is not the map that's in the book. I had a much nicer map <laughs> made for the book. But this one I like because it's got colorful lines on it, <laughs> which makes a bit of sense. But it shows the many pilgrimages that this woman, Marjorie Kemp, took. So you can see she gets over to Santiago. She goes all the way around France. She goes down into Rome, into Italy. She gets all the way to Jerusalem. And she does this walking, hitching rides on carts, traveling by donkey, but she's moving more than further distances than many of us might today. And yet we think of a medieval woman being, you know, must stay home and, and stir this pot of gruel for the next 10 years. Um, and we only know about Marjorie Kemp because of a chance survival. And this is why I love being a historian. Everything can be rewritten <laughs> overnight when you get that phone call like I did holding my son. Oh, the Staffordshire hoard's been found. Oh, my goodness. But these things, these discoveries, now we have social media and the internet. We're hearing about them week on week on week. So I start every chapter in the book with a discovery because that's what I think is so key about our discipline. It relies on new discoveries. And the discovery in this case was made in the 1930s. And <laughs> it's a funny story. Um, a stately home. Colonel William Erdswick Ignatius Butler Bowden. That's his house. He wants to play ping pong in his country mansion. Rummaging for a set of balls in a stuffed cupboard, he finds his progress impeded by dozens of dusty old books. I'm going to put the whole bloody lot on the bonfire tomorrow, and then we may be able to find ping pong balls and bats when we want them. Uh, he shouts to his guest. The latter happens to be a curator at the Victoria and Albert Museum. And he cautions him not to put the books on the fire, adding that there may be something of real interest there, which you may not at the moment realize. And there certainly was. In amongst those dusty books and ping pong balls and bats was the book of Marjorie Kemp. And it is the single most extraordinary read. I've now read it cover to cover about seven times. Every time I read it, I'm like, I cannot believe a, that this was ever written, B, that this woman ever existed, and C, that it survived. These three things should not <laughs> have happened. But this one book gives us a glimpse into a world like no other. Um, this is Kings Lynn, and you could still go to Kings Lynn and see the landscape that Marjorie walked through. And again, this was a point with my book. I wanted to start with a discovery, so the Burka warrior woman, the Loftus princess, Marjorie's book. And then I want to go take you to the place at the time. So 14th century Kings Lynn, you are in 14th century Kings Lynn, what do you see? And these buildings survive, so you know that Marjorie would have been inside them, she'd have walked under them. And there are objects there that are from the time, and this is down to what, you know, this local historians need to dig deeply into the things around us, around. I went to Kings Lynn, I spent the whole day digging through the churches, looking at the pew ends, photographing the things behind other things. And I found these ends. And on the one side, you have this woman. She's not a nun. She's not a queen. She's not a noblewoman. She has the dress and the wimple of a woman of means, but probably a tradeswoman. And on the other side, you have the hat and attire of a, a merchant, a tradesman. And they are back to back, the man and the woman pressed up alongside each other, and they date to Marjorie's lifetime. She would have looked at this. She might have seen herself in it, or seen someone she didn't like <laughs> in it. She was a very jealous woman. She didn't like her neighbors very much. And then there's things like this, the King John's Cup, which is still in the town hall in, in King's Lynn. Amazingly, it just hasn't moved for like 700 years. And I love it because it, take, it shows you the clothes that the women wore. And what's so interesting is women and men alternate around the outside and on the lid. But there are more women than men depicted all the way around. And when you got to the very bottom of the cup, inside, carved at the bottom, was this woman with a bird on her hand. And you sort of get the sense of the mixed community that would have enjoyed feasting with that cup, the people that Marjorie was surrounded by. But what is so brilliant about Marjorie is she's, she's quite controversial. So she has 14 children. She tries her hand at everything. First of all, she wants to brew beer. That fails. Then she wants to set up a mill uh, to grind flour, which is expensive. And she gets a literal millstone, which she thinks will make her very rich, very important within the community. That fails. 
Um, and she tries her hand at all these different entrepreneurial exercises. Her husband, bless him, stands by her the whole time, every time she gets a wild new idea. But when she hits her 30s, she realizes there's these international celebrities that are mystics, female mystics, who are making a killing on the continent, going around, doing talks, blessing people, and being living the life of absolute luxury. Bridget of Sweden, Mary of Orient, they are the celebrities of the time. And Marjorie thinks, I could try my hand at that. I quite fancy the limelight, I quite fancy the wealth and the comfort. So she becomes a professional mystic. And the things that identify Mar Marjorie's mysticism is unrelenting, loud crying all over the place, particularly in public places where lots of people get embarrassed. She will fall on the floor and weep and weep and weep and weep. And it's like, it's God, it's God is making me cry. So she is um, a loud character. And the way she comes through in the book is as this larger than life figure. This is a quote about, <laughs> she's told her husband that although they've had 14 children, um, she is a virgin and will not sleep with him again. <laughs> and she says, um, <laughs> they're, in, they're in this lovely, it's midsummer eve, and they're having a drink, and they're at a party. And he says to her, Marjorie, if there came a man with a sword who would slice off my head unless I should have sex with you, as I have done before, tell me the truth from your conscience, for you say you will not lie, whether you would allow my head to be sliced off or allow me to be intimate with you, like in the past. <laughs> she replies, truthfully, I'd rather see you be slain that we should turn to the impurity of sexual activity. I mean, and he sticks by her right the way through, stays with her, funds all her journeys, gets, you know, absolutely harangued by her over and over, and embarrassed by her behaviour too, but he stands by her. And what I think is important with these stories is, I didn't want to just find one lone female figure and tell you in a couple of hundred words why we should know about her. I wanted to build the world they live in. I wanted to put the men, the women, the people of different backgrounds, of classes, of disabilities, of, of all origins, back around these people, build the actual world they were in, not just tell you why you should know about them. And um, what I love about Marjorie is she, is she is a real Marmite figure. So this is another quote from the book. Please read it. I mean, honestly, best piece of work. Her confessor was displeased. because This is when she's on pilgrimage and she's having a really bad time and everybody hates her and nobody wants to travel with her. Um, and, and, and then, she, then she gets back and, um, and she's getting told off. Her confessor was displeased because she ate no meat and um, as so many were of the company, they were also most displeased because she wept so much and was always talking about the love and goodness of our Lord at table as well as at other places. So she's a bit of a you know, dinner bore. Um, therefore, shamefully, they rebuked her and downright chided her and said they would not endure her as her husband did when she was at home in England. And they do awful things to her on the road to Jerusalem. They slash her clothes so that she's walking around looking very vulnerable. Um, and she is so scared. And what is one of the wonderful things that comes out of the book of Marjorie Kemp? Travel in the medieval period. How she goes on these pilgrimages that are like a package holiday where they promise lovely place to stay, we'll get you from A to B safely. And then she comes up against all these sorts of tourists' dramas along the way. She loses people, people let her go. And it's this real insight into what it was to like to be alive, to be moving around at that time. And last thing, because I will stop... This is the closing aspect of Marjorie's book. And for me, it doesn't sum up just Marjorie, it sums up every one of us, men and women. We are complex. If you try and put a pin in any one of us at any one time and define us, say what it is that we're about, how do you do that? We're constantly changing ourselves, and we're complex, and we're difficult to pin down. And as historians, we will only ever get an insight, a glimmer, a flicker of what these people from the past were like. But I think we need to constantly remind ourselves that they were as we are now, as complex, as Marmite, as <laughs> some of us are today. And this is her closing view of her, her, she herself. Some people said it was a wicked spirit that vexed her. Some said it was a sickness. Some said she had drunk too much wine. Some cursed her. Some wished that she were thrown into the harbour. Some wished she were put out to sea in a bottomless boat. Others loved and esteemed her. And that's the thing that comes through in every one of these chapters. There is not one narrative. There is not, she's a good guy, she's a bad guy, people loved her, people hated her. These stories are complicated. And I said it in the book, and I'll say it to every one of you, because I know you can do it. I say it at the beginning and the end of the book, 
This is the start of a conversation where we hand on the baton to each other. If any of the stories or any of the information in the book sparks an interest, we have the power to pursue it. We can go to our archives. We can go and look in our local churches. We can go to our, um, our digital resources now, and we can be the detectives, the historians that are looking for the stories. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, have we got time for a few questions? Can everybody ah. hear me? Yeah, that's fine. Oh, I think we're just going to move to questions. As far as I know, the oldest church in Portugal, it's sort of like the Scholars Church Cathedral, which originally was the Greek, the Greek the ancient Greek temple. Yes. Yep, yep. No, you're absolutely right. It, the, the title that St. Martin's has is the oldest church in the English-speaking world. But the fabric of the church has been dated back uh, quite early in the Roman period. So uh, there's an argument that it's the oldest church in the English-speaking world in continuous use, as in it's been used as a church since, since Bertha in 560. But the fabric itself of the church goes back another three, four hundred years before that. So that's their, their claim for being the oldest. But of course, you're right, there's always going to be other claimants. I think I've been to five of the oldest pubs in England, <laughs> so I'm not sure which one's the oldest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. I have a 1936 Ordnance Survey map that has the date against St. Martin's Church of AD 187. Wow, thank you. <laughs> well, there you go. That is an excellent, excellent. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'd like to see the Ordnance Survey map. <laughs> uh, so I'll just, just thank you for that amazing talk. Brilliant, love it, iconic. Um, and you'll be pleased to know that you have lit a spark because I was really taken by the story of the Loftus Princess. Uh -huh. And I actually run a YouTube channel about Yorkshire history. So I really want to tell her story. And if I don't find everything about her in your book, I just wanted to know what are the best sources uh, that I can find out about her. With the caveat, though, that I don't currently have academic access. So unless I steal something, from, <laughs> you know, uh, what resources may I be able to borrow or find publicly available? Oh, God, you have warmed my heart. And I am so pleased you ended up with my book because, of course, you can start it. Oh, you saying that is why I get up in the morning. The idea that if I might have sown even the smallest little seed that you might go off and look into is absolutely heartwarming. Go to Loftus. Go to the local museum. It's small, but the whole display there has got all the finds. It's got um, her reconstructed like that. And quite a lot of information on the boards that will give you some context. And then, as you say, you haven't got access to the, art, to the um, academic archives. But there is a scholarly tome, and I think you can pick it up probably on Amazon. It might not be cheap, but it's the archaeological record, the BAR, the British Archaeological Report record, that Steve drew up off this excavation. And it's the street how street how Street House Loftus um, excavation report. Um, so that will have everything in it. It's a, it's a great, and then that will ping you off onto different articles as well. Um, but yeah, that's your starting point, my lovely. Yay! <laughs> okay, probably what, one more? One more. Thank oh, you. Oh. Thank you. I want the wisdom of the crowd, please, everybody <laughs> here. Um, would it be possible to look at the pectoral cross of St. Cuthbert again? Of course, of course. The wisdom of the crowd, what, what everybody thinks. Where are you, Cuthbert's Cross? There it yeah. is. I'm just very interested, just as a poll of everybody here, you've got the garnet, nice garnet work, very Anglo-Saxon. Look at the arms of the cross. Does anyone yep. else see Thor's hammer? Yep, 100%. Yeah? Does anyone we, agree? Well, you know why the Thor's hammer emerged? Yeah. Um, it was because, it was as a counterpoint, because... Originally, as I mentioned, uh, most of the pre-Christian religious symbol symbolism was like this, Triskels. And it was Triskels and birds, ravens, all connected with Odin. And Odin was the chief of the gods. But Thor starts to appear almost um, around the same time in kind of contradiction to Christianity. But there was a, th a requirement that a non-Christian could not trade with a Christian. And so they started designing Thor's hammers to give the oppression from afar that it was a cross. 
And then when they went up to start and trade with Christians, they would make the sign of the cross, the Prima Signata. And it's like, oh, he's fine, I can trade with him. He's not really a, a pagan from the north. So that is absolutely all of these things, you know, it's, it's the evolution of symbols tell us the evolution of thoughts, but they also put, tell us about trade and economics and politics. So yeah, it's fascinating stuff. And you're right, it does look like a Thor's hammer. <laughs> Thank you, I have to stop. I, I feel hovering. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you all so, so much. Thank you. Oh, well, thanks. No, no. <laughs> take, you take your correct round of applause and bow. Oh. Really, really... Thank you. <laughs> I'll feel off on this side. Oh. Uh, many thanks, Ginny, for such a rich, wonderful, and clearly, I, I knew Catherine would say she was inspired by that. <laughs> inspiring talk. Now, I think... We're going to move to close the AGM, oh, not, not the AGM, the Local History Day now. And I'm going to invite Caroline back up on stage again, Great. please. And I will disappear well, off. Thank you so much. I'll that, just go to the side. <laughs> so th uh, from me, as well, I, so I should now say the new chair, I guess. No, Many thanks to all of you for side. coming, both in the hall and online. And I hope you will join us at all of our future online and hopefully in-person events in the next year or so. Um, do we want the... Yeah, they're just going to turn the mic on. I, I, will right, I, I was afraid that Janina was going to go before I'd had a chance to thank her, but she, she promised she would stay. I thought that was really amazing. I mean, I think those medieval women have met their match in Janina. I think they, they've got... You know, I think you're really doing them justice. It was a fantastic talk. You took us back to... Mainly to Anglo-Saxon England. I know you meant to move further on, but somehow we got stuck in Anglo-Saxons, didn't we? But anyway... The, today, we've actually looked at women quite a lot because Mark Forrest talked to us about medieval women who acted as reeves and as, uh, as manorial officials. And then we heard about the women who in the 19th and 20th century were suffragettes who, who made uh, ammunition for the First World War, who rode on globes from London to you know, Canterbury to London. I'm not sure how useful that was, but never mind. And also, you know who set up home in 1933. I mean, we know that women are part of the story. It's just that, as Janina says, we have to look harder to find them. But she's done a really fantastic job. And of course, we all want to get your book. It's a pity we couldn't all have copies of that. Put our hand up. I, I like, I mean, Marjorie Kemp is, as you say, a Marmite character. Some people really don't. I like the story of how she went off on this trip you know, she went to dancing, and then she went to Arkham, and she finally comes back to Ipswich, and she meets her confessor, and he says, I told you to go no further than Ipswich. <laughs> and I love that story, you know, that she just got going and off she went. Anyway, I think, I think that Janina gave us a really fantastic finale to this day, which we've really enjoyed. It's been great to meet each other again in person, and I think that... Uh, you know, to have that wonderful talk and with so much enthusiasm and energy. I think, um, you know, you said that Marjorie Kemp uh, was, thought she was loved and esteemed, and we think you're loved and esteemed. Thank you very much. to the green room as we round off today. Thank you so much for bearing with us throughout today and we've really appreciated your comments in the chat. As you've all have been aware throughout the day, this is our first hybrid event and this is the first time that we've tried to do anything like this. So thank you for bearing with us with all of the technical glitches um, and slight delays in different timings. And yeah, just thank you for your wonderful comments. Uh, Conway Hall is now being left and I am being joined by our new chair driver. Hello, Paul. Hello, Megan. And you've been out on the floor today. How's it been? Uh, it's been, you know, what's the word? Bustling, shall we say. It's mm. been a good, good atmosphere, I think, actually. Lots of lots of people from around the country, including our brilliant award winners. Absolutely. It's great to meet them. And we should say as well, we've got Sophie Poor in the chat, who is one of our local ah, history brilliant. Hello, year. Sophie. Well done. Congratulations. <laughs> she was one of our under-18 uh, runners-up for the local history photographer of the year competition. She's come back from the birthday party. Uh, um, so hello Sophie and well done. Armed with cake, hopefully. Hopefully. Um, and again, congratulations to all our winners more generally. Um, 
without you, you know, local history awards wouldn't happen and we look forward to seeing our winners next year. Um, in answer to some of the questions, we will be recording, uh, saving the recordings on our website over the next week or so and you will have access to those slides through that recording. Um, so make sure to keep an eye out for those. Now Paul, you have been an acting chair for BALH for the last nine months or so. Yeah. How does it feel to be chair now? Uh, more responsibility, you know, the burden of responsibility is now a real, real for the next three years. So the good news is that obviously we know we've got two vice chairs, we've got the amazing digital team, lots of really good committee members and other trustees. So hopefully the, the progress I think we've made, or not progress, but the, the developments that have happened during lockdown and into this year will continue and will hopefully be, you know, bringing new exciting content and you know, local history to bigger and better audiences. Definitely, and hopefully we can see so many people saying that was amazing, so hopefully we can do something like this uh, next year. Um, and as you mentioned, we've got two vice chairs now. So we've got Jane Golding and um, Joe Saunders both being our vice chairs. Um, and I'm so excited to see the type oh, yes. of things that they bring. They're both very dynamic, aren't Indeed. they? That's, that's <laughs> why I asked, I asked them if they do it. So. Definitely. So what's been your favourite part of today? Favourite part of today? Well, obviously I know Mark Forrest for a long time. <laughs> So, and for me, I'm, as a medievalist, learning about, you know, post-medieval memorial records and also being an archivist, it's, you know, that means I now have a bit more guidance on where to look, which is not to say that any of the rest of the day wasn't, but for me, kind of, that's where I've probably personally taken most interest. Definitely. And I think everyone on the online audience saw my fangirl moment with uh, Elena. Oh, yes. I'm looking forward to seeing that later. <laughs> um, so apologies for that there, but I was very, very excited. Um, I've been watching uh, Elena's documentary mm. since I was a oh, child. We all, so we all have. <laughs> it's been incredible to meet some of our idols and to see some real powerhouses in that local history world mm. and also to see them online. Um, so what do you think is next in terms of BALH? Big uh, question, I know. <laughs> well, I mean, I'd like to think, we were just talking to quite a few people who represent local history societies and we were hearing some stories of, you know, quite localised woe, you know, because COVID has brought some societies to an end, it's, you know, we, we know that the age profile of lots of local history society, active local history historians in these societies is quite old. We need to see if we can try and bring more people together, perhaps advocate more for local history in across the country. And hopefully, you know, the 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 online skills webinars that we that we bring, we, we'll try and what's the word empower the next generation and the current generation of local historians, whether you're, you know, professional historian, whether you're just interested, whether you are learning it at school, you know, bring you the tools that you need to you know, bring local history in your community outside of that. Absolutely. And I think as well, we should really highlight the amazing thing, certainly since I joined the OLH at the start of the academic year. Um, so we've had, you know, um, the schools fellowship that we've done with the Historical Association, where we've had lots of different educational uh, uh, educators across the country coming in and learning for both primary and secondary curriculums how to get involved in local history. Um, we've got lots of exciting content coming up, uh, lots of local history hours, lots mm. of podcasts, blogs, all of these sorts of things. And I know that Chris and Katie have been in the chat mm. talking about that. Well, I'm looking forward to the podcast because I know you've got them all ready, so, or most of yes. them ready. So. They are all ready. They're just going to be coming out. Um, you know, as uh, time goes on, so do keep an eye out for those. Um, and I will give a plug to where you can find out a bit more there. Um, but in terms of today, obviously, Conway Hall has been absolutely thriving mm. with local historians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I imagine we're going to see lots of local history research coming out as a result of that. Hopefully. As I say, I think, I think there's been a lot of decent chat between colleagues across different parts of the country, but also, as I said, we've just heard from you, Nina, the power of kind of history to change people's lives for the better. Mm -hmm. And actually, when it's local history and it's local people, local communities, families, you know, migrant communities, whatever it might be. Hopefully, you know, we'll be hearing new stories as the years progress. Definitely, and I think that's a key point. And for those of you, if you haven't seen on Twitter, um, my lovely colleague Catherine, who we chatted to earlier, uh, actually shared a quote from Yanina at the start of her talk, mm. which in, just in case you missed, she was saying, so local historians, you've been doing the thing that all historians should have been doing, but for decades. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a really good point. You know, people forget how important local historians are in local history. So it's been so lovely to be a small part in that bigger community, isn't Absolutely, it? Absolutely, oh yeah. We're all small parts, but you can't get to a bigger hole without small parts. 
Definitely. And again, you know, this is just the start of some of the things that we're hoping to achieve at BALH with different types of content. And of course, um, I should also highlight, I forgot to mention at the start, Sophie is just 11 uh, mm -hmm. and she was a photography competition winner. Mm -hmm. So she photographs a way better than some of my camera work. So really well done there again, Sophie. Um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing the theme there for next year with uh, Local History Photographer of the Year. Um, which will be launched within the next month or so. Yes, exactly. Do do apply. Do send us your photographs of anywhere. It's any anywhere, anything, anything with a local history theme. We'd love to see them. Definitely, and the same with general content as well. So, mm. as I've said uh, throughout today. We have a blog that you can access. We have 10 minute talks with slightly shorter presentations, or if you want to do something slightly longer like Mark and Yanina have done today, um, we have local history hour and webinars as well. And we actually have one uh, from your other hat, which is working at the National Archives. We have Indeed. a National Archives event coming up, haven't we? We do. Are we talking about uh, the census again? Yes, yeah. Indeed. So my colleague, Jessamy Carlson, who is, I think, well, what about, she's a, a modern um, family history specialist, but she's going to be delivering the second of her webinars, repeat kind of, but a more updated version on the 1921 census, which is the big resource for local and family history that's emerged in what, certainly in England and Wales in the last year. That's going to be so exciting. I'm looking forward oh, to yes. that as well. Um, and then in terms of our vice chairs, I'm sure that they've got full projects coming up. Are there any that we can think of that you hope to share? Well, I'm hoping that, well, I'm hoping so. Joe Saunders is currently working with another group of our trustees towards planning and delivering a northern conference northern england hoping to stimulate and share the latest research relating to what we might call the north how we're drawing that up is not quite clear because obviously i think i'm a northerner anybody from yorkshire would think i'm a southerner yeah, I'm being exactly being a Midlander, we're both Midlanders. We are. So uh, for context, Paul grew up in Lincolnshire and I now live in Nottinghamshire. Um, but I grew up in Kent, so anything north of Watford was the north for me. So yeah, we're in those big territory, aren't we? Though? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Catherine, who's uh, just off camera here, is from Yorkshire mm -hmm. and she's just shaking her head at me and going, that's not the north at all. I was going to say, uh, Lincoln's <laughs> not the north either for us. Uh... No. Um, but yeah, it's been so incredible to see so much diversity here today in terms mm -hmm. of the talks. And a thank you again for all of your comments and questions in the chat. Um, there's been some really fascinating discussions mm. happening both in the yeah. hall and online as Obviously, well. I've, I've missed all those, so I'm looking forward to reading the transcript later. Yes, and again, these will be uh, saved on our website very, very soon with those live recordings and things like that. So just to kind of recap through the day, and I know that Paul, you've had a slightly different experience with doing both the AGM and the Local History mm -hmm. Awards. Um, so we've started off today with a welcome by Professor Caroline Barron, who is our president, uh, and she introduced her former PhD student, Dr. Mark Forrest, who was talking about post-medieval manorial records, which was Paul's favourite part of the day, if you missed that. We then moved into both uh, on uh, different platforms. We did both YouTube and uh, in here on Zoom, uh, talking about the AGM, so the annual general meeting where Paul was made chair officially and now has two vice chairs, what a relief. <laughs> and then we also had a chat with Mark where we learned a bit more about his research and how manorial records can kind of transverse mm -hmm. through those time periods. Um, then we had the award ceremony, so local history photographer of the year, as well as the local history awards. And then we also had a special tribute to the wonderful Dr. Jill Draper, uh, who sadly mm. is retiring today, um, not today, but this year. Um, and so she has been fundamental to BALH over the last 20 or so years. Well, I think so, yeah. As you can tell, we've not quite worked out uh, how long she's been here, but it's a very long time. Jill will tell us. <laughs> Jill will tell us, probably. Um, but just to round off this session, thank you so, so much for joining us today and for bearing with us as we did our first hybrid event here um, and for keeping up with all of the different switches from YouTube and Zoom uh, and all of the different uh, conversations that we had. Without you and your questions, we wouldn't have been able to make it what it is today. So thank you and thank you for bearing with us. Um, also, particular shout out to Dan and his team here at Conway Hall for making sure that we can see everyone, both virtually and in person, um, and you're able to see Yanina and Mark's wonderful slides there. Thank you to Katie and Chris from our outreach team for keeping track of the comments and all of the things that are going on behind the scenes in the chat there. Thank you, of course, to Paul, our digital manager, who is behind the camera here and is absolutely fundamental to the day and to Diane who kept the most important Diane, job going legend. she uh, kept us going with cups of tea and food throughout the day so very important job 
Thank you to Catherine and Marek for being our roving reporters. Uh, thank you to Pam as well for live tweeting those two sessions. Again, we are a very small team, but we mm. strive for success. And of course, to Paul and our trustee team who are out there in the audience, uh, making sure things are running smoothly. Thank you to both Dr. Mark Forrest and Dr. Yanina Ramirez for both of their talks today. And thank you to yourselves um, for being here. Make sure to follow us on social media and let us know what your favourite part of the day was. And make sure to keep up to date with all of the things that we do by going to www.balh.org.uk and particularly forward slash events to learn more about some of the things that we're getting up to. My name is Megan Kelleher. I'm the social media fellow for the BALH. Thank you so much for spending some time with me today and I hope you all have a lovely evening. <laughs>